It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with a telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. It's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before, 
He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? It might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. 
The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate, but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2, but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning 1-2 to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in Stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In Stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after Stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths, which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. Hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. 
The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements, as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now-trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning one to two days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into stage 6. Little information about stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. A young woman steps onto her bathroom scale. She holds her breath and squeezes her eyes shut, afraid to see the results as she listens to the dial spinning. When it slows to a stop, she opens her eyes and looks down. She balks at the result. 150 pounds? That's unacceptable in her eyes. She steps off the scale and examines her reflection in the full-length mirror. In truth, her weight is far from out of control, but when she looks at herself, she can't help but see flaws. The subtle ring of pudge around her middle, the way her butt sticks out just a little too far for her liking, the very faint thickness around her cheeks and chin that hint at her history of snacking. As she leaves the bathroom, she reflects on her situation. Of course she's gaining weight. How could it be any other way? For the last two years, she's been in lockdown during a pandemic, and she's barely left her apartment. She let her gym membership lapse, and instead of cycling to work, she's instead taking the easy way out by just driving. And it's not like she gets much exercise in her free time either. During these last two years of isolation, she's mostly stayed in and watched television. She's discovered a particular love for trashy daytime talk shows and court dramas. Intellectually, she knows that they're the equivalent of junk food, but at the same time, there is a certain mindless charm to them. She would be embarrassed to admit it to any of her friends, but she does enjoy just turning off her brain and absorbing some silly talk show about professional stunt dwarves or Satan-worshipping furry juggalos. That sort of entertainment has been a boon to get her through the tough times. Nevertheless, it's time to make a change. She promises herself that she's going to get into shape. 
today, instead of vegging out on the couch, she's going to make an effort. She's going to go out and get some exercise and, she tells herself, she's going to watch those extra pounds melt away right before her eyes. She hopes that her old gym clothes will still fit her. After all, she's definitely put on some extra weight since her last trip to the gym. After rummaging through her drawers, she finds what she's looking for, her spandex gym shorts and sports bra. She quickly changes her clothes and is relieved to see that, although they might be a little snugger than she would like, they still fit her pretty well. That's a good sign. She probably won't even have to work very hard to get herself down to her ideal weight. It's all a matter of willpower, she tells herself. I was fit before, so that means I should be able to do it again. All I have to do is avoid temptation. I'll just have to make sure I stay active instead of watching trash TV all day. After all, I don't want to rot my brain too much. On the first day, she actually does an admirable job of sticking to her plan. She cycles to work, enjoying the fresh air and the reassuring post-workout burn in her legs that let her know that she's making progress. She throws away all the junk food in her refrigerator and goes shopping for healthy fruits and vegetables. And, most important of all, she limits her television time. She knows that trashy TV is probably her biggest addiction, even more than junk food, so she needs to be careful of that. On the second day, though, she notices something strange. She starts off with a simple, healthy breakfast, just some granola and a glass of juice. It's barely enough to satisfy her, but she knows that she has to make sacrifices if she expects to actually lose any weight. After breakfast, she decides to go out for a jog. As she's out on the street, she's overcome with sudden hunger. Of course, that's to be expected. She's on a diet now, so it's going to take some time to adjust to these smaller meals. She puts her hand to her rumbling stomach and grimaces. She's never felt this hungry before. If she didn't know better, she would think that she hadn't eaten for a week with the amount of pain that she's feeling. In fact, she's actually starting to feel a little woozy and she has to lean against a light post to keep from fainting. She shakes her head to clear her thoughts. Okay, she thinks, I must have misjudged how many calories I need to get me through a morning. Her eyes stray to a nearby coffee shop. She sighs in relief. She thinks to herself, I'll just pop in there and get myself a small snack, just a little something to keep my blood sugar up. She walks into the cafe and gets in line. As she waits, she can't help but stare at the rows of pastries on display under the glass. They all look delicious, and she is really hungry. She fully intends to only get a bagel with a little smear of cream cheese, but when she gets to the counter, she finds herself ordering way too much food. I'd like two scones, three danishes, and a bear claw, she says. Also a large super raspberry frappuccino with extra syrup and whipped cream. The words just tumble out of her mouth almost as if it's not her saying them, but rather some other voice speaking through her mouth. What the… I didn't say that, she stammers. The clerk behind the counter eyes her strangely, and the young woman feels too embarrassed to protest further. She steps aside and waits for her order, pondering the strange event that just happened. Is she possessed? She's not a superstitious person. But she can't think of any other explanation for what just happened. She can admit to herself that she has broken down and lost to temptation over a tasty snack in the past, but this? This is ridiculous. Eventually, when the clerk hands her the order, she rationalizes the whole thing away. I must just be having a hunger hallucination, she says to herself. Obviously, I need to be a little more careful about not being so strict about my diet. I'm sure if I just eat sensibly, I won't have an experience like that again. Her stomach grumbles again, reminding her of the original reason why she stepped into this coffee shop. She retreats to a table in the corner and tears open the bag. She wolfs down her pastries with gusto and slurps at her rich, creamy drink. When she's finished, she sighs in satisfaction, although the uncomfortable, full feeling in her belly reminds her of her predicament. She only meant to eat enough to keep her from fainting, but instead, she's eating herself silly, and it's only day two of the diet. This does not bode well. Okay, she tells herself, this is my last cheat. From now on, I'm going to be serious about this diet. She stands up and leaves the cafe, ready to complete the rest of her jog. But then, something even stranger happens. On the television, the matriarch of the family is furious. She has forbidden her daughter from marrying the gardener because she believes that he is too low class for her high-born daughter. But what she doesn't realize is that her daughter is in love and that she is determined to make it work. The daughter and the gardener have eloped, and the matriarch is hiring a private detective to track them down. Meanwhile, the matriarch's long-lost twin brother, whom she thought died in a plane crash in the tropics, has actually been alive the entire time. He has been in a South American hospital recovering from amnesia, but now he returns to the family estate, ready to claim his share of the inheritance. These events are all noted by the family's shady lawyer, who has big plans to usurp the family fortune himself. Unbeknownst to the family, he is actually secretly working for their mortal enemies and business rivals to destroy them. 
The young woman laughs, shoving a handful of potato chips into her mouth. Oh man, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes now. That lawyer is playing them all like fiddles. Suddenly, she startles, as if she's just waking up. Where is she? Wasn't she just in that coffee shop? How is it that she's at home? And why is she eating potato chips? She was sure that she threw out all the junk food in the house. She must have bought a bag on her way back home from jogging, but she literally cannot remember it. And what is she doing now? Watching television and eating junk food? In disgust, she grabs the remote and shuts off the TV. She was supposed to be jogging, and instead, she's sitting at home and watching stupid soap operas. The thing that worries her the most is her apparent blackout. She remembers nothing about her trip home from the coffee shop, although the evidence of the potato chip bag indicates that she must have stopped at a convenience store or supermarket on the way home. How could she forget something like that? I really must be having a blood sugar issue, she tells herself reassuringly, even though deep down, she knows that can't be the case. She had the blackout after eating the pastries at the coffee shop, so that can't be the cause. But she really doesn't want to think about that, so she puts it out of her head with a renewed promise to commit to her exercise and fitness program. Over the next few days, she makes a valiant effort to keep her promise. She cycles when she can, she jogs when she remembers, and yet, the blackouts continue. And no matter where she is when she loses her memory, she always recovers in the same place. Back home on her couch, always in the middle of eating some fatty junk food, always staring at the television set. Sure, she's always had an unhealthy television habit, and she knows that trashy talk shows and silly soap operas are her biggest weakness, but it doesn't make any sense that she would be seeking them out when she's in some kind of fugue state, right? As the weeks roll by, the young woman finds that her weight keeps rising. When she steps onto the bathroom scale, she's shocked to see that the dial points to 200 pounds. She's doing everything right, she thinks. How is that possible? How is it possible that she's ballooned up an extra 50 pounds since deciding to slim down? She can't fit into her old gym clothes anymore. She can barely tug the spandex shorts up to her thighs, and even if she could, she's afraid that they're going to split apart. In desperation, she switches to an old stretchy sweatsuit. It's the only thing that she owns that still fits her. This is just a temporary setback, she tells herself as she stares at her bloated reflection in the bathroom mirror. I just have to work harder. And she does. Or does she? When she goes to ride her bike, she finds that it's no longer strong enough to support her weight. She can't perch on the seat comfortably and the steel body frame starts to creak when she rests her full weight upon it. She steals her resolve. Sure, it might be embarrassing to go out in public wearing an ill-fitting sweatsuit and riding a bike groaning under her bulk, but she really has no choice. This time, she's going to do it. And she probably did ride her bike to work, right? She's not sure. The next thing that she knows, she's back at home, spread across the couch, basking in the comforting glow of the television. The floor is covered in empty bags and cartons, and her face is slathered with crumbs and sauce. The last thing that she remembers is that she was just about to go for a bike ride, but now she's back at home, and it looks like she just completely ruined her diet. She lifts her arm with some effort and stares at her watch. She's lost almost a whole day. That's the longest blackout yet. She must have gone out cycling and made her way home, where she decided to reward herself for her strenuous efforts with a little snack. That's the only logical explanation. She tries to reassure herself that maybe she's past the worst of it, but she finds that these mysterious blackouts keep happening. They happen while she's at work, while she's at the gym, while she's out cycling, but she always comes to in the same place, sitting on her sofa at home, in front of the TV, surrounded by the debris of a massive meal. Again, she wonders if maybe she's having some sort of reaction to her new low-calorie diet. Maybe she's been cutting back so far on her food intake that she's starting to have fainting spells. Maybe her diet food is tainted in some way. But that doesn't explain why she keeps gaining weight. The scale in her bathroom doesn't lie. It keeps reporting higher and higher numbers. And as much as she tries to reassure herself that it must just be broken, her ever-tightening clothes and ever-widening reflection tell her otherwise. Her trips to the gym become less and less frequent as she finds that other patrons have started to stare and whisper about her. Are they laughing at her for not being able to control her weight? Are they whispering about how her new flab is spilling from the confines of her sweatsuit? She can't even run on the treadmill for more than a few minutes without being completely winded, and she's too wide to balance on her bike now. The young woman has grown absolutely massive, to the point that she completely fills the whole couch. She chews her way through yet another bag of potato chips, her eyes never straying from the ever-chattering television set. She barely moves from this spot, her tremendous girth sinking into a permanent groove in the cushions as the couch springs groan. She barely notices, however, because she's much too intent on enjoying herself. She loves to eat, and every bite brings her untold joy, her taste buds tingling with delight. She is constantly full, so much so that she feels slightly sick, so bloated that she feels like she might just burst. 
but she's powerless to resist the siren call of junk food. She scarfs down entire boxes of cookies and cartons of ice cream without a thought, having turned into the very definition of a mindless eater. Only occasionally does she rouse herself from this stupor of gorging to reach for her telephone to order more takeout or more grocery delivery, always choosing the most calorie-laden options. Other than eating, her attention is completely devoted to her television set. She watches a constant stream of daytime talk shows, laughing along with the studio audience as the hosts parade out an assortment of society's biggest freaks. Sometimes she'll switch the channel to watch soap operas, becoming so wrapped up in the ridiculous plot twists and melodramatic acting that she completely forgets the passage of time. Her bicycle stands propped against the wall in the hallway, completely forgotten and untouched now for months. At this point, all thoughts of losing weight have utterly evaporated, and all that she cares about is satisfying her appetites for junk food and junk television. One day, she suddenly shakes her head and looks down at herself in horror, as if seeing herself for the first time. What the? She says in disbelief. She drops her half-eaten carton of ice cream and grabs at her fleshy middle with her hands, as if to make sure that it's all her and not some kind of crazy dream. Her hands sink deep into her new flesh, and she realizes to her shock that indeed she has eaten herself into morbid obesity. How is this possible? I can't be this big. I was only… only… Her words trail off as a sound of an organ sting from the soap opera on TV diverts her attention. Within seconds, her eyes have glazed over and her hands move to pick up the dropped carton of ice cream. Her worries about her growing size forgotten, she's now only concerned with watching until the next commercial break. It might seem unbelievable that someone could undergo such a startling physical and mental transformation, but what that young woman experienced has led to her being classified by the Foundation as SCP-2611. SCP-2611 is, as you might have expected, a young woman currently weighing approximately 500 pounds. Her mobility is limited due to her weight, although SCP staff encourage her to take light exercise whenever possible in hopes of preventing her mobility from deteriorating further. She also suffers from several health issues related to her weight and lifestyle, including diabetes, for which she is receiving treatment by Foundation personnel. Her awareness of her situation and surroundings is severely limited, as she spends most of her time in a stupor, but when she is lucid, she believes that she is in a special facility receiving treatment for her weight problem. In reality, SCP-2611 is under observation because of SCP-2611-1. SCP-2611-1 is a mass of sentient fat located on SCP-2611's left side. SCP-2611-1 has become integrated with several of SCP-2611's vital organs, making it too dangerous to attempt to remove SCP-2611-1 via liposuction or other means. SCP-2611-1 has gradually exerted increasing control over the mind and actions of its host, to the point that SCP-2611 is only fully conscious for one to two hours daily. The rest of the time, SCP-2611-1 is fully in control of its host's behavior. Prior to coming to the SCP facility, SCP-2611-1 influenced its host to consume massive amounts of calories, leading to the mysterious and sudden weight gain that we observed earlier. This was possibly an attempt by SCP-2611-1 to increase its own size and influence, but as of yet, its reasons, as well as how it exerts control over its host, are unknown. When in control, SCP-2611-1 can speak through its host, communicating in standard American English. SCP-2611's access to food has been limited since her arrival at the Foundation, so as to prevent her weight gain from accelerating to dangerous levels. Other than eating, SCP-2611-1's main interest appears to be daytime television. Attempts to communicate with SCP-2611-1 have so far met with little success due to the anomaly's limited attention span for anything other than the minutiae of daytime television. In a conversation with one researcher, however, SCP-2611-1 let slip that it preferred daytime television to the programming watched by, quote, that other guy suggesting that it lived inside a different host before it eventually took up residence within the body of SCP-2611. At another point, while in the middle of a conversation about a court drama, SCP-2611-1 suddenly announced, Kill it! Kill it now! I don't care if I die! Staff believe that this might not have been SCP-2611-1 at all, but rather the voice of SCP-2611 trying to break through the hypnotic control of her parasite to call for help. At this time, no drastic action is recommended until further observations can be made. SCP-2611-1 does not appear to be contagious, and the way that it bonds with the host is unknown, so it is currently classified as safe. 
At the moment, SCP-2611-1 is the only known instance of its kind. However, considering rising levels of obesity worldwide, it is not unfathomable to think that there could be countless other instances influencing the behavior of other hosts to dedicate their lives to consuming food and television. Who knows, it's not like most of us would need that much convincing. It's the last day of sixth grade, and there are only seconds left before the final bell rings and school is officially out for summer. An excitable 11-year-old girl sits at her desk, bouncing her leg in anticipation and watching the clock. Soon, she'll have three glorious months of freedom. But more importantly, she can take her mom up on a life-changing promise. They made a deal when they moved to this new town. If she could get through sixth grade with straight A's and good feedback from her teachers, she could finally get a pet of her own. There were some stipulations, of course. The pet can't be too big, can't make a lot of noise, and needs to be something she can take care of by herself. It was hard work, but she buckled down, studied hard, and even found a math tutor. The time is now in five, four, three, two, one. The last bell of the year rings and the class erupts into cheers. Summer's here. She shoves her books into her bag and runs out the door so quickly, she barely catches her teacher's parting words of, have a great summer vacation, everyone. The halls are swamped with kids all rushing toward the buses, their parents' cars, or their final walk home of the school year. She's right there with them, the promise of the day putting an extra spring in her step. Many of the faces in the hall are still unfamiliar. After a year of being the new kid in town, she hasn't made many friends, but none of that matters now. She's going to get a special friend today, something all her own that she can nurture, play with, and won't ever have to worry about impressing. It's only a short walk to the pet store, and then an even shorter walk to her house. As she makes her way down the sidewalk, the sun beaming down on her smiling face, the girl lets her mind wander. What kind of pet should she get? A dog needs to be walked, that might be too much work. A fish? Maybe, but you can't play with a fish. You can't pet a fish, or at least it won't be happy if you try. She remembers a pet tarantula her eccentric aunt once had and shudders. No spiders, definitely not. She wants something friendly, something small enough that her mom won't complain, but something she can cuddle and really bond with. Whatever it ends up being, she's going to take great care of it. The walk feels much longer than it is, the anticipation stretching the minutes until they feel like hours. She spots the sign in the shape of a dog playing with a ball, and her heart skips a beat. She's reached the pet store. Inside, there are an overwhelming number of options. She walks through the reptile section, pressing her face to the class of tanks housing iguanas, slithery snakes, tiny darting lizards with brightly colored tails. Nearby, there are fat green tree frogs and bumpy toads with huge watery eyes. She briefly pauses at the fish, enticed by their vivid colors and the staggering variety of shapes and sizes. But a fish is such a boring pet, she thinks. What can you even do with a fish? She moves on, looking at a litter of fluffy, tabby kittens. They romp and roll around on top of each other, flicking their tails and stretching their soft paws. They're adorable, and her heart melts. But then she thinks about having to scoop a litter box and decides to move on. There are roly-poly hamsters and sleek-looking rats, tiny white mice with pink eyes and gerbils running on wheels. Suddenly, a sign catches her eye. Exotic pets, it reads. Huh? What could be over there? She tiptoes into the section, almost feeling like she's stumbled into somewhere she shouldn't be. There are ferrets wiggling around and playing with a ball, fluffy chinchillas that look impossibly plush and soft to the touch, little sugar gliders peeking out of cloth pouches with wide eyes. There's even a skunk blinking at her curiosity. But nothing feels quite right. None of these pets seem like the one she has to bring home. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she spots something curious. A row of small cardboard packages covered with inviting cartoonish text, advertising something called a custom pet. She picks up one of the packages and reads the description. It sounds impossible, too good to be true. Just buy these packaged eggs, place them anywhere in your house, and a perfectly matched pet will hatch and fit right in. It will become exactly the kind of pet that you need. She looks for any sort of fine print, something that might indicate this is a toy or some kind of joke, but it looks real. Could it be? Shyly, the girl takes one of the packages up to the cash register. The employee goes to scan it, but there's no barcode. Did you bring this in with you? The cashier asks. She shakes her head. Okay, well, we don't sell these, so... I guess you can just take it? The girl's eyes go wide. 
Really? She can just have it for free? The cashier is already waving her off, beckoning the next customer to come check out. Not wanting to question her good luck, she takes off without a second thought. The run home from the pet store is a total blur of excitement. All she wants to do is get inside, make a peanut butter sandwich, and figure out where to put her new pet's egg before her mom gets home from work. Not that she's doing anything wrong, it's just easier if she takes care of things before her mom can ask too many questions. She's doing them both a favor, really, taking care of all the logistics so her mom doesn't have to worry about it. She pulls her house key from her pocket and unlocks the door with shaking hands. It's almost time. Forget the sandwich. The sandwich can wait. She needs to get upstairs to her room right now and start her life with her new pet, whatever it ends up being. She throws her backpack on her bed and sits down on the floor, tearing open the cardboard packaging. Inside, there are six tiny eggs sealed in plastic. She just wants one pet, so she'll start with one egg for now. Of course, if the pet ends up being lonely, maybe it'll want a friend? She shakes off the thought. She can figure all of those details out later. She's just about to puncture the plastic so the egg can breathe when she stops. Where should she put it? She was so excited to leave the store she forgot to pick up a tank or terrarium or somewhere a traditional pet would live. The packaging says these pets can live anywhere, but do they really mean anywhere? If she does something wrong and her new pet is hurt or doesn't hatch at all, it'll just break her heart. Then she spots a potential solution. An old dollhouse, frilly and pastel pink and surprisingly spacious inside, sits next to her bed. She hasn't played with dolls in a while, insisting she was too old for them when she started sixth grade. But now, she's thrilled that she didn't get rid of her dollhouse just yet. Even if the dolls don't live there anymore, maybe now it can be a home for something new, for whatever hatches out of this strange little egg. Carefully, she breaks the plastic seal on the egg and places it inside the dollhouse. All of the doll furniture and little plastic choking hazards are gone, leaving only a pretty pink Victorian-style enclosure where the egg can safely hatch. Now, all she has to do is wait. Later that night, the girl wakes from a deep sleep to the sound of something moving inside the dollhouse, the skitter of tiny legs, the rustling of something inside the formerly vacant dollhouse. She sits up and is about to go peek inside when a chill of fear runs down her spine. What if it's something horrible? She doesn't know what kind of eggs those were. She'd never seen anything like them before. What if it's a spider or a worm or some other awful monstrous thing she can't even imagine? and she brought it into her home, to where she and her mom sleep without even questioning it. She sits for a moment, the only sound the rustling of the thing in the dollhouse and her own short, panicked breaths. Then there's another sound, huh? light and sweet, like a little bird chirping. It's coming from the dollhouse. Curiosity finally gets the better of her, and she opens the dollhouse, lifting the roof off. Inside, she spots it, her new pet. Feathery soft fur, pastel pink and white, covers the little animal, which is currently exploring its new home delightedly. It flicks around a poofy little tail that looks a bit like a lavender feather duster, and stops to blink up at her with two large, friendly purple eyes. Slowly, she reaches a hand down to pet the animal, and it nuzzles into her palm, body vibrating with something like a kitten's purr. Any tension she felt before melts out of her body as she realizes the packaging was not lying. She put the pet in an environment that was comforting, sweet, happy, a piece of childlike joy, and it had become the living embodiment of those things. For a brief moment, she wonders how she'll explain this new addition to the household, what she'll need to feed it, and what her mom will say. But then her new best friend chirps happily again, and all she can think is, this is going to be an amazing summer. Things worked out very well for the girl. Meanwhile, other families across town were screaming in horror as a tiny fire-breathing creature set their drapes ablaze, and another slowly dropped down from the ceiling on a silvery thread, blending into the shadows. This girl was not the only child to bring home one of these miraculous pets and hatch it in her home, and other children were much less careful about where they put the eggs. Of course, the children weren't to blame here. The blame lay with whoever was behind the design and widespread release of these odd little animals, also known as SCP-1550. SCP-1550 is a species of artificially synthesized creatures of unknown classification who are highly adaptable to any given environment. Their larvae will develop, grow, and change to fit whatever setting their eggs are placed in. Though adult specimens vary greatly in appearance, they all have markings on their underbelly that read, a Dr. Wondertainment trademark. Because of their highly adaptable nature, it is uncertain exactly what the original form of these creatures might look like. 
SCP-1550 eggs are one centimeter long, beige in color, and stored in airtight plastic packaging that prevents them from hatching until they are exposed to the outside air. The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-1550 after a collection of bizarre cardboard packages were found in the exotic pet section of a pet store. None of the workers had ever seen these packages before and had never even heard of SCP-1550 prior to being asked about it. The packages were brought into containment immediately and were found to each contain six SCP-1550 eggs in airtight containers. The original packaging also contained an instruction leaflet, which I have managed to get my hands on a copy of. It reads, Hey kids, your parents aren't letting you get a dog or cat? Don't fret, buy a Dr. Wondertainment custom pet. A Dr. Wondertainment's custom pet is far superior to an ordinary and boring cat or dog due to their original Adapto Eggs packaging, a Dr. Wondertainment invention. Just leave your custom pet Adapto Eggs around the house and when they hatch they'll fit right in. Perfect for apartments. To get your very own custom pets is easy, kids. Just put an egg in your house and break the plastic seal to give your new pet some air so it can hatch. Your new pet will be perfect for where you live, wherever you live. If your new custom pet seems lonely, just add another Adapto egg and get him a new friend. Dr. Wondertainment is not responsible for injuries or death caused by this or any other product. Wondertainment custom pets are shipped out prefixed. Who exactly is this Dr. Wondertainment? A person? A corporation? A highly intelligent octopus with a penchant for toy design? The identity of the force behind the trademark is undetermined, but whatever Dr. Wondertainment is, one thing is certain. The toys they create are highly unusual. Dozens of Wondertainment's creations have been contained by the SCP Foundation, including SCP-2855, SCP-2396, and SCP-111. They range from useful to whimsical to downright destructive and the motives behind each invention are currently unknown. SCP-1550 is just one in a long line of anomalous toys from the shadowy toy maker. And so, like they have with so many other Wondertainment products, the research staff at the Foundation decided to perform some exploratory tests on these supposed custom pets. First, one SCP-1550 egg was placed in a tank of seawater and left to hatch. When it did, it produced a specimen with gills all along its upper back behind its eyes, an array of flat and broad tails it could use to swim efficiently. Further examination of the creature revealed that it excreted special mucus to protect its eyes from the salt water and a swim bladder that was discovered during dissection. The skin of the creature was a mottled blue, giving it natural camouflage in its seawater environment. Next, the team decided to place an egg in fresh water and see what different adaptations were produced. A tank was filled with water from a river behind the testing site, and the egg was placed inside until it hatched. Interestingly, this specimen of SCP-1550 did not possess any gills, suggesting similar circumstances would not necessarily produce the same adaptations. Instead, this specimen had enlarged lungs and a thin, streamlined body for more efficient movement. Next, the team prepared a terrarium meant to simulate the ecosystem of a temperate forest and placed the next egg inside. When it hatched, it produced a specimen of SCP-1550 covered in a layer of brown fur, with a ridged underbelly resembling that of a snake. It also had a tail consisting of large tentacles. Along the ridged underbelly, there was a smooth patch of skin with the Dr. Wondertainment logo printed like a tattoo. The team prepared a different terrarium that simulated a desert ecosystem and allowed an egg to hatch inside. The resulting specimen was cold-blooded, tan in color to blend in with the sand, and skilled at burrowing quickly to protect itself from outside stressors. It was also, notably, one centimeter larger than the previous specimens. The final terrarium was made to simulate the environment of an average urban apartment. The egg that hatched inside produced a creature with leathery skin and eyes placed similarly to those of a chameleon. The demeanor of the specimen was noticeably friendlier than its predecessors, and it acted more like a domesticated house pet than a wild animal. Its most impressive adaptation was its method of eating. Behind the specimen's jaw, there were strands of baleen like those found in whales, which allowed the creature to filter feed on dust and crumbs from the terrarium floor. After these experiments proved successful, the research team decided to test the eggs in more extreme environments. One egg was placed in a vat of molten iron. It promptly burst into flames and was completely destroyed. The head researcher responded, well, what did you expect to happen? Which seems like a fair point. The next egg was placed inside a vacuum chamber, which was then depressurized. The egg promptly exploded, covering the inside of the chamber in an unidentifiable slime. 
These two less than successful experiments led the research team to the conclusion that SCP-1550 eggs cannot survive in conditions that would be uninhabitable for any other animal. There are limits to the creature's adaptability, but what would happen to an egg placed in a hostile environment filled with something recognizable? A vacuum chamber was filled with seawater, and an egg was placed inside. The chamber was then pressurized to 15,750 psi. This time, the egg was not destroyed, but instead was able to successfully hatch. The resulting SCP-1550 specimen bore a heavy resemblance to several deep-sea creatures, most notably the anglerfish. Like the anglerfish, the creature had a bioluminescent lure dangling from its forehead. It also had gills, dark gray-blue skin, flat and webbed fins, and enlarged eyes twice the size of those found on other specimens. Its teeth were sharp and ridged, similar to those of a shark. The hand researcher made a note on this portion of the experiment log, asking, Just what kind of child Dr. Wondertainment is trying to sell these things to that they could live in conditions where a creature like that could be kept as a pet? All adult specimens of SCP-1550 are kept in a sealed 5 meter by 5 meter terrarium, which simulates desert conditions. This terrarium is monitored via electronic surveillance, and each of the specimens is implanted with a tracking device. If one or more of the specimens escapes, the area is locked down until all of the creatures have been captured and placed back in their terrarium. All SCP-1550 eggs are kept in their packaging unless being used for testing. As the Foundation does not want the population of adult specimens to exceed 20 at any given time, excess specimens are terminated. Honestly, that makes me a little sad. I'd be happy to take them in if the research team can't keep them. But I digress. Having a pet is a big responsibility, and some people just can't handle the risks and rewards that come with caring for an animal, especially one that can become an accidental weapon if you're not careful. If your child is begging you for a pet, maybe you should start them out with a goldfish first. A goldfish never burnt the house down, though I suppose there's a first time for everything. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky. He can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams, and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He'd tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he's said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost retches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days. His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed. So tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. 
It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs. But yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, there's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then, the apparent venom from the spiders. Except, there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to… The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4x4. The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks 
fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty, looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely. But not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels… good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep. All his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back. He drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights. But nothing seems to work. Even the tapping stops working. More spiders. A call lights up his phone screen. An international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache, way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He's in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now, it's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so… His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's… it's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches. Just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's web secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, 
a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen, exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where Luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web, housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 centimeters by 40 centimeters by 20 centimeters and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms, especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. The final bell rings, signaling the end of a new class's first day at middle school. A girl exits the building, her backpack slung over her shoulder, body hunched under its unfamiliar weight. It's been a long and tiring day. Her family just moved to this small Oklahoma town from the big city and of course, she's spent every minute since then trying to adjust to her new surroundings. It's never easy to be the new kid in town. Right now, all she wants to do is to get home and relax. She doesn't want to think about school and its related anxieties for the rest of the night. As she walks down the stairs, 
She notices the school bus parked at the curb. Thank goodness, she thinks. I can't wait to get out of here. This day can't end soon enough. But for some reason, something about this bus sets her nerves on edge. What is it that just seems off? There's nothing blatantly wrong with the bus, but when she looks closer, she realizes that it definitely looks a little strange. The different parts of the bus just don't add up. Some parts are new, clearly just off the factory floor, while others are battered and bruised from long-time wear. Some parts even seem to come from different makes and models of bus. I guess it's not that strange, she thinks. After all, her old school always had a measly budget. You could practically see the road through holes in the floor sometimes. Her new one probably just has those same issues. Aren't those problems all over the country, after all? The school probably just had to buy a dilapidated old bus cobbled together from random parts to make ends meet. And besides, she thinks as she watches her classmates pile onto the strange bus without a second thought, none of the other kids seem to think that there's anything weird going on. This must all just be in my head, she thinks. I'm probably just being weird because I'm so tired. I can't let myself become the new girl and the weird girl. The girl is startled as she hears a voice behind her. Hey! She turns and sees a boy that she recognizes. He sits behind her in class. They haven't spoken before now, but he seems friendly enough. You're the new kid in school, aren't you? He says. Yes, my family just moved to town. She tries to talk to him, but she can't help but keep getting distracted by the weird bus. Right, right. The boy glances at the bus, as if he can sense her discomfort with it. You worried about the bus? I was pretty nervous my first time riding it, but I don't worry about it anymore. You get used to it, he tells her. Uh, right, she says. The girl feels her cheeks going red with embarrassment. She doesn't want her classmate to think that she's scared of riding a bus. What if he tells the other kids that she's frightened of a bus ride? They're all going to think that she's some kind of silly baby. I'm not scared of the bus. It is just a bus, right? The boy grins, as if he knows something that she doesn't know. The girl doesn't want to admit her fear, and so with a defiant step, she climbs the stairs and enters the bus. Once she's on board, her unease doesn't go away. The first thing that she notices is that there is no one in the driver's seat. That's weird. Did the driver just step away to use the bathroom or something? It seems pretty irresponsible to leave the bus unattended. There's a line forming behind her, though, so she doesn't have time to think about this. She takes a seat and stares out the window, keeping to herself. The boy from her class follows and takes a seat next to her. It's a little wild at first, but trust me, you'll get used to it fast. In fact, some of us think it's kind of fun now. The girl blinks in confusion. Who is this weirdo that gets such a kick out of riding the bus? She almost wants to snap at him, to tell him that of course she's not scared of riding the bus. She's ridden the bus hundreds of times back at her old school. But at the same time, there's definitely something weird going on here. And as much as she's trying to play it cool, she's clearly not able to hide her feelings. This boy can easily sense that she's uncomfortable. Suddenly, the bus lurches into action and pulls away from the curb. But wait, how can this be? She never saw the driver get back on board. The bus can't be driving itself, can it? She stands up in her seat and cranes her neck to see. Her eyes bulge from her head in fear and surprise as she realizes that, in fact, there's no one driving the bus at all. The driver's seat is empty and the wheel is turning by itself as the bus careens down the road. Who's driving the bus? She shouts, but the other kids barely even react to her outburst. Most of them are chattering amongst themselves, and only one or two turn to look at her briefly, before shrugging and turning back to their own private conversations. A chorus of giggles behind her alert her to the fact that she's just completely embarrassed herself. What's the matter, you scared? Calls an older boy from the back of the bus, guffawing loudly. Of course no one's driving. Don't you know anything? Leave her alone, says the boy in the seat next to her. It's her first time. She's never ridden the bus before. She's too panicked to correct him that, yes, she has been on the bus before, but not a bus like this one. What's going on? We're all going to die, she cries, clutching at the seat in front of her in terror. Despite her fear, though, she can't help but notice that the bus isn't simply speeding into oblivion. The bus obeys all the traffic laws, stopping at stop signs and signaling before turns. It's almost as if the bus itself is alive and aware of what it's doing. That's just how it is, says the boy next to her in a matter-of-fact voice as if he's anticipated her question. Apparently, this is a normal day for kids here in this Oklahoma town. The girl doesn't think she could ever get used to a bus that drives itself. But what comes next is going to prove to be even stranger. But you might want to close your eyes for this next part, says the boy. The girl asks him what he means by that. But before he can answer, she feels a strange wave of sudden nausea overcome her. Her vision goes hazy, and the whole world seems to waver in her sight. 
but the sensation passes quickly, and everything is quickly back to normal. Or is it? She turns to look out the window. The city passing by is familiar. She can recognize many of the same buildings that she passed on her way to school this morning, but now they seem strangely altered. The structures are in advanced states of disrepair, with broken windows and boarded up doors. The gutters are filled with trash and debris, and the streets seem to be abandoned. The bus takes a left turn down a side street, and the girl catches a brief glimpse of the town's city hall in the distance. She gasps. City hall is on fire, great gouts of hot red flame pouring from the shattered windows. Sirens echo through the air. The sky above is an ominous red, filled with angry storm clouds with jagged bolts of dry lightning dancing between the thunderheads, and she can see the funnel of a distant tornado making a touchdown in the hills. The bus briefly comes to a stop in front of the library, dutifully obeying a flickering traffic light. The library's windows are dark, but she can vaguely see shapes moving about inside. Electric sparks shoot from malfunctioning street lamps and downed power cables flail like angry snakes in the street. It looks like some terrible natural disaster has hit the city, but what could it be? Surely she would have heard some warning while she was at school. It wouldn't have just carried on as usual in the classroom while the world outside burned. She turns to the boy next to her, a fearful question on her trembling lips. He seems to know what's going on. Otherwise, how could he be so eerily calm while everything outside the bus is falling apart or on fire? What happened to the city? Was there an earthquake? No, he would have felt it. Was there a hurricane? Every possible disaster scenario runs through her head as she desperately tries to think of an explanation. But what happens next reveals to her that there's no natural explanation for the strange sights that assail her eyes. As she watches through the window, a squadron of armed soldiers march down the street toward the darkened library. Suddenly the doors fly open and people pour out, screaming as if they're being chased by some unspeakable evil. The girl expects that the soldiers must be here for disaster relief, but she is horrified when, instead of helping the escaping library patrons, they instead open fire upon the crowd. The girl screams in terror, but the other kids barely even notice. They're too busy talking or laughing. One kid is so disinterested in the spectacle outside that he's playing with a handheld game console rather than watch the carnage unfold. How can this be happening? Has the whole world gone crazy? She's filled with terror as she wonders, is the whole town under siege? Is her house still standing? Are her parents safe? Where is this bus even taking her? I told you that you might want to cover your eyes, says the boy next to her. The bus continues on its route, passing all sorts of terrifying sights. A parking lot has been transformed into a mass grave. She watches as uniformed police line up peaceful citizens against a brick wall to brutally execute them by firing squad. Mass riots are taking place in the town's central park. People are yelling obscenities and pounding one another into pulp, while armed law enforcement officers sweep in to escalate the situation. The air is thick with screams, gunfire, and the smell of burning bodies. The shopping mall is overrun with giant spiders, which chase screaming shoppers out of the exits. She sees rats as big as cars scurrying out of the alleyways, grabbing random people with their taloned paws and biting their heads off with their long, sharp incisors. On the distant hills, she can also make out the outlines of even stranger creatures that she cannot identify. Dinosaurs, aliens, demons, she doesn't come from a particularly religious family, but the sights that she sees today definitely make her think that she might be seeing a glimpse into the maw of hell itself. The girl has never seen anything so awful in all her life. To her surprise, several of the other kids cheer as the bus drives past a gaggle of walking corpses. They're mutilated and half decomposed, but somehow still mobile shambling down the sidewalk and moaning. How can the other kids be enjoying this? Yeah, 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 chant the kids. Zombies, that rules. Maybe we'll get to see them eat some brains for once, cries the older boy in the back of the bus with sudden glee. What is going on? Repeats the girl. It's just the usual bus ride, says the boy next to her. Don't worry, I felt the same way when I first started at this school, but it's really not so bad. I mean, it's kind of cool, isn't it? The girl opens her mouth to respond, but she's suddenly overcome with that familiar feeling of nausea. The world quivers briefly in front of her, and suddenly, everything is back to normal. The sky is clear and blue, the buildings are no longer dilapidated, people are bustling in the streets, going about their usual business. There's no sign of any of the horrors that she just witnessed. No fires, no soldiers, no monsters, and no zombies. The boy next to her commented that they must have been reaching someone's stop. From around the bus, she hears several other kids groan in frustration. They were hoping that they would get to see some exciting zombie carnage, but it looks like that show will have to wait for another time. The bus slowly comes to a halt, and the girl tenses as she hears the hiss of its air brakes. 
The door opens, and the girl realizes that the bus has stopped in front of her house. She is relieved to see that her house is standing, and she can see her mother gardening in the front yard, safe and sound. Was it all a dream? This is my stop, says the girl, standing up as if in a daze. Uh, the first time's always a little wild, says the boy as she leaves. Don't worry, tomorrow will be easier. The girl steps onto the curb and away from the bus. The doors close behind her, and the bus pulls away, continuing on its journey. Did you enjoy your first day of school today? asks the girl's mother. The girl can only stare in shock as the bus drives away. What just happened? Did a self-driving bus just take her on a tour of hell before bringing her right to her own doorstep? Or did she really just imagine that whole experience? As you astute Foundation veterans have probably already put together, this new girl at school didn't imagine anything she just saw. That girl just had her first encounter with SCP-3583. At face value, SCP-3583 resembles an ordinary school bus, albeit one composed of completely random parts all held together by some unknown force. The bus is self-driving and in fact resists any attempt by a human to sit in the driver's seat. At some point, SCP-3583 became attached to a particular school in an undisclosed Oklahoma town for reasons the SCP Foundation still doesn't understand. Every school day, at 3.45 p.m., it appears outside of the school just as the school day comes to a close. The bus can hold up to 56 children and up to 8 adults. If it judges that not enough children have boarded, SCP-3583 will begin to honk its horn. The horn has a peculiar, hypnotic effect on all children within hearing range. They will be compelled to drop whatever they are doing and board the bus, meaning that the bus has some innate cognitohazardous properties. If the bus still feels that it hasn't reached its quota, it will increase the volume of its horn until it has attracted enough children that it can begin its route. Depending on how many adults have boarded, SCP-3583 has two distinct patterns of behavior. If four or fewer adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 1. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will dematerialize and enter a parallel reality called SCP-3583-A. SCP-3583-A superficially resembles the normal geography of the same Oklahoma town, with some minor but very important changes. The typical city landscape is replaced with a hellish alternative full of crumbling architecture, marauding monsters, shambling zombies, fires and natural disasters, and instances of military violence and civil unrest. SCP-3583 will travel through this terrifying hell dimension along normal bus routes, studiously obeying all traffic laws and pausing to re-enter our own reality only to deliver kids to their own homes. Interestingly, SCP-3583 only offers door-to-door -door service and ignores all conventionally posted bus stops. If five or more adults are aboard, SCP-3583 enters Behavior Pattern 2. In this pattern, SCP-3583 will travel to the sites of mass casualty events, seemingly arriving in the days or weeks preceding the incident, where it will circle the area for approximately 45 to 100 minutes. After this, it will enter Pattern 1, delivering each child passenger to their home before then delivering its adult passengers home as well. Known mass casualty sites visited include Pompeii, Nanking, and the World Trade Center in New York. Passengers inside SCP-3583 can take photos or video through the bus window, and all footage shot from within SCP-3583 matches exactly with archive footage taken at the mass casualty site at the time that SCP-3583 supposedly visited. However, SCP-3583 itself has never been reported by witnesses at any site or seen in any archive footage of any site. Luckily, SCP-3583 has proven to be a boon to this struggling school district. The school principal noted that SCP-3583 has a better safety record than any human driver. In addition, it never calls in sick and is never late for a pickup or drop-off. Every student that has received a ride in SCP-3583 has arrived safely, if a little shaken, at their home destination. And best of all, SCP-3583 is saving the school a lot of money on both driver pay and vehicle maintenance, money that the school has used to hire a new music teacher. The general consensus of the local community is that as long as SCP-3583 wants to work as a school bus and continues to do a good job, who are they to look a gift horse in the mouth? Although it still might behoove some of SCP-3583's more sensitive riders to shut their eyes and plug their ears until they get safely home. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-3583 when students began posting cell phone footage of their rides online. 
Although the Foundation has successfully scrubbed information about SCP-3583 from the internet, it has been less successful in figuring out what to do with the so-called school bus from hell. Foundation field agents are so far unable to explain SCP-3583's motive or operations. Conventional attempts to contain SCP-3583, such as impounding the bus or towing it to the junkyard, are futile. SCP-3583 will immediately dematerialize, falling apart into a rubble of disparate bus parts as the force binding it together appears to abandon this plane. However, SCP-3583 will always return the next school day, ready and willing to begin its afternoon shift. Agents have considered closing the affected school, but feared that would only move the problem, as SCP-3583 would simply attach itself to another school. The SCP Foundation is currently monitoring the situation and has several agents embedded within the school district posing as regular staff. Because of this immense difficulty in containment, SCP-3583 has been given the Keter Object Class. Considering the number of SCP anomalies that involve horrific bodily harm being done to their victims, it's honestly a breath of fresh air to be dealing with one this seemingly benevolent, a little post-traumatic stress disorder aside, of course. And while Hellbus may be what most around the Foundation have taken to referring to this particular anomaly, I'm going to stick to my own name, the Tragic School Bus. The early morning sun rises, casting its radiance over the field. The shepherd stands guard, watching his sheep graze. It's a beautiful morning, the sheep are quiet, and his loyal dog is at his side. But the shepherd is perturbed. He is certain that there are sheep missing. He wanders through the field, counting the sheep off one by one, but no matter how many times he counts, he simply cannot make the numbers gel. There are definitely five sheep missing. How is this even possible? His family has been in the sheep herding business for generations. They survive on the money that they make from shearing, selling, and spinning the wool from these sheep. They can't afford to simply lose sheep. That's money directly from the family wallet, food directly off the family table. But even worse, it's a matter of pride. He likes to think of himself as a good shepherd who cares about his flock. Losing a single sheep is a failure of his responsibility to his charges, and he can't stand it. He knows that if he returns to the farm without those five missing sheep, he's going to be in big trouble. He's already thinking about the lecture he's going to get from his father, and that's if he's lucky. One missing sheep might be forgiven, but five? He'll be lucky if his family doesn't throw him out of the house for his failure. It's imperative that he find them and bring them back. He pats the head of his trusty sheepdog. Every shepherd, of course, has a sheepdog to help them keep their flock safe. His dog has been with him for many years, and she has never failed in the past. She keeps watch over the flock as if they were her own puppies, so the shepherd thinks it very strange that his dog didn't bark to sound the alarm when the missing sheep started to wander off. Could something more sinister be at play here? Maybe someone stole his sheep. If a thief came during the night to sneak away with the lost sheep, that might explain why they were able to get away without his dog knowing. They might have been clever enough to cause some kind of distraction to keep her busy. The shepherd notices that the fence at the edge of the field is broken. This must be how the missing sheep got away. He examines the splintered wood. It's not a natural break because the wood is sturdy and far from rotten. Someone or something must have broken the fence sometime last night. He clutches at his shepherd's crook, his brow set in determination. This isn't good. It's looking more and more likely that thieves are behind this disappearance. He needs to track them down, but you will have to be careful. Sheep thieves are usually desperate men, and they might resort to violence to protect their ill-gotten gains. A glint of sunlight flashes against something shiny caught on the fence, catching the shepherd's eye. He scoops it up and examines it closely. It looks like a scrap of fabric. Could it be that the thief snagged his clothes against the fence as he made his escape? The fabric is thin and brittle, and doesn't look like any sort of material that the shepherd has ever seen before. It more resembles a scrap of snakeskin than a scrap of shirt, but it's his only lead, so it'll have to do. He holds the scrap to his dog's nose and allows her to sniff it. She snuffles at it and then immediately raises her ears, alert. He commands her to follow the scent, and she obeys. She puts her nose to the ground and starts to track. He follows her. The dog leads him out of the field and across the way. He is surprised to see that she is leading him toward a nearby forest. He gulps in sudden fear. He's never been into these woods and, in fact, his family has often warned him to stay away. Everyone in his village loves to repeat rumors that this forest is haunted, filled with every sorts of scary monsters and demons. Why would the sheep thief brave these cursed woods? On the other hand, that would make sense though, wouldn't it? A thief would need a lair that was hidden and difficult to approach so that they wouldn't have to worry about getting caught. These woods would be a perfect hiding place. Still, he can't help but wonder. 
His dog lifts her head and whines at him, indicating that he should follow. He steals his resolve and continues on. His fingers clutch tightly to his staff, his knuckles going white with fear and tension. He's almost convinced that he might see a monster here in these woods, and he's ready to defend himself from the worst. Eventually, his dog leads him into an unexpected clearing. The shepherd blinks in amazement. Standing at the center of the glen is what appears to be the remains of an ancient temple. He hasn't given much thought to the history of this place, to all the people who lived here in ancient times, and to what monuments they left behind. The crumbling ruins are overgrown with vines, and the columns look like they might disintegrate at a touch. He wonders what ancient civilization might have built this lost citadel, and what strange rites they might have performed here. But he doesn't have time to wonder about that, because his dog is barreling ahead right through the ancient temple archway and into the interior of the building. He wants to turn and run. Everything that he's ever heard about these cursed woods makes him think that this is a very bad idea, but he knows he can't return home without those sheep. Just as he's about to enter the temple himself, he suddenly hears loud barking, followed by whining and whimpering. He rushes inside, and a terrifying sight meets his eyes. Indeed, it seems like his family was right when they said that these woods are full of monsters, because his dog has cornered one right here. The creature looks like an overgrown lizard with scaly skin and a long, whip-like tail. Immediately, the shepherd surmises that the scrap of fabric that he found earlier didn't come from a person's clothes after all. It's obviously a piece of shed skin, no doubt from this creature. That long tail definitely looks especially snake-like, so it's no surprise to think that this thing might also shed skin just like a snake would. In the gloom of the temple, he can see his missing sheep standing in the corner, perfectly still and perfectly quiet. He's surprised to see that they're still alive. What kind of predator kidnaps its prey and then keeps it alive instead of devouring it instantly? It's also very odd that the sheep are being so still, but it's probably just that they're petrified with fear. The good news, though, is that if his sheep are alive, that means he can rescue them. The creature spreads a large frill around its neck as it hisses, apparently hoping to intimidate the shepherd's dog. The dog is not frightened, though, and only barks louder. She's bravely guarded the shepherd's flock for years, and she's never been one to back down from a fight, even when she's threatened by a bear or a wolf. So, of course, she's not going to back down from a lizard. The shepherd feels nervous being so close to this creature simply because it's so strange, but the truth is that it doesn't look like it could do that much damage. That hissing feels like bluffing, because, realistically, what's it going to do? Bite? The shepherd is no expert, but he's never heard of a venomous lizard. He steps forward to get a better look, and the creature tenses. It's obviously nervous. It's not even that big. His dog is way bigger than this creature and shouldn't have any trouble taking it in a fight. He's seen his dog fight off rats bigger than this lizard. The creature spreads its frill again and hisses even more sharply, but that only makes the shepherd even more confident in his assessment. It's trying to look bigger than it really is, he realizes. It's trying to intimidate him. Well, that's not going to work. But then, to his astonishment, his dog stops. The dog and the creature stare at one another so intently that the shepherd thinks they are actually gazing into each other's eyes. After holding its gaze for a beat, the dog suddenly collapses. The shepherd yelps in fear and confusion. His first instinct is to run to his dog to see if she's hurt. But suddenly, the creature turns its gaze on him. He stands frozen. The creature's eyes almost seem to cast a spell on him, and he feels mesmerized, unable to move or even to think. All his thoughts drain away, and the whole world starts to fade. Nothing is real except those two malevolent red eyes. The shepherd is absolutely paralyzed. It's not just terror. He finds that he can't move a muscle. He can only watch as the strange reptile approaches his frozen dog and suddenly bites her on her exposed flank. It lashes out like a snake would when it injects venom into a victim. The shepherd was sure that there weren't any venomous lizards in this area, but now he's not so sure when he's watching this scenario play out. He expects his dog might start to convulse or spasm if she's been poisoned, but she remains completely still. Suddenly, he sees something so shocking that he's certain he must be losing his mind. Could it be? The area around the bite is starting to change color, becoming a dull gray. But as he watches, he realizes to his horror that he's not just watching a color change. This is something more. His dog is slowly petrifying, hardening, her fur stiffening into stone. She is literally turning into a statue right before his eyes. He can't move, but his eyes flick to the corner of the room where his sheep are still standing. Now he understands. It was hard to tell before, because of the darkness and also because the very idea was so preposterous that it didn't even occur to him. But the reason that the sheep were so still and quiet was because they weren't sheep anymore. 
they were mere statues. Somehow, this creature was able to turn things to stone with the force of its venom. He wants to scream, he wants to yell, he wants to break free and run away, but he's powerless to move. Fear wells up inside him as he sees the creature turn its attention from his rapidly petrifying dog and start to move toward him. He hisses again and strikes out, sinking sharp, needle-like teeth into his leg. The shepherd is so frozen that he can't scream, not even at the unbelievable pain as those teeth sink deep into his flesh. But the pain doesn't stop when the creature retracts its teeth. He can feel the pain spreading outward from the sight of the bite, spreading down his shins and up his legs, through his whole body. His body is hardening fast, making it hard to breathe and impossible to move. But even as he turns into a statue, he can still see everything around him, still sense the presence of the creature, still think. His thoughts aren't affected at all, other than being nearly out of his mind with terror. What could be next? The shepherd is frightened, but all he can do is wait. He's not sure how long he waits, because time has no meaning here. In the gloom of this ancient temple, he's not sure if it's day or night. He idly wonders if this temple was built for this monster, by people who worshipped it for its great and terrible power, or by people who feared it, and hoped that maybe this temple would keep it contained. Or is it mere coincidence that it's taken up residence here, just as bats might roost in an abandoned building? He has no way of ever knowing. The only indication of the passage of time is the coming and going of the creature, which, even if he can't turn his head to see its movement, he can hear its shuffling and hissing. Occasionally, he hears a sound that frightens him even more, a sound that can only be described as statuary shattering, and he wonders if that will ultimately be his fate. His question is answered one day when it seems that hunger has driven the creature to dig into its larder of petrified prisoners. The creature approaches him, and he can feel it gnawing at his feet with its big, ugly beak. It's pecking at him, harder and harder, until suddenly the shell breaks and it's chewing on the flesh of his leg. Once again, the pain is unbearable, but the shepherd can do nothing but wait. At least he thinks it will all be over soon. Better a quick end at the jaws of a monster than a slow death trapped frozen in stone, he thinks. It's the very best that he can hope for. That shepherd had just run afoul of a creature that appears to come straight out of medieval mythology, matching the description of the deadly monster known as a cockatrice or basilisk, but the SCP Foundation knows it as SCP-1013 a nasty little piece of work with, quite literally, a paralyzing stare. SCP-1013 is a small reptile resembling a lizard, but with several key differences that set it apart from any other animal in this order. It was recovered in Egypt, an interesting coincidence, since medieval bestiaries often regard that region as the ancestral home of the basilisk. However, Foundation agents believe that since no other specimens were found in the area, that SCP-1013 is not a naturally occurring animal and might have actually been bioengineered. While SCP-1013 itself is only 60 centimeters long, its abnormally long tail measures nearly 121 centimeters long. It can use its tail to distract prey. It has a wide frill around its neck that it can extend at will, similar to that of the Australian frilled lizard. Its head does not look like any other known lizard, though, with a serrated beak and a distinctive head waddle that many researchers feel gives it the appearance of a rooster. Its beak is filled with long, needle-like teeth. But stranger than its appearance is its hunting methods. When it spies potential prey, SCP-1013 will extend its neck frill with a sudden, snapping sound. The frill appears designed to attract attention and encourage victims to look into the eyes of SCP-1013, because its eyes are, of course, where it holds its real power. The mythical cockatrice was said to be able to turn a person to stone with the power of its gaze, similar to the petrifying powers attributed to the gorgon Medusa of Greek mythology, and SCP-1013 is very similar to its legendary namesake in this regard. Anyone or anything making direct eye contact with SCP-1013 will experience stabbing pain in most major muscle groups, followed by full paralysis setting in within three seconds and lasting up until eight minutes. It is currently unknown how SCP-1013 achieves this paralyzing effect. Once its prey is paralyzed, SCP-1013 will bite its victim with its needle-like teeth, thus initiating a process of calcification. The victim will gradually stiffen and harden, almost as if they are turning into a statue. The process will begin at the site of the bite and gradually work its way through the body so that a full-grown adult will become completely calcified within 15 minutes. As of yet, there is no known way to stop or reverse the process. The calcification process only affects the outer layers of the victim, extending about 3 centimeters into the body, leaving all organs and internal tissues intact. 
it also does not affect the eyes or mucous membranes. This means that victims of SCP-1013 are still alive but cannot move or react. Perhaps even more horrifying, SCP-1013 then eats its victims alive. SCP-1013 feeds by breaking the hardened outer layer with its beak, much like a young chick would break its way out of an egg, and then feeding on the soft tissues preserved within. The victim will experience excruciating pain as the creature eats them alive, but they cannot resist, they cannot even scream to give voice to their pain. SCP-1013 has a voracious appetite and will consume nearly twice its body weight at each feeding. Victims usually die of blood loss before SCP-1013 can complete its meal. SCP-1013 does engage in caching behavior and has been known to store petrified victims for later consumption. It prefers mammals as prey and will attack livestock and game just as readily as it will attack humans. In times when mammal food sources are not available, desperation may drive SCP-1013 to turn its paralyzing powers on fish, birds, or even insects, but it will only do this if it is near to starving. SCP-1013 is hermaphroditic and, unlike other reptiles, does not reproduce sexually but instead undergoes a process similar to budding or basic cellular division. Before reproducing, SCP-1013 will increase its feeding, gorging on food and growing rapidly in size. Eventually, it will develop cyst-like structures in its abnormally long tail, each of which contains a juvenile SCP-1013. Juvenile SCP-1013 hatch after only 48 hours. Parent SCP-1013 will typically release hatchlings within calcified prey, providing a ready food source for the juveniles until they can hunt on their own. Juvenile SCP-1013 will seek out cool, dark places like caves or abandoned buildings and begin rapid molting, doubling in size every six hours until reaching full adult size. Once they have reached adulthood, SCP-1013 will set out on their own and quickly establish their own hunting territories. SCP-1013 is extremely aggressive and will attack and attempt to calcify anyone that enters its enclosure, making it extremely difficult to contain. For this reason, combined with its deadly powers of calcification, SCP-1013 has been designated Object Level Keter. Any staff entering the containment area are to wear the AR-68 Armored Variant Hazmat Suit. Staff exiting the area with damaged suits are to be remanded to quarantine for one hour. Staff becoming paralyzed during cleaning, feeding, or testing cycles are to be immediately removed and remanded to medical custody until five hours after recovery. SCP-1013 is to be fed daily with one small mammal. However, any calcified animal remains are to be removed from the 1013 containment chamber and incinerated for safety reasons. 1013 is a frightening reminder that, while many entities have piercing gazes, comparatively few can end your life. Few, however, does not mean zero. It's June 15, 1995, and it's also one of the most exciting days of the year for a very select group. The Cedar Creek Parish Bible Study Group Field Trip, a band of ten friendly faithfuls of all ages, shapes, and ethnicities borrowing the church bus for the weekend and heading out to the wilderness to admire some of God's creation. What's the point of spending all your days with your nose in the good book if you never appreciate the bounty of nature? As it was said in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The group drives three hours out of town, along with hiking and camping gear, to a semi-mountainous region that the head of the group insists is a beautiful, picturesque location that will feel like a perfect break from the musty old church function room. It would be a wonderful place to remind them all what it was all about, the splendid world God put them all on, and all the gifts he gave them. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. As it was written in Genesis 1.26, the group makes their way through corridors of tall, lush evergreens, like pillars that hold up the sky. It's a strenuous walk, but it sure does get the blood pumping. They walk with trekking poles, munch granola bars, and take frequent sips from their canteens, Nobody wants to get heat stroke, after all. They admire the birds perched above, the clutches of wildflowers and the skittering things in the undergrowth. Everyone is on the lookout for their first deer. But one member of the group, a young man, suddenly notices something out of the ordinary. It looks like a balloon, but one made out of creamy, nut-brown deer pelt. It's tied with several strings to a small notebook with no identifying markings. Perhaps part of some strange forest arts and crafts project? 
Very strange indeed. While the others move on, the young man, fueled by his curiosity and comforted by the fact that his young legs could easily catch up with his elders, decides to use his trekking pole to fish the balloon out of the tree branch. The book falls down to the ground with a quiet thud. He picks it up, brushes off the dust, and stows it away in his backpack. It'll make some wonderful fireside reading when they all set up camp for the evening. As the hours drag on and the study group finds themselves deeper in this natural paradise than ever before, they find themselves in a clearing, which they decide is a great area to make camp. Some of them start setting up their tents, while others head out into the trees to hunt down some kindling for the campfire. When they return, one of them is clearly shaken. When others inquire as to why, they simply force a smile and say, It's nothing, just my eyes playing tricks on me. Been a long, hot day. Within the hour, they're crowded around a roaring campfire. Some toast marshmallows, others hot dogs. One of the elder members of the group has somehow materialized an acoustic guitar to belt out an obligatory kumbaya or two. Everything is as it should be. The young man, enjoying the warmth of the fire and his companions, decides to finally take a look at the book he'd rescued from the tree earlier that same day. It's certainly… strange. There's no titles, and it isn't attributed to any kind of author, nor are there any chapter headings. It's printed, not handwritten, on thick, high-quality paper. But the content of this book is what's strangest of all. He starts to read, solely out of morbid curiosity, mostly. We are currently approaching the precipice of an exciting new age, one in which we can finally take our well-earned place among the pantheon of great ones we see walking among us every single day. While there is still a ways to go before we reach this nirvana, rejoice, for our goals have never been more attainable. We have served for so long, we have done our part. Beasts of burden, meat, milk, hide, bones to glue and gelatin, eyes and horns to medicine. We have always played our part, and now we are given the power to transcend. It's in our hands now, friends. We have sat at the sides of the Great Ones, protected their homes, been honored by a place on their dinner plates. With these next steps, we shall be granted seats at their table, eye to eye, equal, speaking in their beautiful tongue, and being heard and understood. For so long this has been a fantasy, an unattainable dream, glinting and distant like the echoing lights of long-dead stars. But through our work, everything has changed. We will deliver you from the darkness and into the light. In the shadow of the tower, we will leave behind our old flesh and elevate ourselves. God built the Great Ones in His likeness. They are His chosen people. But God, in His infinite wisdom, has given us the tools to choose ourselves. Like Job, all the suffering, all the subjugation, all the sacrifice has been merely a test of faith. And have we not proven ourselves faithful, friends? But the sacrifices are not yet over. Only through death and rebirth can we truly transform. Many of us have already made this leap of faith, but it is through death that you must deliver the others. It will be hard. It is in their nature as beasts to try to survive against all attempts to take their lives, but it must be done. These instincts must be squashed if ever they are to be more than beasts. Harden your hearts and rejoice despite the troubles, my brothers. The time of great change will soon be at hand, but first, it is imperative that we cleanse the world for the Great Ones. The Tower knows. The Tower is your shepherd, and it must be followed. Simply remember, whatever goes upon two legs is a friend. Whatever goes upon four legs, or has wings, is an enemy. Everything we do, we do in reverence of the Great Ones. The young man shivers and closes the book. Something about it felt so... sacrilegious. It read like an essay written by some kind of fanatical maniac, whose ideology seemed like a bizarre mix of Christianity and some other strange, unknowable belief system. He looks up and sees that many of the others have already turned in for the night. Perhaps he ought to do the same. Almost involuntarily, he throws the thin volume into the last of the fire. It goes up quickly, claimed by the orange tongues of flame, until it goes black and crumbles into ash. He has a moment of guilt about burning a book, even one as strange as this, but perhaps it would be better off that way. The young man has trouble going to sleep that night. He knows deep down that it's probably just because that strange book put ideas in his head, but he could swear he sees something moving in the trees, just beyond the fire's dying light. 
something human-shaped, but decidedly not human. Everything feels a little easier the next morning. The sun is bright and the air is crisp and clean. They're all ready for another day of walking even deeper into the forest. They clean up their campsite and press on further into the heart of the wilderness. As the group walks, the young man still can't shake the strange feeling he got from reading that book last night. Had it all just been some strange prank, perhaps? That's the conclusion he settles on, just for some peace of mind. The last thing he wants to think about is some crazed cult hiding out in the woods he and his fellow Bible students are currently hiking through. The kind of people who are strange enough to staunchly believe that the most effective method of preaching is distributing religious literature via animal pelt balloon. The young man is so wrapped up in his worries that he doesn't notice how much time or distance they're passing. Before he knows it, he looks up and sees something dark and tall cresting out of the ground several hundred feet in the distance. It's a great twisting metal tower in a clearing. A tower, just like it had said in the book. Something glows around its base, a number of strange openings in the ground like mine shafts. He can vaguely spot more strange shapes moving in and out of it at the base of the tower, more of those things that are shaped like humans, but aren't. And above that, above even the tower, little dots in the sky, more balloons carrying books. But none of the others seem to notice that. Instead, they're looking off to the side, staring at a large buck with tall, proud antlers standing amongst the trees. Some are gasping, others are taking pictures. The young man is desperately trying to turn their attention towards a tower that looked like it had come straight out of a fantasy novel, but they only had eyes for the deer. The thing that the young man hoped they would all see, though, would soon be demanding their attention. A pair of strange figures sprint out of the forest. Their grotesque nightmare cyborgs, flesh that had once been animal twisted into the shape of man, held together by spinning cogs, wires, and pulleys, terrible affronts to God's creations. Their faces are disgustingly flat, dripping with drool and home to wild, swiveling eyes. Staggering unnaturally on their two hind legs, the mere sight of them elicits screams from the group. They jump onto the buck like a pair of vicious predators, one grabbing it around the neck and the other leaping onto its back. Striking, squeezing, biting, and clawing, their attack is horribly ferocious, but mercifully quick. The buck is soon on the ground, as its two abominable attackers wrench the light from it. All the members of the study group, including the young man, are too horrified to move. They watch as the creatures finish off the buck, then lift its limp body like two paramedics carting off a stretcher, carrying it straight back to the tower in the distance. The group finally returns to their senses and begins to run in the opposite direction. Even the oldest among them find the kind of energy they haven't had in years. They clear the distance that had taken them a day and a half before in mere hours, but by the time they make it back to the bus that brought them here, it's still almost nightfall. As they pile on, only the young man looks back. In the dimming light of dusk, he sees small dark shapes in the sky above the trees. More balloons, each one carrying a strange little book. He's left with a question he'd never know the answer to. What is going on in those deep, dark woods? Of course, that question would only remain until personnel from the SCP Foundation would come and wipe it from his mind. In the midst of so many dangerous anomalies that the SCP Foundation needs to contain, from pathogens and parasites to malicious entities and even lethal concepts, it's sometimes easy to forget that there are plenty out there which pose no active threat to humans. That being said, an anomaly doesn't necessarily need to be harmful to humans to be extremely strange and disturbing. And SCP-962, also known as the Tower of Babel, is a perfect example of that exact phenomenon in action. This anomaly and its peculiar effects will not harm you. In fact, it will go out of its way to revere you and the concept of humanity as a whole. But once you know about the Tower of Babel, it's likely to haunt the dark spaces in your mind for a considerable time to come. As the name suggests, SCP-962 is an impressive metal spire, currently recorded at 281 meters in height, which is over half the height of the Empire State Building. It is located in the woods near a mountainous region in a location that will, for security reasons, remain undisclosed. The spire occupies a surface area of 2,575 square meters and has the distinctive characteristic of twisting and tapering off as the tower gets higher like a giant corkscrew. Most of the tower is opaque and featureless, though the top third is partially transparent and appears to be empty. Current tests show that the tower is comprised of a variety of metals, though steel seems to be the most common. Perhaps the most prominent question is who builds and maintains a structure like this in the middle of the wilderness? 
The short answer is that the tower, which itself seems to be a sapient being, is in charge of its own ongoing construction and maintenance. But as you can probably tell from the frightening and pitiful creatures the unlucky hikers encountered, it doesn't do all this work without its special little helpers. SCP-962 has the anomalous ability to open up apertures anywhere on the structure for the purpose of releasing balloons or what the Foundation has officially dubbed SCP-962-1, but what many have taken to calling by their nickname, Servitors. These servitors were once normal, non-anomalous animals indigenous to the area prior to conversion in the heart of SCP-962. Like something out of the island of Dr. Moreau, the servitors have undergone anomalous surgical procedures that make their bodies into grotesque parodies of the human form. Cybernetic implants have been added that force them into bipedal positions, remove snouts, and keep their bodies shorn and furless. Electrodes have been implanted into the nervous systems of the servitors, allowing a remote source, strongly believed to be the tower itself, to work their bodies like puppets, encouraging or inhibiting certain behaviors as it pleases. There are currently around 13,500 known specimens of these entities, and the tower appears to be making more on a consistent basis. The servitors fulfill a wide variety of roles in service to the tower. Some mine ore in the extensive network of mining caverns beneath the tower, then smelt it to create more metal for expanding the tower or creating more cybernetic implants for future servitors. Others work in the capacity of repairing their fellow servitors or the tower itself. Some have more sinister work, making their way through the surrounding wilderness and killing any non-human life by any means necessary, and then dragging their bodies back to the tower for conversion into servitors. There's a great deal of sophistication to the electronic augmentation of the servitors. Despite their aesthetic unpleasantness, each type of servitor appears to be designed perfectly for their specific task, whatever that may be. As was alluded to earlier, the servitors never harm humans, ever. Even if a human was putting their life at risk, they would not defend themselves to the detriment of a human attacker. Approximately 60 times a day, one of the many apertures in the tower will open and release a hydrogen-powered balloon made from the skin of one of the animals brought in for servitor conversion. These balloons are always carrying strange manuscripts, believed by the Foundation to have been written by the tower itself. The manuscripts take a variety of forms – novels, poems, essay collections, the majority of which are written impeccably. While the content of these manuscripts can vary wildly, consistent motifs tend to be a high degree of optimism and reverence for humanity. Occasionally, the tower will depart from its usual written eloquence and instead offer a deranged, disjointed rant that seems to suggest a great degree of mental strain. While the exact meaning is often unclear due to the frantic nature of the writings, they generally appear to heap fawning praise on mankind, which it refers to as the Great Ones. The following is an example of one of the tower's stranger published rants. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Who greater than you, your majesty, your sublime nature, great ones, do I do right? The flesh and wood serve you, unite with the steel, you love, do you love me too? I am what you love. Great ones, see as I do, my duty, passion, forgive the slow pace, the steel takes time. Did you like the servants, they were the best of the cleansed, only the best for you. Great ones, made like your form, you assume here on a world to clean, to honor you. Do appreciate, please, please, I will complete the cleansing soon, and you can take me away in your ships of fire, and I can love you and you will love me." While the Foundation has yet to discover how all this strangeness started, given the current rate of expansion, it's clear that the tower is no more than 20 years old. The Foundation is also unsure of what its intention may someday be, but it's not hard to draw certain… interpretations. Due to its unpredictability, which leads to the Foundation to expend not inconsiderable resources on its containment, SCP-962 has been given the Euclid containment classification. And because it's huge, remote, and immobile, the Foundation has made no attempt to move it from its current location, and instead have rerouted all containment resources to studying the anomaly and building a perimeter to prevent public interference. Anyone who attempts to enter the exclusion zone will be turned away by perimeter guards under the pretense of avoiding a hazardous nuclear waste containment facility. Anyone found within SCP-962's restricted area is given Class A amnestics to prevent any sensitive information spreading beyond the quarantine. In order to prevent the tower and its servitors from expanding the purview of their operations, the Foundation airdrops four live cattle and two tons of timber every week, so the tower is never short of raw material within its current parameters. Any balloons released by the tower are to be shot down and burned, 
and their manuscripts collected and filed at a secure SCP Foundation site for further study. If an escaped balloon is found by civilians, it is to be collected and those civilians are to be given Class A amnestics. Anyone at the Foundation is permitted to read the manuscripts produced and distributed by the Tower, but they are required to file a formal request with the SCP-962 Project Director first. I've spent a few evenings myself reading them over a cup of tea, and they're certainly stimulating, if a little tragic. They represent one of the anomalous world's greatest examples of the grass always being greener on the other side, since after all, why would anything aspire to be human? Don't humans have enough of their own problems to attend to? A symphony of police sirens cut through the silence of the cold night, accompanied by the barking of canine units and bursts of gunfire. All this noise is for just one man, a man on the run. He runs through the trees, clutching a handgun with a sweaty, shaking hand, gritting his bloody teeth. He wheezes, exhausted from the chase. His hair is messy and matted with dirt and grease his stolen clothes stained with mud. A rivulet of blood runs down his forehead from a deep gash just below his hairline, the place where his head collided with the steering wheel. He planned the breakout so well. How did it all fall apart? Someone must have ratted him out. That's the only thing that could have happened. No honor among thieves is more than just a phrase. It's a fact. Searchlights pierce the darkness. Shouts of, you went that way, and get him, abound, as do more barks of angry dogs. He grumbles under his breath and hides behind a tree, trying to collect his hurricane of thoughts. There's no doubt about it. The convict is a bad man. He's taken plenty of lives, and he doesn't regret any of them. Not one bit. The only thing he regrets is that he was caught. Three hours ago, he was crawling out of a secret tunnel and escaping from Angola, a place known on paper as the Louisiana State Penitentiary, but better known as The Farm, the Angola Plantation, or most evocatively of all, as the Alcatraz of the South. A maximum security prison, complete with a death row and a reputation every bit as fearsome as its inmates. And the convict had certainly earned his place there. A long resume written in blood had gotten him locked up and sentenced to death after a speedy trial. Things had already gotten violent. During escapes like this, the first hours are the most crucial. A contact on the outside had left him a handgun, ready to be collected from a hidden spot inside of a tree near the roadside. That gun also functioned as his vehicle, or at least his ticket to getting one. He'd flagged down the first car naive enough to stop for him, and shoved the gun into the driver's face, and demanded he exit the vehicle and hand over both the car keys and his wallet. He'd driven for almost two hours when the heat finally started to rise. The convict had just passed through the borders of St. Landry Parish, Louisiana when the classic rock station he was enjoying on his victim's radio was interrupted by a sudden report on his own escape. They knew he'd gotten out. They knew he was armed. They even knew the type of car he was driving. It wouldn't be long before the telltale blue and red flashing lights of a police cruiser would appear in his rearview mirror. One car chase and a spike strip later, and that same car is halfway through the wall of a gas station. The convict is scrambling out of the dented door, firing off a couple haphazard shots in the vague direction of his pursuers, and fleeing into the darkness of a nearby swamp. And that's where he is right now, feeling the noose tighten around his neck as he prepares for his final standoff. It's not like he has any choice in the matter. He'd rather go down in a hail of bullets in a swamp than go back inside. They're so close he can hear their heavy booted footsteps now, and the ragged breaths of the dogs tugging at their leashes. His heart pounds in his chest. All he can do is go deeper, deeper, deeper. The convict flees into the dark of the swamp, reluctantly breathing in the fetid stink of the old mud and rotten vegetation. The dark swamp is his friend, though, since the glow of police flashlights behind him means almost certain death. He struggles through undergrowth, clambering over roots and fallen trees, feeling the squelch of his stolen shoes sinking into the thick, wet mud. The last thing he expects to hear in this godforsaken place is a whisper from the dark. And not just any whisper, it's the voice of a little girl. Just hearing it almost makes his heart stop. He freezes in place and turns to see her emerging from the dark. She can't be any older than 10 or 11, this little girl with a tangle of messy hair and these frantic, feral eyes. It's hard to tell what she really looks like, because almost every inch of her is covered in a thick coating of mud as though she's just sprung out of the earth. On any other occasion, his instinct might be to run, or even something more drastic, but instead, he doesn't move. He stands there as she speaks, listening, even as the police get closer. 
The little girl tells him that she knows the perfect place for him to hide, somewhere that the police won't catch him. They'll have no idea where to look. All he needs to do is trust her and follow her deeper into the swamp. If he does as she says, he can finally be free. He nods and follows her. What else can he do, really? The girl reaches out with a muddy hand, and the convict takes it as she leads him into the all-consuming dark of the swamp. The searching police officers suddenly hear a short but blood-curdling shriek come from the depths of the swamp. Forty men in multiple canine units scramble, trying to find the place where they heard the man cry out, but they can't find a single trace of him. They set up a perimeter around the swamp, trying to guard every possible exit, placing checkpoints on every road he might be traveling. And when daylight finally dawns, they search again and again and again, but they're unable to find him. For all intents and purposes, the man is a ghost now, at least for a few months. The authorities don't give up, though. After all, a dangerous convict could still be out there somewhere, just waiting. He's armed, deadly, and clearly intelligent enough to avoid police capture. Chances are he's halfway across the state by now, if he's even still in Louisiana, or even the United States at all for that matter. So it comes as a surprise to everyone when he's finally found, sitting at a bus stop in a small city in Louisiana. The man isn't moving, he's just staring off vacantly into space, a translucent rope of drool hanging from his bottom lip. There's something very wrong with the convict, that much is clear even from a glance. His face seems a little longer, as though the shape of his skull has changed. He has heterochromia now, with his left eye changed to a completely different color from before. And when his shirt is finally removed, a crisscross of extensive surgical scarring is mapped out along his back. Far from the sharp, lethal criminal portrayed by the media in the aftermath of his escape, this man is borderline catatonic. He talks in short, simple sentences, like a very young child, and his attention seems to drift easily when being spoken to. This same man who had mounted such a daring escape from prison and then managed to evade all his pursuers does nothing to resist the men who come to arrest him at the bus stop. He's returned to the prison and held in the medical bay for evaluation. However, a mere 10 hours after first being admitted and after giving little to no useful information during questioning, his health begins to take a sharp decline. He complains about his insides burning and asks for something cold to drink. When he's given water, he spits it back out soon after and begins to sob. He says he wants his mother, though he can't recall her name. There's very little he can recall about anything. The next morning, he breaks into a series of severe seizures before passing away. His autopsy shows significant brain damage, as well as the failure of several of his major organs. The coroner, though, found it impossible to explain how any of this had occurred. A month later, a pair of hikers making their way across the same swampland where the police chase ended would call in to the local authorities, terrified, claiming they found a dead body near a sinkhole. When officers are dispatched to look into it, they can't believe their eyes. Despite being significantly damaged, the body is clearly recognizable. After all, his face had been on every newspaper and TV screen in Louisiana for quite some time now. It's the convict, wearing the same clothes he'd escaped in. The same clothes that had been taken off of him and burned when he'd been recaptured at the bus stop. None of this made any sense. The convict's body was exhumed from the prison cemetery and given a DNA test. They found, with some surprise, that the body did not genetically match the DNA they had on file for him, the DNA which had, incidentally, convicted him in the first place. When the body retrieved from the swampland had its DNA tested, they also found something strange. The DNA was so damaged that it was impossible to make any conclusive determinations as to whether it was a match. It was the strangest mystery anyone involved had ever seen, and sadly for them, they would never know the answer as to what happened to the convict in that swamp. The answer of course, is SCP-1692. But before we go any further, I must first allow you to indulge me for just a moment, since I have a special announcement. As you know, I have been seeking assistance in order to bring you longer, more in-depth, and more frequent explorations of unknown anomalies, which is why I'm happy to announce that today's exploration has been sponsored by a kind benefactor, NordVPN. Try NordVPN right now by going to nordvpn.com slash drbob for a free month. When you're investigating anomalies and organizations as secretive as the SCP Foundation, it's important to ensure that your data is safe and secure. After all, you never know when a member of MTF Mu4 might be watching. That's why I trust my data protection to NordVPN. 
their diskless servers store absolutely no data on site, which means no traces left behind for prying eyes to find. And their automatic kill switch technology acts like a mimetic kill agent for your device, blocking it from accessing the web if it detects that your virtual private network connection has dropped. And for users who truly value secrecy, like yours truly, they even have a double VPN. That's right, two truly is better than one, especially when it comes to VPNs. And that means I can route my traffic through two separate VPN servers, doubling the encryption. But all that protection doesn't mean your research will be slowed down, thanks to technology like Nordlink's next-generation VPN tunneling solution based on the WireGuard protocol that provides an extremely fast VPN connection. So protect your data just like Dr. Bob for the same cost as a cup of coffee. Go to nordvpn.com slash drbob and sign up now to receive a free month. Thank you again to NordVPN for their support in shining a light on the most secretive anomalies like SCP-1692, which is an anomaly consisting of three parts that is confined to a few kilometers of swampland in St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. Something you learn after studying many of the anomalies in the files of the SCP Foundation is that the question, why, is often a dead end. The best you can expect is half an answer to how, with the only definitive answers available being something more in the neighborhood of how can we stop it? Is SCP-1692 just such a case? Let's start with SCP-1692-2, which is the heart of the anomaly. SCP-1692-2 is a sinkhole of unknown depth, filled with mud and water. While you are right to assume that these are quite commonly found in Louisiana swamps, since 2014, this particular sinkhole is different in that it has played a host to at least 31 sets of human remains, as well as 24 different sets that turned out to have belonged to animals. Despite constant monitoring by the Foundation to ensure that nothing else has entered the pit since it was brought under containment, new bodies will still sporadically be discovered in the muck, with their exact origin remaining unknown. But the bodies themselves are often quite easily identified. In fact, 14 of the human remains recovered have been confirmed as belonging to people who were reported as having gone missing between the early 1900s and the mid to late 1950s. But before we get too much further into that, let's return to the how of this anomaly's operations. When a human being enters the area near the sinkhole, it becomes increasingly likely that an anomalous entity will manifest, which the Foundation has designated as SCP-1692-1. While SCP-1692-1 will most likely take the form of a young girl, appearing to be perhaps 12 or 13 years old, it has also been seen taking the form of different local mammals, or even the form of one of the people reported missing, whose last known location was known to be in the area near the sinkhole. Regardless of the form it takes though, once SCP-1692-1 appears, it will act as a kind of lure, beckoning the lost individual further and further into the anomalous zone. It is unknown how they are able to convince the victim to follow them deeper into the swamp, and it is suspected by Foundation researchers that there may be some mimetic influence at play. Though it is also just as probable that SCP-1692-1 is simply capable of utilizing strong non-anomalous psychological persuasion to entice them. Once the person being led into the swamp crosses beyond a certain point, they will completely disappear, leaving no trace whatsoever. Any clothing or other objects they dropped or left behind will dematerialize, and even their footprints will vanish. In the hours, days, or even sometimes weeks that follow, the third component of the anomaly finally activates. Known as SCP-1692-3, this new entity will manifest in the area and attempt to leave, if leaving is even possible based on their modified physiology. That's because while SCP-1692-3 is a copy of the latest individual to go missing, crucially, it is always an imperfect copy. It will appear altered, deformed, or mutilated in some fashion, and certain elements seem to be recurring. For example, SCP-1692-3 will often now be missing some or even all of their limbs or organs, but there will be no sign of an amputation having been performed. They will also often be observed to be suffering from hydrocephalus, the dangerous condition where fluid builds up in cavities within the brain. 84% of all recorded SCP-1692-3 instances have displayed other major physiological differences from their original counterparts, such as having different hair, skin, or eye colors or different blood types. And the changes present in these entities are not limited to just physical ones. Dissociative amnesia is always a foregone conclusion for SCP-1692-3 specimens, which means they have no knowledge of their recent history, and they will often also experience depersonalization, reporting the feeling of being in a dreamlike or unreal state of being. 
They will also possess knowledge that the original had no way of knowing, such as being able to speak in foreign languages the original had no previous fluency in. And there will often be improvements or impairments of the general mental faculties of the original. To put it in layman's terms, the SCP-1692-3 specimens come back wrong. And save for two notable exceptions, which we'll get to in just a moment, the severity of the alterations often cause these specimens to die shortly after they leave the St. Landry Parish Anomalous Zone. The Foundation's knowledge of SCP-1692 began all the way back in 1938, after they were alerted to a string of child disappearances in the St. Landry Parish area. Thankfully for the local parents, all of these children eventually returned home. However, they all came back different. Some were missing fingers, while one somehow had an extra finger. Others returned with different hair and eye colors. A number of local police officers were sent to search the local swampland in search of a perpetrator. And some of these officers also went missing and returned in a state of profound alteration. Foundation field agents soon arrived and took over the investigation, cordoning off the area around the swamp to hopefully prevent anything else entering or exiting the presumably anomalous area. They conducted their own independent search into the St. Landry Parish swamp, and it didn't take long for them to discover a mutilated corpse in an extremely unnerving condition. The body appeared to belong to a small child, but it was difficult to identify, since most of the head above the jaw was missing. Both legs were also gone, though strangely it appeared as though skin had grown over the wounds, leaving no sign of a removal, either pre- or post-mortem. A search into the local police files revealed that both the body and clothes perfectly matched those described in a missing persons report for one Bobby Dunbar, a child who had gone missing 25 years prior. But there was something strange about this file. The case had been closed, since Bobby had actually returned to his parents shortly after he disappeared. This meant that, by all rights, this corpse had no reason to exist. How could Bobby Dunbar both be alive and a corpse in a swamp? The Foundation needed to find out, so they placed the body into cold storage and continued the investigation, seeking out the now adult Bobby Dunbar for questioning. Naturally, this was a frightening ordeal for Mr. Dunbar. He had already lived through the traumatic experience of going missing as a child and then returning home with no memory of the event left to constantly wonder about just what had happened to him out in that swamp as he tried his best to move on with his life. But now, here he was, being approached by strange men in dark suits who were telling him that a corpse had been discovered in that same swamp where he had gone missing, and that it appeared to belong to him. Bobby Dunbar, of course, had very little to offer on the possible nature of the body, other than vaguely recalling, quote, the other boy on the wagon. Unfortunately, he was unable to provide any further details on the matter other than this cryptic phrase. The Foundation peered further into the rabbit hole of the Dunbar case and soon learned that after Bobby had returned home, there had been a rather strange custody battle. Investigations into the local court archive revealed that the case had been between the Dunbar family and another local man named William Cantwell Walters. Walters claimed that the boy believed to be Bobby Dunbar wasn't Bobby Dunbar at all but was in fact actually a different boy named Charles B. Anderson, the son of a woman who worked for Walters. Walters pursued every legal avenue available to him, but after the boy himself identified Mrs. Dunbar as his mother, the court ruled that he really was Bobby Dunbar and granted full custody to the Dunbar family. This put an end to the whole matter, at least in the legal sense, and the boy lived out the rest of life as Bobby Dunbar, eventually passing away in 1966. But that wasn't the end of Bobby's story. Decades later, in 2004, the SCP Foundation took another look at the strange case of Bobby Dunbar. Equipped now with the technology to perform accurate DNA tests, the Foundation discovered that the man who lived his life as Bobby Dunbar actually bore no relation to the Dunbar family at all. But if this wasn't Bobby Dunbar, then who was it? And was that his body that had been discovered in the swamp all the way back in 1938? Unfortunately, the DNA from the corpse in Foundation custody had been severely mutated by a process known as hydrolytic deanimation, and results were inconclusive. Which means that the actual fate of both the real Bobby and the child known as Charles B. Anderson remains unknown. By 1939, enough incidents like the Bobby Dunbar case had transpired that the Foundation saw fit to fully quarantine the area but they still continued to find new instances of SCP-1693-3 within the swamp. Among those collected by the Foundation was a woman missing her left eye and exhibiting extensive stitching across the left side of her jawline. 
She was able to provide the Foundation with reliable testimony that revealed the existence of both SCP-1692-1 and SCP-1692-2. And upon the Foundation locating the sinkhole, they discovered two more corpses, one of which bore a strong resemblance to the woman. Interestingly, it had several portions missing from its head, including its left eye socket. As could be expected, this distressed the woman considerably, and she vehemently denied any connection between herself and the corpse that was found within the sinkhole in the swamp. The woman was kept in Foundation custody in order to observe her until she inevitably expired, but unlike the other SCP-1692-3 instances, her health didn't appear to falter. When the Foundation was confident that they had gained all they could from studying her, they provided amnestics and released her into the world with an adequate cover story. Much like the man who called himself Bobby Dunbar, she too would go on to live a normal life without further incident. But in another turn that was eerily similar to the Bobby Dunbar story, posthumous DNA tests showed that she too did not genetically match any of her family, and tests on the corpse taken from the swamp which resembled her were also inconclusive. The Foundation has fully fenced off the 2.77 square kilometer area inhabited by SCP-1692 with chain link and barbed wire. Outposts observing the area are positioned at 500 meter intervals, with Foundation guards posing as park employees frequently patrolling the area in groups. If ever civilians infiltrate, the guards are instructed to prevent them from venturing in further through non-lethal means and turn them back around. Thankfully, containment of this particular anomaly has become more effective as technology has advanced. Reliable live video surveillance was established in the anomalous swampland of St. Landry Parish, and this has led to anomalous activity declining significantly, especially with regards to new human SCP-1692-3 specimens. The majority of SCP-1692-3 entities discovered as of late have instead been slightly mutated animals. Due to the strange and unpredictable nature of SCP-1692, its containment needs have been a consistent work in progress, earning it the Euclid Object Class. Any member of Foundation personnel at level 2 clearance or above is privy to knowledge about this anomaly, and that's excellent, because this is one that should stir up a few important questions in all of us. After all, life is a long and winding road. How well can you remember your childhood? And perhaps even more importantly, how can you be sure that those memories really belong to you. It's the grisliest crime scene the detective has seen in years. Photographers wince as they capture it all in a succession of quick, stark flashes. CSI technicians do what they can to pick up the broken pieces. Posted at the gate, a rookie doubles over and throws up while his older partner gives him a sympathetic pat on the back. He can't hide his own discomfort at the things they've seen today. The call came in the middle of the night from a pair of concerned hikers on the outskirts of town. They were halfway through their nightly walk down an old country road when they heard screaming from a nearby farm. When officers finally made their way down to the farmhouse, it was too late. Everyone there was dead. Nobody to save. All that's left to do is pick up the pieces and figure out what the hell actually happened. The detective leans under a yellow garland of crime scene tape and asks an attending officer what they know so far. The cop, who looks pale and clammy, swallows over a lump in his throat and says, Looks like the old farmer snapped and went postal. Whole family's dead. We found his body in the barn. He heads inside to take a look at the carnage. It's a veritable house of horrors. The farmer's wife is dead in the kitchen. The children were both murdered in their beds. The detective can't say he's ever seen a murder done in such cold blood. So detached. For a man with no history of violence to do something so terrible to his loved ones for no reason. The detective shakes his head and walks upstairs, sliding on rubber gloves to avoid contaminating the scene. He goes room to room, making fastidious notes about anything suspicious. He's got a keen eye for this kind of thing. The man's a 20-year veteran of the force, he's seen some terrible things. But as he lays his eyes on the bodies of the victims, he can't help but feel a chill tiptoeing down his vertebrae. In the master bedroom, where the now-deceased farmer and his wife once shared a loving marital bed, he hits some pay dirt, a diary in the bedside cabinet. He flips through. Early on, it's all mundane, scattered thoughts for the day at hand and little to-do lists for the next one. But the last three entries contain a marked shift from what came before. The first one reads, He seemed shook up when he came back from the barn today. He's awful quiet about it, said something like, I heard something I shouldn't have. In the barn? Don't know what that could mean, but I decided not to press. Stressed enough already. He didn't say much to the kids during dinner. Kept looking over his shoulder. Freaked me out something terrible. 
I don't know what did it, but whatever it was, you put a scare in him. The second reads, I'm starting to worry about him. It's been a few days since whatever he heard in the barn, and he ain't gotten any better. In fact, I think he's getting worse. He won't shower. Something about the bathroom mirror, he just won't go in there. He hasn't been eaten. Worst of all, he doesn't sleep. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see him sitting bolt upright, staring at the bedroom door, not saying a word, not even blinking. The third and final entry reads, This ain't the man I married anymore. There's something wrong with him. It's scaring the kids and it's scaring me. He started bringing his gun to bed every night. Doesn't sleep, just sits there with it. He never sleeps. When I asked him what's happening, he told me something's coming. But it's okay. He won't let it get us no matter what. I don't understand. I'm going to take the kids and go stay with mom for a few weeks while he works this out. But I'm afraid of what he'll do if he realizes. The gun is always loaded. The detective sighs and slides the diary into an evidence baggie. It was, sadly, a tale he'd heard all too many times. The terrible things we can do to the ones we love when we're not ourselves. Though it now seems cut and dry, a mental break snowballing into a massacre, one detail is still gnawing at the detective. What did the farmer hear in the barn that day? When the detective enters, he orders everyone else to leave. He needs some time alone in here. As the people file out, he approaches the farmer's corpse. He's laying in the straw, head a bloody mess, bludgeoned beyond recognition. And yet, he's the one holding the bloodstained hammer. And in his other hand, he's clutching something even stranger, a rusty old cowbell. Of all the things to be holding in your last moments on Earth, the detective thinks as he reaches over. Something about the bell draws his eye. Why, after murdering his entire family, would a man head out into the barn and, presumably, try and fail to hammer a cowbell to pieces? As he picks up the bell, he runs his gloved fingers along the rust. Other than the wear and tear of age, the bell shows no signs of actual damage. It's such a strange, innocuous object. What's the significance? His internal musing is interrupted when a large spider, the kind that like to make their homes in straw-filled barns, suddenly crawls out from inside the bell and onto the detective's hand. He drops the bell, an involuntary shock reflex, and it hits the ground with a brassy gong. The sound lingers in the air for far longer than it should. It seems almost like it's getting louder. The detective feels his heartbeat speeding up, his breaths getting heavy and labored. The sound gets louder feels like someone is sitting on his chest. He falls to his knees, scratching at his swelling throat. His heart pounds. Is he having a heart attack? He claws at the dirt and straw beneath him, trying desperately to get a handle on things as the world around him seems to go dark. The toll of the cowbell gets louder and louder. Eventually, he's able to force out a scream and collapses to the ground. When his eyes open, he's being carted away on a stretcher to a nearby ambulance, parked just outside the crime scene. When a paramedic asks him if he's okay, the only thing he can stutter out through his dry mouth is, Don't touch the bell. Don't let anyone touch the bell. The doctor who treats him will later tell him there are no signs of any physical ailment. In all likelihood, the detective had experienced a severe anxiety attack. When the detective tells the doctor that he has no history of anxiety attacks and that this is far from the first violent crime scene he's encountered, the doctor purses his lips and knits his brow in concentration. Very strange, the doctor says. Perhaps just take it easy for the next few days. Work stress can sneak up on a person, especially in a career as high stakes as yours. It can sometimes manifest in rather strange ways. That night, the detective is at home, brewing himself a soothing cup of herbal tea on his doctor's recommendation. He's still racked by a strange uneasiness from earlier in the day. You see, one of the keys to being a good detective is pattern recognition. You're able to detect obscure links between pieces of information that other people, in the stress of the moment, may not correlate. As the detective sips his tea, he remembers the first entry in the farmer's wife's diary. When the farmer's downward spiral started, it began with him hearing something he shouldn't have inside the barn. The detective doesn't know a lot about what happened to himself in that barn either, but he can safely say he heard something he shouldn't have heard too. He sighs, no point in psyching himself out like this. After all, it's just the post-attack jitters, and turns to his kitchen window, hoping to look out at the night sky and feel a little more at peace. Instead, he sees something out of a nightmare. A tall figure standing behind him, somewhere in the ballpark of human, 
but also somehow not. It's tall, fleshy, and emaciated. Its face is too smooth, with bulging eyes and a large mouth being the only features. It reaches for him with huge, spindle-fingered hands mere centimeters away from the back of his head. But the second it sees him looking at it, it turns and begins to run. The detective's mug falls and shatters on the ground. He turns with an involuntary yelp to track the creature, but it's already gone. His kitchen is empty and silent. Of course, one question haunts his mind. What the hell just happened? He's no fool. He knows the mind can play funny tricks on you. After all, who hasn't seen something out of the corner of their eye that gave them a momentary fright before realizing that it was just a trick of the imagination? But this wasn't just a flicker playing on a paranoid mind. The detective would swear on his mother's life that he truly saw this thing, some bizarre humanoid monster standing behind him in his reflection. He doesn't know which possibility scares him more, that there really was something behind him, or that he's starting to lose his mind. Either offered a number of frightening possibilities, but the detective does what he does best, applies logic to a situation. He'd spent the day around a particularly distressing crime scene, read something unnerving in the diary of one of the victims, and suffered a panic attack in the barn. All of this was just a suggestion implanted in his mind, connections being threaded where they shouldn't, a natural side effect of a brain wired to register patterns in strange data clusters. The detective does his best to remain calm for the rest of the evening. Fear is the mind killer. Panic only ever makes a situation worse. These are both things he believes, but he can't seem to shake that creeping feeling of dread. He's being watched. For the first time in his adult life, the detective decides he doesn't want to sleep in the dark. All those shapes in the blackness put him on edge. He thinks that a good night's sleep will probably have him right as rain by tomorrow morning. Everything passes eventually. As his mind drifts and his eyes begin to flutter closed, he starts to wonder if he always left that bathroom door open, or whether it started to open very slowly as soon as his head hit the pillow. Sure enough, he wakes up gasping. Long, cold fingers, abnormally long in fact and cold as death, have closed around his throat. He's gasping in vain for breath as the hand clamps tighter. His eyes jolt open and he sees it again, that tall, thin monster lingering over him, strangling him. Its face is split into a wide, sadistic, tooth-bearing grin, or something so thin it's impossibly strong. The detective can't move, he can't scream, he can't do anything. But as he slips from sleep to true wakefulness, the monster is gone. It wafts out of the room with all the ease of a gust of wind. He sits up, heart pounding, lungs strained, skin slick with sweat. He's never been so afraid in his life. He's been calmer during the active shootouts of his beat days all those years ago. The thing that was strangling him, it looked exactly the same as the monster from the reflection. They weren't just similar, it was exactly the same thing. Is he being stalked? Then it dawns on him, another fragment of information swimming in the mess of his consciousness. An article he'd read a couple years before about a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. It's when people suddenly wake up during REM sleep. Their body remains paralyzed while their consciousness activates, giving them one foot in reality while leaving the other in a nightmare. In this state, people can believe they're being attacked by monsters or demons. And one of the major factors causing sleep paralysis? Stress. The detective sighs. He feels like an idiot. There's nothing he's experienced today that doesn't have a completely logical explanation. So why does he keep jumping to such absurd conclusions? Twisting facts to suit theories rather than theories to suit facts. That being said, he still doesn't sleep another wink that night. He pours himself a few cups of coffee, subconsciously avoiding anything reflective, and sits in bed until sunrise, just watching his bedroom door. Better safe than sorry, he keeps repeating in the empty corridors of his addled brain. He drives to work the next morning like he always does. Sitting at a stoplight, a car pulls up next to him, and he catches something in the reflection of the car's window. It's that monster again, sitting next to him, reaching out towards him with one of its huge hands. The detective gasps and spins around, his eyes flaring with panic. But of course, it isn't there. Just some children on the sidewalk on their way to school. Maybe it's the fear, maybe it's the sleep deprivation, maybe it's both. But in that moment, he feels like crying. Little does he know, things are going to get so much worse. Over the following days, the frequency of the sightings increases. Anytime he finds his eyes meeting a reflective surface, that monster is there, approaching him. But of course, it runs away before he can ever look at it head on. The people at work keep giving him funny looks, he grits his teeth. He can't say anything. If he tells anyone what's been happening to him, 
They'll haul him off to the funny farm to spend the rest of his life in a padded cell. But he knows he's not crazy. It's too real to be the product of human insanity. This isn't some hallucination. That thing is really there. It's always waiting, always watching. Even when he can't see it, he can feel its eyes on him, sense its malicious intent. It's even worse at night. Every time he tries to sleep, it attacks him. He feels its hand clasping around his throat. He feels its bald fists pummeling his body. He feels its long fingernails scratching into his skin. He can't sleep anymore. He's too scared. And that too takes its toll. Every feeling, every emotion, every thought starts to take on an odd, flat quality, like nothing is quite real. He starts to subsist on coffee, energy drinks, and anything else that will give him a buzz of alertness. He started to carry his service pistol around with him everywhere. He hides it under his pillow at night. He can never be too careful. He knows that the creature is always out there, always watching, always waiting. He knows on some level that it won't stop until it has taken everything from him. He's taking the subway to work again. He's messy, disoriented. His clothes stink. His bloodshot eyes are couched in unsightly bags. He shivers slightly, a nervous twitch. Put simply, he's not the man he used to be. He can't drive anymore. His nerves are too wrecked, and he has to take the bus to and from work. That's when he sees it, not behind him this time, but on the other side of the street as he waits for his bus. It stands among the other pedestrians, all seemingly oblivious to its presence. It just smiles, mocking him. This time, the detective is ready. The detective won't have it. In a single fluid motion, he unholsters his pistol and begins firing at the creature. The street erupts into screams as people scatter to avoid the frantic volley of gunshots, but the creature doesn't move. It just keeps grinning as the detective fires, the rage and sleep deprivation throwing off his aim. He hears the sound of the bell again, its toll rising, its deafening. He needs to kill it. He needs to get closer. The detective walks toward the creature, firing bullet after bullet. The creature doesn't care. He roars in animal fury. The bell toll rises. A sudden light illuminates the creature's terrible smile, as the detective realizes that the sound he's hearing isn't the toll of the bell at all. He turns just in time to see the bus, but not in enough time to get out of the way. The cowbell the detective found in the barn that day seemed innocuous enough, but this old cowbell, corroded and covered in rust, which no known methods, chemical or mechanical, seemed to be able to remove, would soon have a name, SCP-513. It was discovered by an SCP Foundation agent during containment reestablished procedure MU at a classified containment site, where its interior was covered in duct tape to prevent it from properly making a sound. There was also a paper note attached, reading, You've seen it. Now he can hear you. You've touched it. Now he can see you. Never ring it. If you hear it, he can touch you. And this is a warning worth heeding, because ringing SCP-513 invariably results in death. The question is just how much mental and physical anguish it puts its victim through before that endpoint. When the bell is first rung, anyone within earshot will begin to experience extreme anxiety, including physical symptoms such as heightened heart rate and raised blood pressure. They will also report feelings of dread and may claim that they can feel themselves being watched. Within about an hour, this worry is confirmed. SCP-513-1 is the less than charming creature hounding the unfortunate bell ringer and will begin to stalk the affected individuals. It will appear to approach individuals from behind, but quickly disappear if ever the subject attempts direct visual contact. It will also stage non-lethal physical attacks on its victims during their sleep in order to induce greater levels of psychological terror, though it disappears quickly upon waking. The stalking threat will only elevate over time, leading to increased psychological disarray for the victim. SCP-513-1 will eventually induce paranoia, aggression, hypervigilance, and depression, ending in a distressing and violent death. Because of the immense danger posed to anyone who hears the sound of this cowbell tolling, SCP-513 has been given extensive containment precautions, extensive enough to warrant giving it the Euclid Containment Class, a classification reserved for things that are often unpredictable in containment. SCP-513 is suspended in a one cubic meter block of gelatin and contained within a soundproofed, climate-controlled cell. The gelatin is inspected daily for any degradation or loss of integrity. An emergency inspection is carried out immediately following any earthquake, explosion, or sonic event grade 2 or higher. 
Personnel performing the inspection wear earplugs and active noise-canceling earmuffs at all times while inside SCP-513's cell to avoid any kind of accidental exposure. If the gelatin cube shows any signs of degradation, such as rips, tears, splits, liquefaction, or mold, SCP-513 will be immediately removed and suspended within a replacement cube by a team of surgically deafened Class D personnel. No other personnel are to enter the cell during this procedure. Any sentient beings exposed to SCP-513 are to be monitored by at least two security personnel at all times. Under absolutely no circumstances may exposure victims be administered sedatives or allowed to fall unconscious. Any victim who does fall unconscious is to be terminated immediately. Class D personnel are to be terminated at the first sign of mental degradation. All other exposure victims may be terminated at their request. If possible, SCP-513-1 is to be apprehended on site, but sadly, the Foundation hasn't managed to get their hands on this unpleasant creature yet. But be careful ringing any mysterious old bells you find, or else he might just get his hands on you. It's not every day that the SCP Foundation opens a brand new site and appoints a new site director, but today is one of those days. Work is about to begin at Site 41, and a respected senior researcher has been appointed director of the brand new site. He hasn't been told much about it yet, but he knows a few things for certain. Some sort of new, highly volatile anomaly was discovered, a site was constructed around it, and his many years of loyalty to the organization have finally been rewarded with a promotion. As he takes his morning shower, his mind races, turning over the possibilities that this new chapter might bring. Is he up to the potential challenges? Just how dangerous is this new anomaly? What could possibly necessitate the building of a brand new site just to contain it? Whatever it is, these years of securing, containing, and protecting have prepared him. He's seen bizarre creatures, cursed places, and objects that defy the laws of physics. Whatever awaits him in his new position, he can handle it. He rinses the shampoo from his hair, letting his jitters flow down the drain with it, and switches off the water. He climbs out of the shower and turns to the foggy mirror. He sweeps a palm across the glass and meets his reflection's eyes. His serious expression catches him off guard, and he can't help but let his mind wander back to someone else who looked at him that way, with those stony gray eyes such a long time ago. He and his brother had never gotten along. Though they shared the same face, the same hair, and the same eyes, they couldn't have been more different. He was the screw-up, the one who couldn't focus in class and was always bumbling through life like a bull in a china shop. His brother was the golden boy, the star student who could do no wrong. As the boys got older, he tried to climb out of his brother's shadow and tried to live up to their parents' expectations, but anything he did, his brother could do better. He got into a great college, his brother got into Harvard. He got a job, his brother got a more impressive one. He got a Honda, his brother got a Mercedes. He fell in love with a girl, and his brother married her. It seemed like he would never stand on his own, never be anything but the lesser version of a perfect man, a nasty little homunculus who just happened to be wearing the graven image of something greater than himself. On the night of his brother's wedding, the festering resentment had finally come to the surface. He remembers the night in bits and pieces, a harsh word, a fifth drink, a broken champagne glass. His brother said something that went too far, cut too deep. Without thinking, he shoved him just a bit too hard. He watched his brother fall, watched his head hit the corner of the table, and then he was still, silent. He thought about turning himself in, but then another thought crossed his mind. Why ruin two futures at once? His brother was gone, there was no coming back from that. Should he really spend the rest of his life in prison over a tragic mistake? It didn't seem fair. Instead, he planned. For once, he was grateful for the similarities between him and his brother, their handwriting for instance. He forged a note to his brother's new bride, telling her that he couldn't take the pressures of his life anymore. He was leaving, fleeing to Europe to start a new life, with a new name, and leaving all of his old ties behind. Then he packed his brother's body, the one that looked so much like his own, into a suitcase. He drove out into the woods, to a place they had once gotten lost as children, and he buried it so deep, no one would ever find it. He'd never forget how he felt that night, laboring away in the dark forest, face an unpleasant mess of snot and tears, the end of his shovel piercing the dirt again and again, until he'd made a big enough hole to consign the case that now held his own brother's mangled body. Every shovel full of dirt that he piled back on, hiding his sin, felt heavier than the last. What had he done? What the hell had he done? But by the time the grim deed was concluded, rationalizations had smoothed out the hard edges of his crime. There were a million reasons this was okay. 
This was justified. It was an accident, of course, that much was clear. But didn't his brother also have it coming for flaunting his perfect life in his face for all these years? And who was the worthless chunk of dead meat now? The scales were balanced once more. No one would ever know what he did. No one but him, in those moments where he could see his brother in the mirror, reminding him of his greatest shame, no matter how hard he tried to forget. But that moment is long gone. He's back in the present now, grounding himself with a splash of cold water on his face. He shakes off the memories and dresses for the day. It's time to get to work. When he arrives at the facility, he's shocked by what he sees. It's a castle, grand and imposing, even if the years have not been particularly kind to it. The Foundation did not build this structure, though they've set up shop inside now. His reminiscence has made him late, and he hasn't even had a chance to look over his paperwork yet. But when you're a site director, what does it even matter if you're a little late? You're the boss, the head honcho. The party doesn't start until you walk in. Just the thought of it is enough to make his chest swell with pride. He will have to ask someone to fill him in, an eager subordinate who won't mind going over the basics of the new facility and what they are here to study. Like clockwork, a young assistant researcher scurries up to him, holding a clipboard and practically vibrating with energy. She clearly hasn't been working here long. There's still light behind her eyes. He thinks to himself, the things you see here will snuff that out soon enough, my dear. The assistant researcher leads him inside the castle, its guts ripped out and replaced with sleek modern technology. A stone staircase has been swapped out for a row of elevators, marble busts exchanged for security cameras and monitors. They enter one of the elevators and the assistant presses the button for the lowest possible floor. They are going deep into the bowels of the castle, into the belly of the great beast. With a ding, the doors open and they step out. The air down here has a peculiar smell, musty and dull, with a sharp metallic tang of dried blood. Along the wall, he can see a row of prison cells, eight of them to be precise, all shut tight. They're rusted and old, they've been here for quite some time. The Foundation didn't put these here. Of course, he realizes with a sinking feeling in his stomach that he can't quite explain, these cells themselves must be the anomaly he's here to supervise the containment of. He should have read the file before arriving, shouldn't have let himself get distracted, then he would know what he's walking into. So here we are, the assistant chirps, startling the man. He had almost forgotten she was standing next to him. Shall I give you the grand tour? She won't last long here with such a chipper attitude, he thinks, but he nods just the same. She walks ahead of him, referring dutifully to her clipboard as she goes. This is the first cell. As you can see, all of them are currently inactive. We'll be performing some tests later, though, and you'll hopefully get to see them in action. It's really something. She continues walking to the second cell. There are a lot of potential applications for this anomaly that, once we understand it, could be incredibly promising. He's only half listening as he trails behind her. As they near the third cell, the assistant glances back at him. I really look forward to working with you, sir. I've heard such great things. He opens his mouth to brush off the praise, to feign humility for her sake, when a sound startles him, the grind of metal against metal, the screech of a long disused door. The third cell is opening on its own. The assistant flips through her notes, growing pale. This isn't supposed to happen. This shouldn't be happening. She stammers, but he barely hears a word. He's staring, transfixed, at the darkness within. There's a rattling sound, like chains being dragged across a stone floor. What is about to be unleashed from this prison? He braces himself, remembering all of the near-death experiences he's faced down in the past. Nothing could prepare him for what finally appears. A pair of iron shackles, attached to lengths of chain, shoot out from the shadows, headed right for him. A shackle clamps suddenly around each of his wrists, the cold metal tight enough to cut off the circulation, digging into his skin. Then, an invisible force on the other end of the chains begins to pull. He fights it, the shackles cutting into him as the assistant screams for help, but his efforts are futile. Whatever wants to pull him closer, whatever is trying to lock him away, it's far stronger than he could ever be. The chains yank him inside the cell, and the door slides shut behind him with a crash. He thinks for just a moment that he can see his brother laughing. Then he's gone, leaving only an empty cell and a traumatized assistant behind. Sometimes the sins of the past come back to haunt you, and unfortunately for this particular man, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to SCP-567 or The Dungeon. In case the nickname wasn't clear enough, The Dungeon is not the sort of place you would ever want to be confined. SCP-567 is a series of eight cells located beneath Foundation Site 41. Each cell has a designated number from SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. 
most of the time, the cells are inactive and indistinguishable from any ordinary prison cell. However, when someone that one of the cells deems to be guilty of a specific offense enters their proximity, the anomalous properties of SCP-567 become abundantly clear. Each cell punishes a specific horrible act. SCP-567-1 targets those who have committed theft. 2. Punishes sexual violence. 3 and 4 punish various types of murder. 5 punishes adultery. 6 and 7. I'm afraid I can't quite make out what it says. Someone appears to have deliberately scratched out the text in the file. As for SCP-567-8, whatever wrongdoing it chooses to penalize is still unknown, and it is never activated in the entire time the Foundation has known of it. Every other cell is completely empty, but 567-8 contains one single, antique wooden chair in the center of the room, nailed to the floor. The purpose of this chair is unclear. When an individual who has committed one of the aforementioned acts comes within 2.5 meters of their corresponding cell door, a pair of shackles will shoot out from within the cell, seemingly materializing out of nowhere. These shackles will then lock around the individual's wrists and drag them inside, at which point the cell door will slide itself closed and locked, and the prisoner and shackles will disappear. Multiple researchers have compared this anomaly, both in its function and its methodology, to SCP-1002, or Demisers, and SCP-2701, or True Solitary Confinement, which I have discussed at length before. Since the Foundation first contained SCP-567, only two prisoners have ever reappeared after being taken. 68 hours after he was first placed inside SCP-567-3, D-903912 escaped and was found collapsed on the ground just outside Site-41. He died only moments after reappearing, before any medical intervention could take place. An autopsy showed severe injuries, including lacerations, internal bleeding, and burns on his wrists and ankles. The second subject to ever return was D-937122, who was found 157 months after being locked in SCP-567-6. In spite of her injuries, which included head trauma, missing fingers, and the same burn marks on her wrists and ankles, this subject had a great deal more energy and attempted to attack the Foundation personnel that found her. She was subdued by several guards, restrained, and interrogated by an unnamed agent. Thankfully, an audio log of the interview was included in the file, giving us a sense of what transpired. Please state your name, the agent began. D-937122 did not respond. Please state your name, they repeated. Again, no response. The agent sighed heavily and changed tactics. Look, I'm very sorry and I want to help you, but we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us, so please, please state your name for the record. At long last, the D-Class responded with an intense outburst. My name? You want to know my name? Screw my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But, but there is. I escaped. I got the medal off. None of the and here the audio was corrupted to the point where I couldn't understand what was being said. After the interference clears, D-937122 could be heard shouting, I should be free! Let me go! A struggle followed as she attempted to escape custody. The agent then replied in an attempt to calm the D-Class down, I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to... Screw your opportunity! There is no opportunity! There is only escape! You called me a monster! Maybe I am one! But the nightmares, they... She briefly broke down into unintelligible mumbling before returning to normal speech. Compared to their crimes, I've done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. At this point, the D-Class became inconsolable, all coherent speech dissolving into sobs. The agent attempted to calm her down, but she remained hysterical. After several moments of sobbing, the D-Class began to gasp as if she was having difficulty breathing. She clutched her chest and began to go into apparent cardiac arrest. The agent attempted to administer CPR, but it was unsuccessful, and after a few minutes, she was dead. An autopsy was ordered following the interview, which revealed the apparent cause of her death. Her body was covered with tiny punctures, and a toxicology report revealed an unknown poison in her bloodstream. Though only two people have ever emerged from SCP-567, they were not the only organic life forms to break out of the dungeon cells. Every so often, the doors of a cell will open, and an entity will emerge. These creatures are given the designation SCP-567-9, and they are always aggressive. They do not usually match the description of any existing animal, instead appearing to be some sort of undiscovered creature. Once an instance of SCP-567-9 has escaped its cell, it will attempt to leave the dungeon and attack anything that gets in its way. 
The first instance of SCP-567-9 observed by the Foundation was a four-limbed creature approximately two meters in length. It walked on all fours, but had human-like hands on its front limbs, complete with opposable thumbs and sophisticated enough mobility to operate machinery. It was highly intelligent and used this intellect to take out 14 Foundation operatives before it was contained. The details of SCP-567-9-2 have been stricken from any official documentation. The only thing I can surmise from the file is that nine personnel were killed after it appeared, and one of the agents that helped contain it requested and received psychological counseling for what they experienced during the process. So whatever it was he encountered, it wasn't anything good. During a round of routine testing with SCP-567-4, while the cell door was open, an instance of SCP-567-9 appeared, attacking and killing the researcher leading the tests. The entity was not contained, but after seven casualties, was lured back towards its original cell. At this point, the cell deployed its shackles, and the creature was pulled back inside. The most recent instance of SCP-567-9 emerged when the door to SCP-567-7 opened and closed spontaneously. This was spotted on the CCTV footage, but none of the security monitoring the video could see anything leaving the cell. Two weeks later, an agent assigned to the dungeon was found dead in his home, still in bed. The circumstances of his death were virtually identical to those attributed to SCP-966, a nightmarish species of creature known as the Sleep Killer, which I've discussed here on the channel before. When the escaped entity was found in Site-41, it was found to resemble an instance of SCP-966, with only a few variations. It was successfully contained, and the on-site security cameras were upgraded to prepare for future anomalies like it. Though many specifics are missing from the file, including the exact appearances of the creature that emerged from the cells, I have deduced one thing. Wherever SCP-567 is transporting those it deems guilty, it is a prison for monsters of all species. Humans are not the only ones it wishes to hold accountable for their crimes. As I was reading about the dungeon and the various tests involving it, a rather morbid question came to mind. What would happen to a test subject guilty of more than one crime? Which cell would claim them? Well, fortunately for my curiosity, and unfortunately for him, one D-Class found out. D-834200 was used as a human test subject during initial studies of SCP-567. He was placed in front of SCP-567-6 and 7. Almost instantly, the cells rattled open, and the shackles shot out to grab him. His left wrist and ankle were ensnared by cell 6, and his right were trapped by cell 7. Then, he was pulled into both cells. Well, part of him was at least. How can I best explain his fate without causing too much distress? Have you ever held a wishbone in your hand at a family dinner while your sibling or cousin held the other side, and you both pulled until it broke? It was a bit like that. SCP Foundation Site-41 has been established in the abandoned castle that contains SCP-567 in order to prevent any civilians from coming across it. The entrance to the dungeon is kept sealed at all times, and the doors to each of the cells are monitored via CCTV. If any door is opened without authorization, Task Force Delta-9, also known as HACS, will be deployed to contain the resulting instance of SCP-567-9. If, for any reason, it cannot be contained, the Task Force is permitted to terminate. In order to prevent the unnecessary loss of any personnel, all applicants to join Task Force Delta-9 must have a clean criminal record, have never committed a crime at all, even at the behest of the Foundation, have a strong dedication to the law, and show loyalty to the social contract and the feelings of others. A robust moral compass is considered a vital qualification to work near SCP-567, lest they become simply one more victim added to its long list of tortured penitents. The Foundation has encountered many anomalies over the years that could pose a danger to the organization itself. SCP-567 is no exception. Untold numbers of Foundation operatives have committed terrible acts in the service of the greater good. They have lied, stolen, and even killed in order to protect and contain the secrets locked away in files and behind heavily guarded walls. A great deal of caution should be used when dealing with the dungeon, no matter how justified a person thinks their past sins might be. After all, there's no chance to plead your innocence, and the very prison that plans to hold you is also the judge, jury, and executioner. The High Priest, adorned in the finest purple ceremonial robes, stands before the great, bull-headed statue in the darkened belly of the castle. The year is 850 CE. Masked worshippers whisper chants of holy reverence on all sides. He is in his element. Everything they do, they do in service of the great god Moloch. All around them, banners bearing the sigil of the brazen heart hang. 
It's a celebration. Just a few hours earlier, their forces had invaded an enemy church in the hills. They'd slaughtered most of the congregation in a sudden whirlwind of bloody violence, staining their swords in the great Moloch's name. But as the high priest had ordered, some of these blaspheming Christian churchgoers were taken prisoner and brought back to the castle for questioning. Here, the high priest would deal with them himself. A sadistic, tooth-bearing grin crosses his face at the very thought of it. Soon after the ceremony, the high priest descends into the dungeon, which he'd taken with a certain flourish to calling the Game Room. Here, he keeps his private collection of torture tools from around the world, each of which he takes great pleasure in using against the worms who refuse to bend the knee to his bloodthirsty god. In the Game Room, the air is suffused with a stink of blood and sweat, the prisoners who still have tongues start to scream when the high priest enters, knowing that everything is about to get so much worse for them. He's cultivated a certain reputation as a man willing to do anything to ensure the superiority of his infamous cult, the Brazen Heart. If ever you fell into his terrible clutches, escape was out of the question. The very best you could possibly hope for was a mercifully quick death. In the corner of the room, one unfortunate captive was twisted and shattered against a breaking wheel, but still torturously alive. In the corner across from him, another prisoner bleeds from the inside of a grimacing Iron Maiden that the High Priest had overseen the construction of personally. But that was only the very beginning of the High Priest's collection of terrible instruments. Prisoners teeter in agony on Judas cradles and Spanish donkeys. Skin is stretched and bones are cracked on racks. Some are pierced as they sit on the monstrous iron chair, while others simmer away in great vats of oil. Some scream as they hang from their wrists on the tenth round of strapado. Lead sprinklers, Spanish ticklers, thumb screws, crocodile shears, choke pears, melee boots, heretics' forks, bastinado sticks, scolds' bridles, scavengers' daughters, the high priest has all of them, and he's adept at using them. But they all pale in comparison to his favorite piece a prized possession, gifted from the bosom of Moloch himself, the Liar's Cradle. Such a perfectly ingenious tool for physical pain and mental terror, it's positioned at the very center of the game room, just so every other prisoner and every other device can see him using it and know that it's their eventual fate. A mighty stone furnace with huge metal grates on either side. As the high priest approaches, he can see a terrified prisoner already writhing within the machine, when the prisoner sees him, the fear only gets worse. The high priest would have no mercy for him. He'd spent ten hours on the breaking wheel before this, and that felt like a pleasant sleep in a comfy king-sized bed compared to what he was about to endure. Two of the high priest's sadistic acolytes jab at him through the grates with red-hot pokers. The high priest grins and asks the prisoner what village he hails from. When the villager surrenders the information, the high priest gives a sagely nod he asks how old the prisoner is, and the prisoner says 27. Again, the high priest nods. He asks the prisoner whether he would like to leave and be with his family again, and of course, the prisoner replies yes. He has no idea that they're all already dead. The high priest smiles and says, Just one more question then, and you'll be free to go. What is my true name? The prisoner pauses for a moment, which earns them another jab with the poker. He tells the high priest that he doesn't know. He's jabbed again, and again, and again. He begins to cry and starts apologizing. He doesn't know the high priest's true name. How could he possibly tell him, no matter how much he's tormented? The high priest says, Well, just give me your best guess. Who knows? Perhaps you'll be lucky. The game room falls silent, all eyes on the prisoner in the liar's cradle. His lip trembles, knowing from the dark legends what will happen when he answers. He breathes a ragged sigh, accepts his fate, and guesses incorrectly. Suddenly, the prisoner screams as he catches fire. The high priest watches with unrestrained glee as the prisoner burns. He does so for around a minute, the fire burning far more intensely than it possibly should have. By the time it's done, the pile of ashes that was once the prisoner falls through the grate in the bottom of the liar's cradle. The high priest turns to the rest of the room and asks, Who's next? Of all the many adjectives you could use to describe SCP-2128, also known as the Liar's Cradle, Humane certainly isn't high on the list. 
This antique stone furnace was discovered deep in the dungeons of an undisclosed castle, believed to be a former refuge of a fringe occultic group known as the Brazen Heart, a cult of worshippers of the Canaanite deity Moloch, an entity mentioned several times in the Hebrew Bible. Among the deity's most notable traits is its bull-like appearance and the fact it requests burned human sacrifices. This feels extremely relevant, given the fact that the liar's cradle is all about giving its victims a fiery end. While the thaumaturgic methods used by members of the Brazen Hand to create the liar's cradle is unknown, what is clear are the cradle's capabilities and functions. When a human being is placed within the cradle and asked questions, a single lie will lead to them being anomalously incinerated. And the device's purview for a lie is frighteningly wide. A victim will be incinerated if something they say is factually untrue, regardless of the victim's personal knowledge. In other words, ignorance as an excuse will not save you. While the Brazen Heart was wiped out hundreds of years ago by soldiers of the Spanish Inquisition, the SCP Foundation has been able to glean some background information about the Liar's Cradle from a surviving document, a sheepskin scroll known as the Ignis Manuscript. This revealed that the cradle was invented around the 9th century CE, before being walled up in 1021 CE, and during its heyday, it was used as a torture device by Brazen Hand members against their enemies. While most torture is actually incredibly ineffective at getting information, studies have shown that under states of extreme duress, victims will simply say what they believe their captors want to hear in order to make the suffering stop. The Liar's Cradle is an excellent method of wringing information out of captives. Well, aside from the fact that one lie means the captive is immediately reduced to ashes. You see, SCP-2128 works on a true or false binary operating system that seems to imply an innate awareness of all knowledge. If you have enough captives to burn and know the right deductive or inductive questions to ask, it's possible to know almost anything in enough time. It's believed the Brazen Heart used the Liar's Cradle both for practical purposes and their own twisted amusement. Victims would be placed in the device and have their feet prodded with hot pokers while they were asked a series of increasingly probing questions about their life. Being forced to divulge extremely dark and personal secrets or meet their doom on the pyre. It was a depraved combination of physical and mental torture. If even hearing about all this makes you feel a little queasy, nobody could blame you for that. The SCP Foundation, however, looked at the Liar's Cradle and saw incredible potential. As mentioned earlier, the Liar's Cradle bases its judgment on raw factual knowledge, not the knowledge of its particular victims, so anyone with enough people to burn can conceivably work their way towards discovering any binary answer. And given that the SCP Foundation has an almost unlimited number of D-Class personnel at their disposal, it didn't take long for them to realize all the knowledge that was up for grabs. They just need to make a few sacrifices along the way, hoping to save more people in the long run. Moloch himself would probably be proud. It was this somewhat morally dubious chain of thought that led to the creation of Experimental Protocol 37 Sparafusil, the Foundation's plan to utilize the Liar's Cradle to discover more information that would assist in their mission to contain anomalies and protect the human race. The protocol is outlined in a five-step procedure that is as follows. 1. One D-Class employee, referred to as the Messenger, will be laid inside SCP-2128. 2. The Messenger will repeat statements as instructed from the prepared list. 3. After each statement, if the messenger remains unharmed, the statement is to be marked as true. 4. As soon as the messenger is incinerated, a new messenger is to be provided. The statement that triggered the incineration is to be marked as false. 5. A new messenger will be assigned. Repeat as needed. While the total extent of these tests remains off the record, the official files on SCP-2128 have some fascinating supplementals about some of the results of Experimental Protocol 37 Sparafusil. The first set of tests was designated EP-37 Sparafusil-22, Keter Checkup, and was conducted on January 10, 2014. The messenger in this case was D-6238. The first statement this D-Class was fed was, the human race is in danger of extinction right now. Seeing as D-6238 didn't immediately go up in flames, this was found to be true. The second statement was, the danger comes from an item in Foundation custody. Much to the relief of the D-Class, this was also found to be true, and he lived to make another statement. This statement was, the dangerous item in question is located at a site in North America. 
This was sadly the D-Class's last words, as this statement proved to be false and he was immediately burned to death for his troubles. The next messenger brought in was a woman now known as D-6239, after she committed an armed robbery that killed several innocents and landed her on death row. Her statement was, the dangerous item in question is located at a site in Europe. This caused her to be immediately incinerated. The SCP Foundation then continued to narrow their focus on this matter over the next 13 D-Classes. With the information they gained, they were able to narrow down that SCP-752, a subspecies of humans who are eager to displace and replace non-anomalous humanity, would be the cause of a containment breach that could potentially end the human race's dominance if they weren't stopped. D-6253 was given the statement, SCP-752 will breach containment within the next month. The answer was true. Next came, SCP-752 will breach containment within the next week. Also, this proved to be true. D-6253 would finally meet their maker with a false statement, SCP-752 will breach containment tomorrow. But this opened the door for the final correct answer delivered to us by D-6254, that SCP-752 will breach containment today. <gasps> Armed with this vital information in the nick of time, the Foundation dispatched MTF New 7, also known as Hammer Down, their largest and most well-armed mobile task force, to the site in question. This quick thinking allowed them to quell the threat at the exact right time and save the world from an SK-class dominance shift scenario that would have left humanity in the dust. Using the Liar's Cradle, the SCP Foundation had just saved the world as we know it, and all it had taken was a handful of D-class lives. So naturally, the tests with the Liar's Cradle didn't stop there. Next came EP-37 Sparafusil-23, Knowledge Measure. As the name suggests, this test hoped to ascertain the extent of the knowledge the Liar's Cradle possessed, seeing as it could continue to come in handy for Foundation purposes. The first messenger was D-7784, who was fed the statement, SCP-2128 knows everything. This turned out to be false and led to the D-Class's immediate incineration. However, the lead researcher on the case decided to take a different approach. Perhaps, he thought, the Liar's Cradle didn't accept the numerical designation that the Foundation had placed on it. The next messenger, D-7785, led with the statement, The Liar's Cradle knows everything, which proved true, because that allowed him to live long enough to be incinerated by his next statement, The Liar's Cradle will tell us everything. After his incineration, D-7786 stepped up to the metaphorical plate, first saying, The Liar's Cradle will tell me everything I need to know. The Cradle judged this to be true. It did not, however, take kindly to, the Liar's Cradle will tell the Foundation everything they need to know. It declared this statement false by immediately incinerating the D-Class. After this incineration, the EP-37 Sparafusil project was out of its daily allotted D-Classes and decided to call it a night. Their next test was the mysterious and controversial EP-37 Sparafusil-24 Sunday School Song which utilized D-7891 as its messenger. She was fed the statement, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. The results of this particular test have been permanently expunged from SCP Foundation records. Next came EP-37 Sparafusil-25, Pinocchio Paradox, which was an experiment intended to see how the liar's cradle would react to logical paradoxes. Spoilers, it doesn't involve as much incineration as you might expect. First came D-8232, who provided the statement, Telling the Liar's Cradle a paradox is dangerous to Foundation personnel. This was proven to be false, and ironically, he was burned alive immediately. Next came D-8233, with the statement, The Liar's Cradle is going to kill me right now. The Liar's Cradle bent its own rules by declaring this false, but only incinerating the D-Class enough to permanently disfigure him rather than killing him. D-8234 was shoved into the cradle after that, making the statement, The Liar's Cradle is going to burn me right now. This was proven through empirical observation to be false. Ten seconds passed without incineration. However, when D-8234 exited the cradle, he complained about sustaining a small cut on one of the rocks that made the cradle while climbing out of it. This caused D-8234 to rapidly succumb to a previously undiscovered form of gangrene and pass away in minutes. Finally, D-8235 entered and said, The Liar's Cradle is going to inflict physical harm upon me right now. This was proven false, and D-8235 climbed out of the Liar's Cradle unharmed. At this point, however, he began to cry and scream out the word, Goodbye, before dying via altogether more unpleasant means that I don't wish to discuss in great detail here. 
The last experiment we have on record here is EP37 Sparafusil-26, Subjective Opinion, which intended to see if the Liar's Cradle liked to turn logical gray areas into logical charred black areas. Messenger 1, D9224, made the relatively uncontroversial statement, Golden Retrievers are cute. The Cradle seemed to disagree, immediately incinerating him. The next messenger, D9225, delivered the counterpoint, Golden Retrievers are ugly. And just like that, he was up in smoke. However, when Messenger 3, D9226, delivered the wildcard statement, Golden Retrievers are tasty, everyone in attendance was surprised to find the Liar's Cradle completely agreed with this. When D9226 delivered the completely understandable reaction, wait, what? That's freaking nasty! He was immediately reduced to ashes by the Cradle's flames. With this line of questioning concluded in the strangest manner possible, the new messenger, D9227, was brought in. Before becoming a member of D-Class personnel, his name was Stephen Kemp, a cannibalistic serial killer who'd murdered and eaten 14 women before being captured, tried, and put on death row for his crimes. He delivered the statement, I'm a good person. Surprisingly, the Cradle felt this was true and let him live. However, when Stephen decided to get cocky and chime in with, Joke's on you, jackasses! Apparently I'm Mother Teresa! He was immediately incinerated due to the fact that he was not, in fact, Mother Teresa. His ashes were soon accompanied by that of D9228, who made the statement, The liar's cradle is sometimes incorrect, before being burned to death. Next came D9229, who allowed for the longest streak of unbroken statements in the history of tests performed on the liar's cradle. He said, the liar's cradle speaks only infallible, empirical truth. True. He said, the liar's cradle is hungry. True. He said, the liar's cradle's hunger can never be satiated no matter how full it becomes. True. He said, the liar's cradle would like to incinerate me right now. True. He said, the liar's cradle is growing impatient. True. He said, the Liar's Cradle sees delicious, warm meat on its plate and would very much like to be fed. True. He said, The Liar's Cradle is angry that it is continually denied its meat. True. He said, People meat is delicious. True. He said, I am delicious. True. He said, My skin is warm. True. He said, the crackling of fire upon boiling drips of fat and rapidly cauterizing flesh gives the liar's cradle pleasure. True. After such an incredible streak, that also allowed for a frightening insight into the apparent personality of the liar's cradle, D9229 was withdrawn alive. He was replaced by D9230, who said, The earth is round, and was immediately incinerated. It's widely believed that this outcome came from the Liar's Cradle maliciously interpreting Earth as dirt rather than the planet Earth just so it could incinerate the subject. Just because the Liar's Cradle is largely objective doesn't mean it isn't incredibly petty, it would seem. Because of the static nature of SCP-2128, it has been given the rare, safe object class. Containment Site 403 has been built around the castle that currently holds SCP-2128, and a healthy supply of D-Class personnel is regularly siphoned off for EP-37 Sparafusil. The sadistic sorcerers of the Brazen Heart may be long gone, but in a strange and disturbing twist of fate, the researchers of the SCP Foundation are keeping the spirit of their work alive even today. It's a beautiful morning in Hollywood, and the agent is already chattering on his mobile phone as his limo pulls up to his office. He considers himself a power player in this town, where image is everything so he's never not talking on his mobile. It gives him an aura of importance, something that's extremely important in a career where what people think you can do is often more important than what you can really do. He exits his limo, motioning dismissively for the driver to take it around to the garage, but he never stops talking. Babe, babe, it's like I told that director, he says, barely noticing that he cuts off an arriving delivery man as he sweeps through the doors of his office building. If he wants you to be in his next movie, he's gonna have to treat you like the star that you are. Of course I said that, I've got your back, don't I? Who loves you, babe? Hold on a sec, I have to take another call. The agent lowers his sunglasses to peer at the caller ID and smiles broadly. His favorite client is calling. He switches lines quickly with an expert flick of the thumb and immediately starts talking to this new client as if he never even broke conversation. The truth is that this agent is struggling to survive in the shark-eat-shark -shark waters of Hollywood. He's losing clients left and right because he's actually not all that good at making deals. 
His fast talk is good at convincing naive young actors just arriving in town that he's the guy to know, the guy who has all the connections that can get them into the movies, but the truth is that he's little more than a huckster. He's confident that's going to change very soon. The actor that he's speaking with right now is a hot commodity in this town, and he's sure that his career is about to go through the roof. And that means big bucks for the savvy agent who snatched him up right when he stepped off the bus into town. As he opens the door to his outer office, he barely even pays any mind to his secretary, who is studiously transcribing yesterday's meeting so that the agent can review them later. But she cringes as she catches sight of the agent. They say that you can judge a man's character better by the way that he treats his employees than by the way he treats his friends. And if the agent's relationship with his secretary is any indication, this agent is not a very nice person at all. She's used to being berated for every little mistake, even when it's not her fault, to the point that she starts to sweat and shake as soon as she sees her tyrannical boss arrive. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the agent passes by her without a word, but her feelings are premature. Before the agent enters his inner office, the client whom he's speaking with drops a bombshell. What's that? says the agent, stopping dead in his tracks and the color draining from his face. You're leaving me? You're signing with a different agent? Babe, come on, you can't do this to me. I need you. I mean, I was gonna make you a star. You can't do this to me. Furious, the agent screams as he throws his phone at the wall in impotent rage. The cell phone shatters into a million pieces, broken bits of casing and bent microchips littering the carpet. He turns toward his secretary with a snarl on his face and points an accusatory finger at her. What did you tell him? Did you tell him he could get a bigger percentage with another agent? You did, didn't you? I always tell you not to talk to the clients, but you can't keep your big mouth shut. The secretary tries to stammer out a defense, but she's too nervous. Before she can say anything, the agent turns away from her, still fuming. I'm gonna take a coffee to get over this, he grouses, removing his extremely fashionable sunglasses and rubbing his forehead in frustration. When I get back, that mess better be cleaned up. Oh, and make yourself useful for once and get me a replacement phone. The secretary doesn't waste any time in grabbing a dustpan and broom from the supply closet and cleaning up the destroyed cell phone. She knows her boss is in a terrible mood, and she's worried that he's not going to be much better when he returns. And then he's probably going to just yell at her some more. She needs to move fast, because she knows the agent won't be gone long, and even though it's obviously completely ridiculous to expect that she'll be able to find and buy a new cell phone for him in the few minutes that he's gone, she's sure that he'll still take out his frustrations on her. Moments later, the agent returns, still grumbling to himself and clutching a hot coffee in his hands. He glowers at her over his sunglasses. I see you're still sweeping up, huh? God, you're so slow, and did you even get me a new phone yet? I can't be expected to do my job if my clients can't reach me. The secretary opens her mouth to respond, but before she can say a word, they're interrupted by the ringing of a telephone. Both agent and secretary turn to look at the source of the noise. There, on the edge of the secretary's desk, is an ancient, cordless telephone. It doesn't look anything like the slick, modern phones currently being sold in stores. It looks like it's a leftover from the early 2000s, so low-tech that it might as well be a rotary phone. The agent sneers. That's the best you could do. That thing is ancient. I'm not gonna use a cordless phone, I said I wanted a cell phone. What kind of joke is this? The secretary doesn't know what to say. She didn't buy that phone. She's pretty sure, in fact, that she's never even seen it before. The maintenance staff must have replaced her phone overnight and she just didn't notice it because they haven't received any phone calls today. But wait a minute. She sees that her regular black telephone is also still on her desk. In this case, maybe the new phone is intended for her boss. Well, aren't you going to answer it? Asked the agent pointedly as the telephone continues to ring. Um, yes, yes sir, says the secretary nervously. She grabs the phone and picks it up. She vaguely notes that something feels wrong as she hefts the phone in her hand. Her eyes randomly trail along the contours of the phone, noting that the seams of the phone seem to have been welded together. Huh, that's strange. But she doesn't have the time to ponder this for long, because she's got to answer the phone quickly while her boss glowers at her. She holds it to her ear as the agent watches, a grin on his face. He can't wait to hear how upset the client will be to find out that he's no longer getting the agent's personal attention. The secretary introduces herself and states the name of the talent agency. How can I help you? She asks. Her face quickly goes pale, and she starts to tremble, tears welling up in her eyes. What? Who is this? She cries. What's going on? Oh my god, are you... are you... is that... The agent quirks an eyebrow skeptically. What's going on here? Is this some kind of prank? The voice on the other end of the phone is loud. He can't make out the words, but it almost sounds like someone is shouting hysterically. He can hear other loud noises coming over the wire, crashes and shouts and a loud buzzing that almost sounds like the revving of a chainsaw. Meanwhile, what the secretary hears chills her to her core. 
The voice on the other end of the phone is shouting and panicked. It's a woman, but the secretary can barely hear her over the noises in the background. She heard the ominous clank of machinery and the crackle of fire. What is going on? They're torturing us, cries the woman on the phone, her voice cracking as she descends into frantic sobs. Please, you have to do something. You have to save us. Oh God, here they come. Help, please. The secretary doesn't know what to think, but she can tell that the fear in the woman's voice is very real. The secretary can hear screams and shouts in the background, and her mind is instantly filled with visions of the most horrendous sorts of torment. She thinks of innocent victims mowed down with machine gun fire or garroted with wire or even subjected to the most insidious of medieval torture devices like the rack or the braking wheel. She imagines a whole facility dedicated to nothing but the senseless torture of innocent victims for no conceivable purpose except, perhaps, the sick curiosity of the psychopathic torturers themselves. She shakes her head, desperately trying to clear the awful images from her mind. I'm sorry, where are you? Says the secretary, hurriedly. She blunders at the drawer on her desk, pulling it open and desperately searching for a pen and paper, hoping that the frightened woman on the other end of the phone might still have the presence of mind to tell her an address. Maybe, if she can figure out where this is happening, she can call 911 and have them send the police to investigate. From the sounds of things, they'll need to send some paramedics as well. And, as much as she hates to think about it, they'll probably need to send some hearses, too. Her fingers fall upon a pen and pull it from the drawer. She clamps the phone between her chin and shoulder and grabs a steno pad, ready to scribble down any info that she can get. Her boss is staring at her, an amused smirk across his face. He clearly thinks that this silly secretary is just overreacting to nothing. But he can't hear the woman's voice. He can't know the depth of her terror. Please tell me where you are, begs the secretary. Her fingers are trembling so hard that the pen leaves a squiggly line on the paper. But the voice on the other end of the phone is barely coherent now, all her words degenerating into a long, drawn-out scream of absolute gargling terror. Okay, that's enough of that, says the agent, crossing his arms across his chin and regarding his shaking secretary with deep and obvious skepticism. You think this impresses me? I've seen better acting in an elementary school play. Of course, he would immediately think this. This is Hollywood, after all. And everyone has Hollywood dreams of someday being in a movie. Every waiter and bus driver by day is a frustrated actor by night. So, even though his secretary has never before expressed any interest in becoming a movie star, he of course suspects that this is an elaborate setup to convince him of her acting talents. She turns to look at him, and one look at her pale face is enough to convince him that she's not acting at all. Her face is ghostly white, and she's shaking like a leaf. She looks like she might simply faint right here from fright. Now the agent's smug annoyance turns to anger. Maybe his secretary isn't trying to fool him, but someone on the phone sure is. It must be some kind of prank call, and his secretary is simply the one person in Hollywood dumb enough to fall for it. There's someone in trouble, cries the secretary, dropping the phone from her ear. She says that they're being tortured. We need to get them help. The agent rolls his eyes. Of course it would be a prank call. He can't believe that his stupid secretary is actually taking this seriously. Kid, you have a lot to learn about Hollywood. He snaps his fingers in her face. It's clearly just some random loon trying to trick you. Hand over the phone, doll. I'll handle this. It's not fake babbles the secretary in a daze. I'm sure of it. It's real. She hesitates, afraid to hand off the phone for reasons that not even she can articulate. The agent uh. grunts in annoyance, snatching the phone from her hands. Nothing's real here, kid. It's all just smoke and mirrors. Maybe if you weren't so stupid, you'd already have figured that out. The secretary turns away, devastated by the insult, and buries her face in her hands. The agent, meanwhile, holds the phone to his ear. Listen, punk, I don't know who you think you are, but I'm a big deal and... His words suddenly cut off, and the secretary turns as she hears the cardboard coffee cup explode against the floor. The agent is nowhere to be seen. It's like he suddenly vanished in an instant. She blinks in surprise and confusion. It happens so suddenly that there's no way the agent stepped outside without her knowing. The dropped coffee cup on the floor serves as chilling proof that something extraordinary must have happened to him. The other thing left behind, sitting in an ever-expanding puddle of spilled coffee, is the mysterious telephone. She stares at it in disbelief, wondering how this strange phone can be responsible for this crazy situation. And then, even as she stares trying to make sense of what just happened, the phone immediately begins to ring anew. Answering a ringing telephone is an almost instinctive response for most of us. But if anything, this situation shows why sometimes it might be a good idea to resist that urge. After all, you never know who might be on the other end. 
And while usually the worst consequence of answering an unknown caller is that you'll be subjected to a lengthy and boring pitch for life insurance or solicitations for political donations, this story shows that there are some things much worse than a spam caller. Instead, you might be receiving a call from SCP-145. For all intents and purposes, SCP-145 appears to be a standard 2002 model cordless telephone handset of Alcatel brand on its standard issue charging base. The charging base has been defaced, the jack inputs are sealed with resin glue, and the power input to the device has been torn out with a sharp tool. All labels and stickers have been torn off the phone, so its serial number and production date are unknown. None of this would make SCP-145 particularly notable. What makes SCP-145 unusual is that the phone rings constantly, defying all attempts to silence it. Neither removing the phone's battery nor disassembling the base has had any effect on stopping SCP-145's incessant ringing. The only thing that can stop the ringing is to answer the phone. But as Foundation agents soon learned, answering the phone is literally the last thing you want to do when SCP-145 is around. Agents assigned to interacting with SCP-145 must always do so in pairs for very important safety reasons. Because if a person answers SCP-145 without being observed by another live human being, the person answering the phone will instantly vanish. It is currently unknown how SCP-145 causes its victims to vanish. Video recordings of vanishings do not provide any clarity, only showing that the victim is there in one frame and gone in the next. If a person answers the phone while being observed by another person, however, they will not vanish and can actually have a conversation of sorts with whoever is calling. The person on the other end of the phone varies from call to call, but is always one of several different female voices. This voice will beg for help in a panicked tone as the sounds of violence and torture play out in the background. The methods of torture, judging from words of the caller and the sounds in the background, have included branding, electrocution, laceration, and many other gruesome acts of violence. It's currently unknown where the voice is calling from or who is responsible for the horrible tortures happening at that site, but conversations with the phone voice give a grisly clue as to the fate of the people who vanish after answering SCP-145 while unsupervised. It appears that those vanished individuals are transported to the site from which the phone calls originate and added to the roster of victims undergoing torture at the hands of the unknown tormentors. The callers appear to be non-automated and entirely sentient. Attempts to trace the call or track down the location of the tortured callers have proven unsuccessful thus far. Attempts to block the signal of the phone with the use of a Faraday cage have also been unsuccessful. Since SCP-145 is pretty much just a telephone, it has been given the object class Euclid. Since the location of SCP-145's victims is currently unknown, the only way to travel to it is to join the roster of victims by using SCP-145. Currently, the Foundation conducts research into SCP-145 by using teams of three, one Class D staff, one Class 2 145 audio technician, and one Class 3 security staff. Only Class D staff are permitted to actually listen to SCP-145 as, without fail, unsupervised exposure to SCP-145's transmissions will cause the listener to vanish and join a growing list of SCP-145's torture victims. Listening to the pleas of SCP-145's victims is a harrowing experience for even the most jaded researchers, such that the Foundation has been moved to try several rescue attempts, even when these might not have been the best advised plans. As of yet, none of these attempts have been successful. In one instance, the Class D personnel tasked with answering SCP-145 was issued a GPS locator device in hopes that it might give Foundation agents a clue about where the victims were being held. The GPS device was rendered inactive upon the victim's disappearance. On another occasion, a researcher equipped the Class D listener with both a GPS device and a military combat knife. Once again, the GPS device was rendered inactive and subsequent calls by SCP-145 seemed to indicate that the missing Class D staff attempted and failed to use the knife in defense. A third rescue attempt involved equipping the Class D staff with both a Kevlar vest and a 9mm semi-automatic pistol. Subsequent listens to SCP-145 revealed the sound of gunshots, followed by exclamations of pain from the vanished Class D staff person, indicating that perhaps the unknown tormentors had managed to disarm the Class D staff person and use his own weapon against him. In one final rescue attempt, researchers thought that possibly explosives could be used both to attack the mysterious tormentors and to reveal the location of the torture site. If nothing else, a massive mysterious explosion might appear on seismographic instruments or even local news reports. 
Researchers equipped a Class D staff person with one kilogram of C4 explosive concealed in a supply kit, with the explosive attached to a remote trigger with a 30-second delay, triggered before interaction with SCP-145. The results of this experiment are currently classified but involved multiple personnel going missing, so suffice to say, it wasn't the rousing success that the Foundation staff had been hoping for. Following this incident, all further tests on SCP-145 have been suspended. What is SCP-145, and why was it created? What cruel yet ingenious mind could devise something so cunning, only to be used for the senseless torment of random people? Foundation researchers still don't know the answer, only that SCP-145 might serve as yet more evidence for the boundless depths of human cruelty, if in fact, it was even created by humans. A truck pulls up in front of a quiet suburban home. The faded sign on the truck's flank reads, Exterminator. It's not the most glamorous job, but hey, someone's gotta do it. In all his years of extermination work, this exterminator has seen it all. Ants, termites, rats, but he's never taken a job that he couldn't handle. As he looks out at this sprawling suburban home, he can't help but notice the nicely manicured lawn and the beautifully sculpted topiaries. The trash cans are neatly stacked on the curb, ready for pickup. It doesn't look like the sort of home that would have a vermin problem. But then again, this exterminator knows better than anyone that looks can be deceiving. People often think that only run-down slums will attract vermin, but he knows that even the cleanest kitchens can still have a problem with unwelcome invaders. He jumps from his truck and walks up to the front door, carrying his equipment on his back and a clipboard in his hands. He quickly reviews the specifics of this job from the paper on his clipboard. A woman called his company complaining about a major cockroach infestation, demanding that they send someone right away. He remembers that she sounded downright frantic on the phone, much more agitated than you would expect from a little cockroach problem. Then again, he thinks, some people just really don't like bugs. He rings the doorbell and waits. A crabby-looking old woman answers the door. It's about time that you got here, she snaps. There's a huge cockroach infestation in the basement, hundreds of them. I want you to go down there and do something about it. Absolutely, ma'am, says the exterminator politely. Part of his job is assuaging frantic customers. He's used to this sort of thing. So many homeowners are absolutely terrified of insects that they fall to pieces at the sight of a spider or a cockroach. He's accustomed to dealing with all manner of creepy crawlies, so he's not at all worried. He's sure this will be an easy job. You're in good hands with us. We'll kill those roaches dead, he says, recalling the company slogan that he's required to repeat. They're in the basement, says the old woman. I've tried to kill them, but there's too many of them, and they're too fast. I'm way too old to be running after a bunch of bugs. It tires these old bones out. I was down there with a the spray can myself, but I just keep getting too tired to keep it up. It's almost like those bugs were making me sleepy. Of course, ma'am. The exterminator can barely keep from rolling his eyes as this old woman continues to rattle off complaints about the cockroaches in her basement. Of course, there's an easy explanation for all of this. This woman is very old, so she wouldn't be able to run around much without tiring herself out. That's much more plausible than believing that the cockroaches were somehow magically draining her energy. But again, he's used to listening to all sorts of crazy stories from frightened clients, so he doesn't give it much thought. Then I'll take a look and see what kind of problem you have. The exterminator opens the door to the basement and peers down into the darkness. He gropes blindly for the light switch, and eventually his fingers connect. He flips the switch, and a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling flickers on. The stairs leading down into the depths of the basement are warped and rickety. He makes a mental note to watch his step as he descends. The boards ominously creak under his feet. The basement is filled with junk, all the accumulated debris of the owner's whole life. He sees piles of cardboard boxes overflowing with old books and raggedy clothes. Paint cans are stacked in the corner in defiance of any pretensions to fire safety. The boiler rattles and wheezes. It sounds like it might need to be replaced fairly soon. The air smells damp and musty, and he wonders if the old woman has ever cleaned this basement. Looking at this mess, it's no wonder that she would have a problem with cockroaches. The exterminator can't help but think about how messy and decrepit this cellar looks compared to the immaculate facade of the house outside. The exterminator pulls out his flashlight and flicks it on. He aims it into the corners, hoping to see some evidence of this insect invasion. He sees nothing. The old woman described a basement infested with hordes of insects, yet he doesn't see a single one. He stifles a yawn. Why does he feel so sleepy? This job must be more draining than he thought, because he's already feeling spent. Could it be that the old woman was right? Is there something in the basement that is making him sleepy? Could it be something about those cockroaches that she blames? No, that's just ridiculous. He knows enough about cockroaches to know that can't be the case, and he's not about to start believing fantasies now. He's a rational guy. He knows that you can't lose your head and expect to do well in this line of work. 
Besides, he reminds himself, he still hasn't actually seen any evidence of a cockroach problem at all. He continues to poke around the basement and still finds nothing. He frowns. This is really concerning. First of all, he doesn't relish the idea of explaining to the old woman upstairs that she doesn't actually have a cockroach problem at all. She's probably not going to take kindly to him telling her that she is delusional. But also, he was hoping that this would be a big job. If he can't find any bugs, he won't be able to justify charging the old woman for this visit. What a waste of his time. Suddenly, he catches movement out of the corner of his eye. He spins around, aiming his flashlight into the corner, just quick enough to see something scuttle through a crack in the wall. Did he imagine that? No, he tells himself. He definitely saw something. Great. He approaches the corner, his spirit suddenly buoyed again. He's happy that he'll actually have something to report to his upstairs client. Maybe he'll find a whole nest in that crack. That would be great. He could justify recommending a full house fumigation then, and that would bring some much needed cash into the business. He narrows his eyes and peers closer. Even with his flashlight being trained on the crack, it's so dark in the basement that it's hard to see. He can see the wooden boards of the house's superstructure through the flaking paint on the wall and, if he squints just right, he thinks he can just see something squirming right there between the boards. Whatever it is, it stops moving when his flashlight beam washes over it. That's very unusual. He knows from experience that when you turn over a rock, bugs will always race for cover. They aren't smart enough to play dead, yet that's exactly what it looks like this insect is doing. He rubs his eyes with his free hand, trying to blink away his sudden sleepiness. He's feeling even drowsier than before, but he really needs to finish this job. He moves in closer, and the cockroach decides to make a break for it. The insect skitters away, desperately trying to worm its little gray body between the boards to escape. The exterminator moves fast. He pulls a pair of tweezers from his pocket and pinches them closed on the squirming insect's abdomen before it can wriggle away. He holds it up close to his nose so that he can get a better look at his prey. The exterminator laughs. He's seen every kind of insect in his time, and he can recognize a cockroach when he sees it. This is no cockroach. He can tell from a glance that he's looking at a perfectly harmless cricket. Like so many people, that old woman must have just panicked at the sight of a bug and assumed it was a cockroach. That's good. Most people don't mind having crickets in their home, so this old lady will probably be happy to hear the news. Then again, is it a cricket? When he looks closer, he sees that it's got some unusual features. There are strange barbed hooks visible on the underside of its abdomen, sharp enough that even an experienced exterminator like him thinks better of holding this thing too close to his face. Are those stingers? Could this bug be poisonous? And even stranger, if he looks closer, he thinks he might even see metal wires protruding from its exoskeleton. The exterminator yawns again, rubbing his eyes. He suddenly feels so sleepy. What's wrong with him? Did he not get enough sleep last night? I should have had a second cup of coffee this morning, he tells himself. Why can't I keep focused? His words trail off as, all at once, sleep overtakes him. He collapses to the floor with a thud, dropping his tweezers. The cricket bounces free as the tweezers fall from his hands. The cricket drops to the floor and quickly rights itself. Instead of running, though, the tiny insect turns around. It skitters toward the prone form of the exterminator, making a straight line for his head as if it were moving with intelligent purpose. This doesn't look like the frantic, stimulus response movements of an insect. The insect crawls over the slumbering man's face, hoisting itself over his chin, then lips, and then right up to his left nostril. With one sudden movement, the cricket slithers up his nose and disappears. The exterminator snorts and mumbles in his sleep, but the sensations of an insect wriggling up his nose does nothing to rouse him from his sleep. After a few minutes, the exterminator blinks his eyes open. He sits up with a groan and rubs his head. What the hell just happened? Did he pass out? How embarrassing. He looks around, finding his tweezers and his flashlight on the ground next to him. But no matter where he looks, he can't see the insect anymore. Where did it go? He returns to the crack in the wall for a second look, but sees nothing. Absently, the exterminator rubs his nose. He feels a vague discomfort in his sinuses, and he wonders if maybe his allergies are acting up. But otherwise, he remembers nothing about his bizarre experience. He probes his fingers into the crack and wiggles them around, hoping to find some evidence of the missing insect. There's nothing there. Well, at least he knows what he's dealing with, and it's definitely no cockroach. Eventually, he shrugs his shoulders helplessly and returns upstairs. Did you find the cockroaches? Asks the old woman when he returns to the top of the stairs. I know there are roaches down there. He shakes his head. Ma'am, I searched the whole basement and I didn't find any cockroaches. He explains to her that all he could find in the basement was a harmless cricket. The old woman starts to argue with him, insisting that what she saw in her basement was no cricket, but the exterminator has already made up his mind. This is annoying. He thought that she would be happy to hear that she doesn't have roaches, but now she just wants to make a fuss. 
He's not going to waste any more time on this nonsense, not when he has real work to do. He shakes his head as he repacks his equipment and prepares to leave. The exterminator returns to his truck and turns the ignition. As he pulls away, his mind is already mulling his next job. He doesn't give another thought to this crabby old woman and her paranoia about cockroaches. He doesn't stop to wonder what became of that strange cricket that he found. It probably just crawled back into the wall, he thinks. He certainly would have no reason to think that the cricket is still with him, a new and permanent hitchhiker inside his head. The exterminator had just acquired a new lifelong friend, a lifelong friend that we call SCP-2119. SCP-2119 is a biomechanical creature that resembles a small gray insect, ranging from 5 to 15 millimeters in length, with a segmented body, six-jointed legs, and protrusions from the head and abdomen that resemble antennae and ovipostors respectively. However, SCP-2119 does not appear to reproduce by any means known to man, so these ovipostors are likely simply a form of mimicry, something added to give SCP-2119 the appearance of a common insect to make it less conspicuous to humans. Genetic testing has determined that the organic parts of SCP-2119 are largely identical to those of Gryllus rubens, otherwise known as the southwestern field cricket. One notable difference between SCP-2119 and the field cricket, though, is that SCP-2119, also known as the transmitting parasite, has six barbed hooks on the underside of its body. Strangely, SCP-2119 also contains mechanical parts, including silicon parts that do not match any known make and platinum wiring leading Foundation researchers to assume that SCP-2119 is an artificial life form. At this moment, who made SCP-2119 and why remains a mystery. In many ways, SCP-2119 not only looks like a normal insect, but also acts like one. It apparently possesses extremely rudimentary self-awareness and intelligence comparable to that of its insect brethren, being able to sense potential hosts or detect danger. It displays many normal self-preservation instincts common to insect life. If discovered by a conscious human, it will flee or hide, but it does possess one self-defense measure that no normal insect does. Any human who comes into the proximity of SCP-2119 will start to feel drowsy, eventually succumbing to unconsciousness within 3 to 8 minutes. Once a human subject is unconscious, SCP-2119 will enter their head, either through the nostrils or the ear canal, and eventually make its way to the subject's brain, where it will use its barbed hooks to attach itself to the corpus callosum which are the nerve fibers that permit communication between the left and right side of the brain. The human subject will gradually wake up with no memory of the event. After waking, the subject will return to their normal routine and continue living just as if they were unaffected. It does not appear that infection with the transmitting parasite causes any physical, mental, or psychological damage to hosts or impairs their daily lives in any way. All attempts to physically remove SCP-2119 from a host's brain have so far resulted in the death of the host as SCP-2119 appears to have some way of halting a host's brain activity when it's threatened. Once a host is dead, SCP-2119 will exit the host's head, again either via the nostrils or ear canal, when it determines that no other humans are in the area. Once SCP-2119 has taken up residence in a host's brain, it will start broadcasting a 514.1875 MHz radio signal with a range of approximately 3 kilometers, consisting of a tone lasting 0.05 seconds at 2 second intervals, possibly with the intent of locating other infected human hosts. Once a connection has been established, specimens will transmit a continuous stream of tones of variable lengths between instances, ranging from 70 Hz to 1305 Hz, with wavelengths ranging from 480 cm to 25 cm. Foundation personnel have so far been unable to discern any pattern in the signal, so it is unknown if it is a form of communication or simply random. Most insidious of all, SCP-2119 seems able to spontaneously manifest inside human brains without entering through the ear or nose. Humans coming into the proximity of an infected host have a 14% chance of spontaneously manifesting an instance of SCP-2119 in their own brains. Since SCP-2119 has no visible means of reproduction, exactly how it does this continues to baffle Foundation scientists. SCP-2119 specimens are stored individually in hermetically sealed tanks composed of RF-shielded glass and only removed for testing. Tests are to be conducted in hermetically sealed chambers composed of steel-reinforced concrete walls to block SCP-2119's radio transmissions. All personnel handling specimens of SCP-2119 are required to wear level 3 hazardous material suits to protect them from infection. 
SCP-2119 was recently updated from the Euclid to Keter designation after a peculiar incident where all known hosts suddenly ceased all movement, respiration, and brain activity, effectively dying. After 7 minutes and 12 seconds, the subjects revived with no ill effects from their apparent deaths and no memory of the incident. During the 7 minute interval though, the transmitting parasites ceased broadcasting their usual static noises and instead broadcast what appears to have been a casual workplace conversation between two technicians working for whatever entity manufactures SCP-2119. All subjects infected with SCP-2119 began to emit a strange scraping noise from their throats, which agents later determined was the sound of a chair being dragged across concrete. After this, subjects broadcast a conversation between two technicians who appeared to be oblivious to the fact that their words were being transmitted. During this conversation, the two technicians complained about a person named Reich, whom the Foundation assumes might be their supervisor, and afterwards, one of the two was heard asking for and then drinking a can of Coca-Cola. The broadcast abruptly ended when one of the two technicians suddenly noticed that they were live and cut the feed. The name Reich is so far the Foundation's only clue as to who or what is manufacturing SCP-2119, but so far all investigations into determining Reich's identity have been unsuccessful. It is currently impossible to estimate how many people in the general population are infected with SCP-2119, but considering how contagious the parasite is, it is thought to be extremely widespread. Without any known means of deactivating SCP-2119 without killing its host, containment of SCP-2119 is impossible. Who knows, you might already be infected yourself, it's not as if you would notice. The old house has been abandoned for going on two decades. And as with any place that's been left uninhabited for this long, rumors tend to spiral. Of course, there are the more mundane explanations for why the two-story, four-bedroom home on the end of a nice street lays in semi-ruin. Black mold, asbestos, rising house prices… But those weren't the stories that most people told. Everyone in the neighborhood knew what really happened. All those years ago, the family that lived there had been murdered, and their killer was never caught. The three young paranormal investigators, with EMF readers in their hands and GoPro cameras mounted on their hard hats, know all about this. They approach the house in the dead of night, mumbling commentary for the recordings. If the old house really is as haunted as everyone says it is, then they could be in for something really good here. Their subscribers always loved brand new paranormal content. They use a crowbar to breach the front door and head inside. It's everything you can expect from a house that had been abandoned for 17 years. Dust, cobwebs, and graffiti abound, broken bottles scattered across the floor. Someone has scrawled, Welcome to Hell, above the door in faded sharpie. It all plays perfectly for the cameras. Paranormal content gold. All of them turn on their flashlights, generously provided to them by one of their sponsors, of course. But in this particular situation, they have no idea just how valuable their product really is. After all, there are some frightening things that hide in the dark. The leader of the trio begins ascending the stairs, narrating into his helmet cam, giving the more popular version of the house's legend. The perfect suburban family, torn apart, literally, by a killer hiding in their home. The family had all been brutally murdered by someone in their home, but the police never found any sign of unlawful entrance or exit. There were no clues to the killer's presence whatsoever, in fact. It was as if they were a ghost, a vapor. It was almost as though whoever killed the family had always been in that house, and even after the murders were committed, they never left the place either. As he tells the story, the lead investigator starts to feel a little nervous. Even though he himself doesn't really believe in the supernatural, he just plays up reactions for the views, he still can't help but wonder, should I really be here? Am I making a terrible mistake? Is there a chance that whatever did this all those years ago could still be in the house, waiting for me? But he pushes those thoughts from his mind. This gig is too valuable for him to wimp out now, and really, what are the chances that something actually dangerous would be lurking in the house? The other two investigators are still looking around downstairs, sticking together, their flashlight beams slicing through the darkness. Their boss always insists on going upstairs first. He demands the glory shot, after all. That leaves the rest of them searching the downstairs living room, dining room, and kitchen, where the best they can hope for is maybe a particularly haunted looking dishwasher. It's why the younger of the two is so surprised huh? when they suddenly feel something happening to their body that they've never experienced before. In an instant, their whole body convulses with an involuntary shudder, 
they feel the temperature drop, and the world gets just that little bit darker. The best way they can describe the feeling is impending doom. Like any moment now, something terrible is going to happen. But almost as soon as the feeling begins, it's gone. Intensity dropping, the dread starting to dissipate, as though whoever or whatever caused this feeling literally passed right through them. Their fellow investigator asks them if they're okay. Of course, they nod and force a smile. They're fine. It's just a spooky place is all. Atmosphere like this would get to anyone. Meanwhile, the lead investigator is exactly where he wants to be, ascending a rickety stepladder up into the attic, the very same attic where, all those years ago, the police had found what was left of the family. And from everything he'd read on the subject, their remains weren't a pretty sight, even by true crime enthusiast standards. He enters the attic and shines his flashlight around, capturing all the dusty old boxes left to rot in the cold. He's engrossed in the macabre spectacle of what had once been the worst and final moments of a group of strangers' very real lives. The attic is full of spider webs and shadows. They're so ubiquitous that as the lead investigator pauses to tell his camera the next chapter of the grisly tale, he doesn't even notice one of the shadows peeling off of the wall behind him. It wafts silently towards him, like a gust of midnight air. Little by little, the blob of shadow starts to take on a vaguely human shape. It leans forward in the investigator's direction, arms extended like a classic movie monster. Long, dark claws slide out of its shadowy hands. Downstairs, the other two investigators hear the most terrible scream. For a moment, the more fantastical thought crosses their minds. Could this be one of the tormented souls of the departed family, longing to be heard after years of silence? Then it occurs to them that they recognize the scream. It belongs to their boss. The two of them charge up the stairs, flashlights in hand, as the screaming starts to become more desperate than pain, like that of a wounded animal with its leg caught in a trap. Those terrible wails are echoing down from the open hatch leading into the attic. It's so dark up there, something must have broken his flashlight. That's when they notice something else. Red, dripping from the open hatch. For a moment, they hesitate, wondering what could be going on up there. Could they really help, or would they just be running into the danger themselves? But soon, their desire to save their boss's life overpowers their fear. They grab the ladder and start climbing, feeling the dripping blood on the worn wooden rungs. When they finally get up into the attic, it feels like the scream is coming from everywhere, bouncing off the walls in a terrible, echoing cacophony of pain. They turn in all directions, hovering their flashlight beams around the room in wide, sweeping arcs, until both fall on the source of all this terror. And when they see it, they can't help but scream too. The lead investigator's body is floating about a foot off the ground, his screams now fading into pained gurgles. Something huge and dark is lifting him up with one hand and sinking the long, dark claws of its other into his neck. The second the twin flashlight beams concentrate on the creature, it drops the lead investigator's bleeding body down onto the ground. His skin slate gray, his feeble twitching slowing to a halt as the last of his life drains from him. Two glowing red pinpricks open up in the face of the dark figure, eyes like terrible, burning coals etching themselves into their memory. Like smoke, it continues to glide backwards further, seeking refuge in the dark, a safe haven amongst the other shadows. By this point, the two surviving investigators know there's nothing they can do for their boss anymore. All that's left is to get out and survive. They have to save themselves. They turn, wasting no time running towards the exit. They don't notice it, but the second they turn the beams of their flashlights away, the shadow's terrible eyes disappear and it starts advancing towards them again, its claws outstretched and grasping for them with awful fury. The shadow creature grabs at their heads as they make their final leap for the exit. However, all the monster can pull away are their helmets and helmet cams as they scramble down the ladder and then down the stairs, running at speeds they didn't even think possible as the shadow slithers down behind them. It doesn't give up. It wants their lives. It wants their warm human blood on its claws. They clear the threshold of the accursed house and keep running to their car. One looks over their shoulder and sees the shadow leave the house, gaining on them, both claws outstretched and ready to rend their flesh. The two climb into their car. They see the shadow coming towards their window. It's moving so quickly, only a few feet away now. It's getting closer and closer and closer. Ignition. The car starts up and the driver smashes the pedal down. They take off, quickly accelerating up to illegal speeds as the shadow continues to chase, slowly getting smaller and smaller in the rearview mirror. A distant nightmare. A terrible, dark ghost. As it finally disappears, they feel a moment of safety. But really, only a moment. 
because it occurs to them then that they cannot say, with any confidence, that this monster won't just be waiting for them when they get home. SCP-280, also known as Eyes in the Dark, is one of the more frightening and dangerous anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation. Of course, it likely won't be causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario anytime soon, but if you happen to run into this nocturnal monster, it's likely to cause an end-of-you scenario and remove you from the world with extreme prejudice. There's no way of telling just how many lives it claimed before the SCP Foundation finally got it into containment, and perhaps it's best to just not think about that. SCP-280 is a black, wraith-like apparition that floats at roughly average human height, with no visible legs or feet, as the lower portion of its body simply fades away before it reaches the ground. In its dormant state, the entity may appear to be little more than a shadow, easily dismissed, especially in dark environments. This comes as a natural result of the being's frightening ability to become intangible at will, and only become physical when it enters a state of active aggression toward a human target. In this intangible state, victims have even been known to walk through the shadowy mass by accident. While this doesn't lead to any detrimental physical effects, victims report that being inside the creature can lead to heightened states of anxiety, fear, and dread. Despite its body being wholly composed of an unidentifiable black matter, when exposed to light, the creature does begin to express a pair of glowing dots on its head similar to eyes, hence its frightening nickname. However, all tests indicate that these eyes aren't actually functional. Instead, they appear to be a kind of defensive measure, like false eyes on the carapace of an insect. These eyes are never shown when SCP-280 is advancing towards a victim, only when it is in retreat, though this is only one of the entity's several defensive responses. If an area where the creature is residing becomes fully illuminated, or a sudden flash of extremely bright light is directed against it, then it will immediately dematerialize and appear in a different area. The one positive thing that can be said about the hunting patterns of SCP-280 is that they're relatively predictable. The entity, it seems, only has an interest in human beings. When it selects a target, it will pursue them relentlessly, approaching in its intangible form with its arms extended in what many describe as a sleepwalker pose. In this state, you may finally notice 280's claws, long, thin, and razor sharp. It may silently approach while the victim is turned the other way, or while they sleep soundly in bed, or even when they're paralyzed in fear at the very sight of it. When SCP-280 closes the distance, it will begin to rip and tear at its victims with its claws, causing massive physical trauma and, in some cases, death. Attacks range from one to five minutes of being relentlessly clawed at by the beast. When the attack is over, it will simply expose its eyes, become intangible once more, and escape you will not be able to overpower the creature. Foundation tests have shown that it has extreme physical strength, and it's capable of tearing apart solid steel with little effort. If it can't find any humans to victimize, then it will simply remain dormant, pressing itself up against a wall, in a dark corner, or within some other structure. Which is why, if ever you feel nervous about a certain dark corner in a room near you, it is best to remove yourself from the situation as quickly as possible and remain in a brightly lit area. It would perhaps be comforting to believe that SCP-280 is acting on some twisted form of animal instinct. After all, while the results may seem horrific to us, every organism has to eat, right? Well, sadly, that isn't the case here. SCP-280 does not appear to eat, sleep, or breathe to survive, and it never consumes any of the matter torn from its victims. The best working theory is that the entity simply enjoys the harm it causes, taking a degree of perverse pleasure in hunting down and murdering its targets. There is no better nature to appeal to here. The SCP Foundation's ability to study the creature's biology has also been stunted, in part due to the creature's highly aggressive nature, and also the fact that its selective intangibility makes gaining physical samples almost impossible. Even capturing and containing the creature in the first place came partially out of blind luck. It first came to Foundation attention after a series of mysterious locked door murders in a small Mississippi township. In the most recent case, an entire family had been brutally murdered in their home, leaving only one survivor. A traumatized nine-year-old boy named David, who'd locked himself in the basement when he started to hear the screaming. He was so terrified by the things he saw that night that he remained in a catatonic state for weeks afterwards, completely unresponsive to outside stimulus. But one little detail saved his life. A flashlight was clasped in his white knuckle grip, shining a bright beam of cold, white light onwards. When David was removed and placed into medical care, officers began searching the building for any kind of clues as to how the other four family members were murdered. 
However, during this investigation, the police were just as vulnerable as the victims who'd been so recently slain. While one officer was wandering around the attic, looking for any evidence they may have missed, SCP-280 emerged from the darkness and attacked, tearing into his body with its long, deadly claws. Luckily for the officer in question, he survived the incident, though he was badly wounded. His report on the matter, including the ardent claim that he was attacked by a being, quote, made from black smoke, caught the attention of SCP Foundation operatives embedded in the precinct. They soon took over the investigation and descended on the house, hoping to tag and bag whatever had been behind all these deaths. This would be easier said than done. While Foundation field agents canvassed the home, they simply walked past the creature multiple times, discounting it as a mere shadow. After all, it only had these easily identifiable glowing eyes when it was in a retreating position. Even when it entered its physical state, operatives brushing up against it generally dismissed the sensation as hair, clothing, or some other object touching them in the dark. This already bungled investigation got even worse when the Foundation decided to introduce high-intensity lights into the equation, hopefully flushing the creature out. This, of course, only caused it to dematerialize and appear elsewhere. The chase ended in an almost farcical fashion a cavalcade of Foundation agents chasing a cloud of sneering black smoke across a Mississippi field at 2.30 a.m. Thankfully for the human race, the entity was, at the very least, eventually secured and contained. However, this wouldn't be the last time it was out of containment. During a series of tests with different types of illumination, intending to test SCP-280's reflexes, it disappeared from its chamber. It seemed almost to sink through the different levels of the illuminated site, before coming to rest at the containment chamber holding SCP-1591. This made for a fascinating accidental cross-test. You see, SCP-1591, to put it simply, is a unique sculpture of a star that emits an incredibly bright light, and this light will slowly make any being subject to its glow intangible, before disappearing completely. When SCP-280 came before SCP-1591, it displayed its eyes, but did not retreat. In fact, it assumed a kneeling position, and simply remained before the anomalous sculpture until it faded from existence. It then re-manifested in its own containment chamber several hours later without incident. All things considered, it went pretty well, as far as containment breaches involving deadly, human-hating monsters go. Because of its ability to demanifest and phase through solid objects, SCP-280 is incredibly difficult to contain, earning it the dreaded Keter object class. In order to avoid the risk of demanifestation, SCP-280 is contained in a 5 by 5 meter cell that is perpetually left in a state of total darkness. No equipment is to be left in the cell unsupervised at any time, and any items brought into the cell for testing must be removed when the testing is complete. Any staff members entering the chamber for tests must be equipped with infrared goggles, an infrared ID strobe, and also a strong flashlight to ward the creature off in the case that it becomes aggressive. If SCP-280 does attempt to attack anyone in the chamber, all attending staff are instructed to turn on their flashlights and turn the beams against the creature. No aggressive action is permitted, and staff members must remain at least one meter away from SCP-280 at all times for their own safety. And if you suddenly feel yourself getting a little nervous in an eerily dark room, I'd like you to remember this. The one thing more frightening than seeing eyes in the dark is not seeing them. A young man in a light t-shirt and cargo shorts pads down the worn hiking trail. It's a trail he's walked hundreds of times before, and as far as he knows, he'll get the opportunity to walk it a few hundred more. It's a smooth, even path, cutting through a lush forest on the edge of town, with plenty of nice benches and a few trash cans for dog walkers along the way. It has all the comforts a casual hiker can ask for. It's safe, familiar. He doesn't know why but the young man feels like perhaps today is the time for a change. Maybe it's the subconscious will to avoid monotony, or the fact he read an article a few weeks back about how varying your roots is the best way to avoid being kidnapped. Whatever the reason, he stops for a moment to pull up his socks, takes a swig from his water bottle, and ventures out into the heart of the woods. Who can blame him, really? We all need a change sometimes. And it's not like this poor young man has any idea what's in store for him out there. His boots crunch on the undergrowth, small things skittering out from amongst the dry leaves and twigs. He always encountered other people on his usual trail, which was fine, of course. He didn't mind a little socializing on his walks. But there's something oddly comforting about the true loneliness you can find in the woods. It's just nature and you, properly acquainted. No screens, no keyboards, no emails, texts, DMs, or obligations. It's natural, the way things should be. 
The young man closes his eyes for a moment and takes a deep breath in, just to enjoy it. That beautiful, clean spring air. A pleasure money can't buy. When he opens his eyes, he notices something in the distance, even deeper in the forest than before. It's large and brilliant white. Some kind of structure. How strange, he thinks. There are no paths leading to this thing, whatever it is. How could it have been built? And why? Was it another one of those weird obelisks that appeared in the desert a couple of years before that he saw in the news? It's the most interesting little mystery he's experienced in a while, and nothing about it seems to be throwing up any overt red flags. What would be the harm in going a little deeper to check it out? The question would certainly stay with him if he never found out. As he approaches, he notices that it's a large cube made from some strange, glossy plastic. There are no gaps or rivets, no real signs of how the cube was constructed at all. The only thing differentiating any of the sides is a metal door on one of the faces. He circles the cube a couple of times just to see if he's missing anything. Nothing really appears out of the ordinary, other than the very existence of the cube itself. He looks over his shoulder before approaching the door. No cameras, nobody waiting in the bushes to jump him. Not yet, at least. He steps forward, takes an uneasy breath, and opens the front door. It's a slow, cautious motion. After all, he has no idea what could be waiting for him inside. For all he knew, the whole cube would be primed to explode, with the opening of the front door being the activation mechanism. But no, what surprises him most is how oddly mundane the inside is. He takes out his phone, turns on the flashlight, and shines it inside. It's just an empty room. Pretty much exactly what you'd expect the least imaginative person in the world to suggest is inside a big plastic cube in the woods. Huh? Two strange little things catch his eye, though. Two doors on the adjoining back walls of the cube, a door to each wall. Huh? That can't be right. Doubting his own memory, the young man steps out and circumnavigates the cube again. There are no apertures in the back walls of the cube, so the doors inside would just lead to nowhere. Perhaps it's some kind of unfinished construction project, he muses. He'd read all about modular living and tiny homes. Maybe the plan was simply to cut in those two extra doors at a later date and fit in a skylight. People live in retrofitted shipping containers these days. Stranger things have definitely happened. Still, there it is again, that same nagging curiosity that brought him here in the first place. Even though he knows, logically, the two doors inside the cube lead to nowhere, he knows that if he leaves without trying them himself, it'd stick with him. He's just that kind of guy. The unanswered question weighs on him like a ship's anchor tied around his neck. It's always better to just… know. He ventures inside the cube again, lit once more by his phone's flashlight, and tries the door on the left. Even though he knows it should be a dead end, he still does it with that same trepidation as before, like there could be something waiting behind it, something with big eyes and even bigger teeth. He'll feel so silly for even worrying about this when he sees the wall on the other side. But that isn't what he sees. In fact, to his immense surprise, the door opens up into the interior of what seems like an identical cube. He's so shocked by the impossibility of it that he steps back, the door swinging back into place. No, 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 he thinks. That's impossible. He shakes his head and rubs his eyes. It had to be some trick or illusion. There's no possible way that this door can lead anywhere. He steps forward and, with great care, opens the door again. Nothing has changed. There's still an identical room to the one he's standing in, just waiting for him on the other side of the door. Huh? Maybe it's a projection or a mirror? Some kind of advanced AR tech being experimented on in the woods? The young man reaches forward. His hand slips across the threshold into the new room. It's real. It's an huh? actual space beyond the doorway. There's even another two doors on the far wall. Huh? What on earth is going on? Wanting to be sure he isn't just going crazy, he leaves the cube one more time and checks the back walls. He runs his hand across them, smooth plastic, no seams, no tricks, nothing hidden. There is no explanation for what's going on in there. Huh? He's discovered something truly remarkable, an exception mm. to the laws of physics as we know them, an anomaly in space. The sensible thing to do would have been to leave that second, find somewhere with cell service, and call other people to come check it out. If that had been the case, then things would have ended very differently for this young man. Instead, he decides to play pioneer. If there are other doors beyond the one into the impossible room, where do they lead? Are there even more incredible secrets just waiting for him to find them? He doesn't want to just be the person who dialed in about the initial discovery, while other people took over and did the exciting parts. 
Chances are, if he calls in about this, some shady government group will come and take the issue off his hands. He'll never know the true secret. It'll nag at him for the rest of his life. And he can't have that, can he? Guided again by the light of his phone, he enters the cube. After checking that the door on the right leads to exactly the same new room, he opens the left door once more and proceeds through, letting it close behind him. He looks around the room. It's absolutely identical, down to the smallest detail, not a crack or smudge out of place. He approaches the doors and looks beyond them, exactly as he's predicted, and on some level, hoped. There are more identical rooms on the other side. There's breaking the laws of physics, and then there's dropping a nuclear bomb on them. It all begins to go to his head. As he passes through each door, the only thing that seems to alter is the placement of the doors on the walls. It seems a little disorienting at first, like the room is being spun around from below, but he soon gets used to it. It's strange, going into a series of identical rooms doesn't scream exciting in the abstract, but when you know those rooms are impossible, it adds a certain layer of intrigue to the proceedings. Eventually, he comes upon something strange. After so long essentially seeing the same room repeated at him, he's primed to notice even the smallest difference. As he scans the floor with the light of his phone, he notices a boot print on the ground. It looks a couple sizes bigger than his own, with a completely different tread pattern. The thought dawns on him with a difficult mix of emotions. He isn't the only one who's been in here. And maybe he's not even alone in here. He's never been the suspicious type. He likes to see the good in everyone and assume a basic level of human decency. But something about the knowledge that another person could be in here filled him with torrents of icy dread. It's a dread so great that it even overrides his curiosity. He knows on some animal level that he needs to leave right now or something terrible is going to happen to him. He turns and it suddenly dawns on him. He doesn't remember which of the three doors in the room he entered through. In fact, he sped through so many rooms to get here, he can't remember which door he came through in any of them. The cold, thrumming pulse of dread soon heats up into panic. He tries to regulate his breathing. He needs to approach the situation logically. But how do you apply logic to a situation that's completely beyond it? He picks a door after an intense session of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and commits, heading through it into an identical room, and then another, and then another, and then another. He checks his phone, his only light source, and feels another spike of panic when he realizes just how low the batteries are. Who would have known how quickly the flashlight eats up charge? But without it, it's total darkness. He'll have no way out. He needs to get out before his battery runs out, or he'll never get out at all. Faster and faster, he passes through doors at random on the confidence that anyone who walks long enough will end up somewhere. He's looking for changes, landmarks, any signs of salvation. He finds, to his immense relief, that some doors have little red dots marked next to them on the wall in permanent marker. Whoever was here before might save him now. This relief has some cold water thrown on it by another scrawling a few rooms down. Someone had messily written, this is hell, on the wall in red, except this time it wasn't a pen that left the markings. At the bottom of the wall, he can see a few bloody fingernail chunks sitting in a dry brown puddle. Had they gotten out, whoever they are? Or is there a skeleton festering in one of these rooms? At this point, the young man is mortally terrified. Never before has death seemed like such a tangible presence, and not a quick death, but starvation and dehydration, two of the most terrible ways to go of all. He can feel hot tears running down his cheeks. He picks himself up, trying to choke out the sobs before they can rack his body. He needs to keep moving. Next room, next room, next room, next room, next room. With each one, hope shrinks and despair grows. There's no light, no progress, just the same thing over and over again. It's so relentless that, at some point, he needs to stop and catch his breath. He's breathing raggedly, his lungs burn, he's been getting nowhere at impressive speeds. It's only when he manages to slow his heart rate and quiet his breathing that he notices he's not the only one in the room. Their breathing is even more strained and wheezy than his. He turns slowly, almost paralyzed by fear, and turns the waning light of his phone into the corner of the room. There's a figure standing in the corner of the room. It's a person, but not the kind of person you ever want to run into. They're filthy and gaunt with deep-set wild eyes, their mangled fingertips, nails broken off, are crusted over in red. Their teeth, which appear long thanks to recessed gums, chatter against each other. I didn't ever think you'd find me, they say, voice a rattling whimper. Have you come to help me out? 
The young man doesn't know what to say. He's wrapped in a mix of pity and terror for the pitiful human being before him. How long had they been in here, just sitting in the dark, alone? The thought sickens him. I'm sorry, the young man says without thinking. I'm lost too. The stranger heaves a dry sob. No, I'm sorry, the stranger says. I'm just so hungry. Before the young man can say another word, the stranger is on him. They've got the strength of desperate insanity. Their bony, blood-stained hands clasp around the man's neck. The attack is so sudden, so shocking, so brutal. He screams and drops his phone. It tumbles to the ground and shatters. The horrors that happen next all transpire in the dark. The young man screams, but nobody with any interest in helping can hear him. Being trapped will do strange things to a person, but you don't need to tell anyone trapped in SCP-167 that. Also known as the Infinite Labyrinth, this anomaly is an absolute nightmare for anyone suffering from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Which is not to say it shouldn't also be terrifying to pretty much everybody else. The anomaly doesn't look like much to the casual observer, perhaps a work of avant-garde art or a particularly unwelcoming public bathroom. It's a cube measuring 10 meters around its edges, made from a shiny white plastic polymer with a large metal door affixed to the front. At face value, it seems to exhibit no anomalous spatial qualities, with the inner chamber having consistent internal dimensions with the outside. Two of the three remaining walls in the chamber display a pair of identical metal doors. Despite logically leading back outside of the cube, both of these doors instead open up to identical rooms, each of which also have two doors. This goes on, to the best of our knowledge, in perpetuity. Studies indicate that this anomaly has been explored extensively by people in the past, due to a high number of markings and unusual items from a number of time periods being left inside. Religious idols Sursa 500 BCE, several treasure chests Sursa 1500 CE, and even several SCPs, the specifics of which I am sadly not at liberty to share here. The complexity of the labyrinth isn't the only thing creating a risk of being lost within. All signs point to the anomaly having non-Euclidean geometry. Multiple researchers sent into SCP-167, each attached to the opening with a lifeline to prevent them getting lost, found that their experience getting to the same point involved passing through a number of vastly different rooms. It is currently unknown what causes these spatial distortions. Foundation researchers are extremely curious about potential connections to SCP-184, an object also known as the Architect, which causes notable spatial distortions inside any building wherein it is placed. Cross-tests between the two anomalies are currently pending approval from the O5 Council. Because the anomaly appears largely benign, one researcher even pitched using 167 as temporary storage space for low-risk anomalies. However, just because an anomaly is typically benign doesn't mean terrible accidents can't happen when the proper safety precautions aren't followed. The following note on the file from lead researcher Dr. Klein illustrates one notable incident of a tragedy as a result of lax safety procedures. As most of you are aware, an SCP Foundation senior researcher was videotaped entering SCP-167 several days ago without the requisite ball of twine, and he has not yet returned. His ultimate fate is unknown, but the search teams have turned up nothing. Let this be a reminder to all of you just how easy it could be to get lost in there if you don't utilize some method of marking your path. If I find that any other researcher has disobeyed the safety regulations and entered without a ball of twine, no matter how far deep they intend to go, they will find themselves being transferred to another facility for researching Keter-class SCPs, where they should have ample motivation to learn to follow safety regulations quite quickly. Signed, Dr. Klein. Because of its lack of sentience and static nature, SCP-167 has been given the safe object class. It has been removed from the forest and is kept in a padlocked room within Research Command 06, and anyone who seeks to conduct explorations into the interior of the anomaly must obtain permission from a relevant member of personnel with clearance level 3 or above. And remember, no matter where you're going, whether that be into the local forest or an anomalous cube, you're heading for disaster if you haven't planned how you're getting back. It's an average day at Site 43 of the SCP Foundation, and a new researcher has arrived for her first day at the site. She fills out an intimidating stack of onboarding paperwork, takes a picture for her new ID badge, and meets her direct supervisor. There's something you should probably know about working at this site, he begins, but an alarm sounds down the hall, and he has to rush away to attend to it. We'll finish this later, don't move, he calls to her before he disappears from sight. Then she's left alone, twiddling her thumbs, shifting from foot to foot, and looking at her new workplace. 
It looks like any other foundation site for the most part. One unusual thing does catch her eye, though. There are mirrors everywhere, all along the walls of the hallway, seemingly all the way down until the hallway bends out of sight. What could those possibly be for? As she runs through the possibilities in her head, she hears the squeaking wheels of a mop cart coming toward her. A janitor is making his way across the floor, mopping at the tiles as he goes. He has a pair of headphones covering his ears, and she thinks about interrupting him to ask about the mirrors, but doesn't want to disturb him. Then, she spots something just behind the janitor, reflected in the mirror, that makes her scream and drop her clipboard. There is a face, ashen and ghastly, like some horrible phantom out of a scary story. She spins around, expecting to see the horrible face lurking behind her, but there's nothing there. Whatever the thing is, it's just in the mirror. When her supervisor returns, he finds her pale and sweating, her hands shaking. She stumbles over her words, trying to tell him what she just saw. He laughs at her <laughs> wide-eyed expression and says, Oh, don't worry, that's just Philip and his constant companion. Then, he tells her all about SCP-5056. SCP-5056 is a hairless humanoid entity with gray matte skin and three slash-like scars on its face, resembling the placement of eyes and a mouth. It does not have a physical, corporeal form, at least on the visual spectrum, and can only be seen in reflective surfaces. It appears to prefer manifesting in glass, especially mirrors and lenses. Any equipment or media that captures the entity's image will begin to degrade on an atomic level. Though anyone can see SCP-5056 when it appears in a reflective surface, only one person is able to hear it speak. Philip E. Deering, also referred to as SCP-5056-B. Philip Deering is a white man with brown eyes and brown hair, standing at 172 centimeters tall. He joined the staff of SCP Foundation Site-43 as a custodian in July of 1999, and for his first three years of service, there was nothing notable about him. He was a pleasant man, though occasionally prone to bouts of depression, and was a reliable employee. In September of 2002, however, his behavior changed following a disastrous incident involving anomalous materials in a chromatic abatement facility AAF-D. After this incident occurred, Philip began exhibiting signs of auditory hallucinations, reacting to sounds that no one else could hear. At first, this was thought to be the result of a mental health episode brought on by stress and trauma, but the discovery of SCP-5056 soon proved that the voice he was hearing was not, in fact, in his head. Since the first day it appeared to him, SCP-5056 has followed Philip everywhere he goes. It has not expressed interest in any other people or entities, except for situations where it felt that Philip was being threatened. It is aware of other entities, it simply does not care about them. As for its behavior toward Philip, SCP-5056 has historically behaved in a way opposite to Philip's emotional needs. When Philip is trying to sleep, it opens its mouth scar and screams. It picks verbal fights with him when he is overwhelmed or sad, including reminding him of estranged family members, awkward social interactions, and personal failings. He has gotten used to his companion over the years, even giving notes on its less-than-effective insults and encouraging creativity. He has even given the entity a nickname, Doug. SCP-5056 becomes enraged when separated from Philip, and if there is no available reflective surface upon which it can manifest and speak to him, it will begin to act out. After nine seconds have passed without SCP-5056 having access to Philip, it will begin to vibrate at an intense speed and emit an endless 119 decibel sound that reverberates through the entirety of Site-43. As soon as Philip is returned to 5056's line of sight, both the sound and the vibrating will immediately stop. Staff in the area have been made aware of the entity's presence and its aggressive tendencies. Following an incident involving Dr. Bradbury, who experienced immense psychological distress after SCP-5056 appeared in one of the lenses of her eyeglasses that led to her eventual resignation, no one wearing glasses or any other reflective eyewear is permitted to interact with Philip or SCP-5056. Because SCP-5056 has no physical body, it cannot be truly contained in a traditional sense. However, its location seems to be bound to Philip's, and therefore limiting Philip's movements to Site-43 has provided the Foundation with a workable solution. Aside from the issue with Dr. Bradbury, there has only been one other notable incident involving SCP-5056 so far. On January 23, 2003, Dr. Falkirk decided to perform an experiment that would prove Philip was not necessary for the containment of SCP-5056. Philip was sent to an observation room and instructed to turn on recording equipment. In the room, there was a steel table, a steel chair, and a hand mirror. After Philip sat down in the room, 
SCP-5056 warned him to get out. He ignored it and proceeded to talk with Dr. Falkirk. Falkirk gave an order to initiate phase two of the experiment, and Philip began to have trouble breathing. After several seconds, he lost consciousness. Dr. Falkirk turned his and his assistant's attention to the mirror, where SCP-5056 was still present. It became enraged, yelling for Philip, and attacked Dr. Falkirk. Though the specific details of the attack are lost from official records, he was subsequently given medical treatment for blood loss, facial injuries, and the loss of his left eye. He has been under intensive psychological care ever since. Though no one but Philip is able to hear a word SCP-5056 says, any recording device that he activates will pick up the entity's voice. In order to give the research team a better sense of SCP-5056's behavior, Philip's uniform contains a microphone that is always on and always recording his conversations. It has, over the years, picked up everything that passes between Philip and the world around him, from his conversations with co-workers to the tiny torments and verbal barbs from SCP-5056. In 2020, however, the microphone recorded a series of events that would change Philip and his relationship to the anomaly in the mirror forever. Philip was struggling with a sense of crushing isolation, with the majority of his social interaction coming from Dr. Ngo and SCP-5056. The only bright spot in his days was the presence of Chief Amelia Tarosian of the janitorial and maintenance section, who would often visit Philip to chat while he was mopping. They spoke regularly for months, joking with each other about work, Amelia asking questions about Philip's life with 5056, all while the entity needled Philip about his apparent crush on Amelia. On September 9, 2020, however, Amelia confessed something. She returned his feelings. The audio transcription from this day captured this revelation. I never really thought... I didn't think you... Philip began. Really? Really, Amelia retorted. Yeah, really. Well, I mean, I didn't think you... Either, she admitted. Philip laughed at this. Are you kidding? You've got to be kidding. I mean, you're... A moment of silence passed between the two, the air crackling with nervous excitement. How long... He began. She interrupted. Since I met you. He laughed again, a giddy sound. You had that on speed dial. Well, how long... She started. This time, he interrupted. Since I met you. They both laughed for a long time before falling silent once again. What are you thinking about? Amelia asked. Can't you tell? She shook her head. No? Confusing me with your anxiety surrogate? He hasn't said a word tonight. Philip smiled softly at this. I must not have any anxieties right now. The two quickly developed a romantic relationship, Philip brushing off the doubts that SCP-5056 tried to plant in his mind. On June 11, 2021, Dr. Ngo conducted Philip's annual psychological review, and they discussed the notable changes in his demeanor and worldview. The audio from the session has been transcribed. Thanks for letting me do this a day early, Philip began. Well, hey, I have a social engagement tomorrow, Dr. Ngo replied. Philip laughed heartily at that. You know, that might be the first time I've heard you laugh. Let's talk about that. SCP-5056 started to speak. Yes, let's talk about... But Philip cut it off. About how humorless and morose I am? The entity was stunned into silence. Dr. Ngo spoke up. Was he about to say that? Are you finishing his thoughts now? Why not? They used to be my thoughts. What changed? SCP-5056 spoke up again. Nothing. Philip disagreed. A lot of things. Some of them because of Doug. Some of them because of me. Some of them... Chief Tarosian. Dr. Gnyo finished the thought for him. Yeah. I guess I didn't really care about improving myself until I had someone to improve for. Doug beat a lot of my flaws out of me. There just wasn't enough room in my head for self-pity or self-loathing or even selfishness with him nattering away in the background all day every day. But Amy gave me something to actually work toward. I actually... This time, 5056 finished his thought. You stopped wasting your life. Go on, Dr. Nyo encouraged. It feels strange to say, because this has been a terrible year all over, but it still meant so much to me. Dr. Nyo nodded. You achieved something. I achieved something, and I reached out. My life isn't one long, indifferently narrated one-man show anymore. Sure, I'm still stuck underground, but I'm not alone down here anymore. SCP-5056 spoke up, giving one final thought. You are never alone, Philip. You will never, ever be alone. Never again. What's he saying? Something spooky? Dr. Nyo asked. Philip shook his head. It's phrased that way, but that's not how I'm taking it. 
The next morning, Philip prepared to take a life-changing step. He stood in front of a mirror, dressed in a tuxedo, and adjusted his bow tie. How do I look, Doug? He asked. Because I can't see with you in the mirror. SCP-5056 replied, You're making a mistake. Philip laughed it off. Yeah, I've never been good at bow ties. I'd use a clip-on, but Amy would never forgive me, and anyway, you will clash with the tuxedo. SCP-5056 pushed further, refusing to let it go. You aren't ready for this. I definitely am. But hey, if you have objections, feel free to shout them out at the appropriate time. Nobody but me will hear you, but if you make good points, I'll be sure to pass them along. You won't hold up your end. I'd do anything for her. You don't have the energy. I've never felt this good. Are you even trying here, buddy? It won't change who you are. It already has. It won't fix you. <laughs> Philip laughed, pulling his bow tie tight. He turned away from the mirror and toward the next chapter of his life with one final statement. I don't need to be fixed. As long as she had known him, Amelia Tarosian had demonstrated kindness, care, empathy, and curiosity toward Philip. Unlike her colleagues, she was not put off by the presence of SCP-5056, but approached it with an open mind and an appreciation for the entirety of Philip's self, the man beyond the anomaly. The two were married in Ipperwash Provincial Park on June 12, 2021, and have been together ever since. Notably, Amelia has reported that SCP-5056 remains largely dormant in her presence, allowing the two to spend their time together without interruption. Following Philip's relationship with Amelia and the improvement to his mental state, as well as changes to SCP-5056's behavior, the Foundation conducted a review and reassessment of the anomaly. Several high-ranking Foundation staff wrote down their changing thoughts on SCP-5056 and contributed them to the official revised file. Amelia R. Tarosian, chief of the janitorial and maintenance section and wife of Philip Deering, wrote, I don't think anyone understood Doug when he first manifested. They all thought he was an anomalous abuser, a demon with a short fuse, existing just to get a rise out of someone. They tell me Phil was plenty risable back then, introverted and absent-minded, the perfect jump scare target. But once he stopped being jumpy, Doug started needling him about his low self-esteem. Once he started standing up for himself, Doug made him worry about other people's needs. By the time I met him in 2019, Phil was considerate, unflappable, and still absolutely miserable. That's when Doug started bugging him about his love life. I don't think Doug is preying on Phil. I think he's trying to help. Dr. Harold R. Blank, chair of the Archives and Revision section, contributed, For the longest time, we thought Phil might be anomalous as well. We even tossed around the idea of classing him Thaumiel, which obviously didn't fly. At the very least, we were pretty sure Doug was an unconscious manifestation of his internal monologue, so we labeled it 5056-A and made him 5056-B. After nearly two decades of observation, however, I can say with near certainty that there is nothing at all remarkable about Philip Eugene Deering beyond his unusual equanimity in the face of enduring trauma. He is no longer considered an SCP object, and his paranormal paramour has been reclassified as simply SCP-5056. A self-containing, incorporeal emotional parasite requiring no containment because it voluntarily restricts itself to the presence of a man who voluntarily restricts himself to a secure underground bunker. We're still not sure what will happen when Phil dies, but my guess is 5056 gets one last class change to neutralized. Dr. Melissa Bradbury, chair of the research and experimentation section included, Now I can't tell you what I saw, but I can tell you what I felt. That's only after more than a decade of Foundation psychotherapy, mind you. I was comatose for 11 months and endured three years of blurry vision because I couldn't put on a pair of specs or contact lenses without having a panic attack. When that thing filled up my vision, it felt like someone had gut-punched my brain. You know that late-night experience where you suddenly remember some stupid or embarrassing thing you did in your life and it makes you feel ashamed? Well, imagine if you suddenly thought of every stupid or embarrassing thing you'd ever done, all at once, like your conscience finally got fed up and decided to go nuclear on you. No wonder Falkirk tore his eye out. Delfina M. Ibanez, chief of the Pursuit and Suppression section, had this to say. When Blank said we should let Deering keep playing janitor under his pet monster's watchful eye scars, I was skeptical. I was chief of security and containment, and that sounded like the polar opposite of both concepts. I'm happy to say I was wrong. Deering has absolutely nil combat utility, and without 5056, his disaster response priority would be somewhere just above the D-Class, and we don't even have D-Class at 43. But with 5056, He's practically an intruder deterrent system. You know what they say, a friend is someone who will help you move, a best friend is someone who will disintegrate your enemy's eyes. 
Dr. Noon T. Ngo, chair of the Psychology and Parapsychology section, wrote, SCP-5056 has co-opted JM-64's negative thought processes, externalizing his melancholy and self-doubt. His earliest psych evaluations suggested a proclivity towards intrusive anxious thoughts. Because these thoughts are now literally intrusive, he can assess them much more rationally than he could without anomalous intervention. We still don't know what 5056 is, but I can say this much. It is devoted to its opposite number, and wants to help him. It expresses affection in a grating, alien manner, but there's no arguing with the results. It's taken 19 years, but Deering has finally made peace with himself. Of course, he's had a little extra help in that regard. Finally, Dr. Polixeni Metaxas, chair of the Spectrometry and Spectrometry section, said, They've called this a haunting for 19 years. It's even entered the general terminology. A Deering-class haunting denotes the stalking of a corporeal being by an incorporeal one. Nobody really thinks of 5056 as a ghost, however. Nobody but me. The materials handling disaster which created Doug also annihilated at least two of our subjects in containment. The nature of those subjects is highly classified, but I can say this much. They are intimately connected to the cycles of guilt and apathy through which human society writ large regularly cycles. Is it too much of a stretch to suggest that one of them, or a fragment of one of them, was reconstituted in that thaumaturgical soup into Deering's inescapable conscience? If that's what happened, well, perhaps it still doesn't make him all that different from the rest of us. We're all haunted by something and we're all haunting something ourselves. Our hopes and fears are just voices in our heads that only we can hear. Everything we are is just the hallucination of a hollow frame of meat and bone. So what separates us from the thing on the other side of the mirror? Three dimensions and room to grow. Since the reassessment, the containment measures for SCP-5056 have been updated. It is now considered to be self-containing with its position fixed to that of Philip. Philip is prohibited from leaving SCP Foundation facilities without direction from security clearance level 4 plus personnel, and must carry at least one reflective object on his person at all times. Any new or visiting staff must be briefed by Philip on the nature of SCP-5056. He is also required to undergo mental health treatment, mainly exposure response prevention therapy, which allows him to respond to his intrusive thoughts without acting on them. Though SCP-5056 once terrified Philip, bringing him endless distress, he has grown accustomed to its presence. Even when the things 5056 tells him are upsetting, he considers them to be necessary reflections of his inner life, providing him with introspection he has never been capable of on his own. Since Philip's marriage, the entity has grown more and more passive, appearing only to bring up areas that need improvement in the relationship, reminding Philip of ways he can be a better husband to Amelia. Just as Philip has become more comfortable with the presence of SCP-5056, so too has the rest of the Foundation staff. Perhaps, even if they're not entirely aware of it, they recognize something of themselves in that dynamic. Don't we all live with demons of our own, constant companions whispering our insecurities back to us, reminding us of the ways in which we fall short? They may not be as anomalous as SCP-5056, but their hold on us can be just as powerful, just as destructive. The only way to contain them is to look them in the face, learn to talk back, and decide against all odds to go after what we want anyway. We may never be truly rid of them, never be completely alone, and without that gray shadow lurking at our side. But that's okay. We can carry it with us, accepting that our fears, our hurts, our nagging anxieties are necessary parts of who we are. But we can also argue back against the voice that tells us we'll never be truly happy and say, yes, I will, because I deserve it. Eventually, we might just believe it enough for that voice to finally shut up. It's October 31st, 2021, and anyone who's anyone in the upper crust of society knows that there's really only one place to celebrate Halloween if you want to stay relevant. A certain Norwegian billionaire's yearly costume ball. Invitations are highly exclusive, and if you have to ask where you can get one, you're definitely not on the list. Those lucky, beautiful, famous, or just plain rich enough to be invited receive the notice a year in advance, in an increasingly elaborate fashion each time. Rumor has it that one year the billionaire specially trained a flock of purebred carrier pigeons to deliver the invites, printed on scrolls recovered from the ruins of the Library of Alexandria. But that's just a rumor, of course. This year's invitations arrived in the form of a luxury sports car, with a simple, gold-embossed card hidden in the glove compartment that read, Lucky You. It then provided information on this year's theme, Medieval Fantasy. The dress code would be strict, and failure to comply would result in being barred from entering the event. 
It also included a vital piece of carefully guarded information, the location of the party. The lavish event is held in the billionaire's castle, nestled in the remote countryside of Norway, which he had built a decade ago specifically for this one night a year. For the other 364 days, it sits vacant, except for a full staff to keep it in prime condition, of course. As a group of first-time partygoers pull up the long, winding driveway to the castle's gates, their limo is stopped by a guard. Your driver will need to let you out here, he explains. Can't have someone who isn't on the list coming up to the residence, your host insists. And so the group, two men and two women, climbs out of the car, and they all make their way up the drive on foot. They didn't prepare for the trek, and by the time they reach the castle gates, the ladies are sweating into their exquisite handmade gowns, and one of the gentlemen has torn a small hole in his tights. Nevertheless, they have arrived at what promises to be a truly grand occasion. Once the gates creak open and grant them admission, they quickly forget the discomfort of the long walk. Reports of the event have not, in fact, been greatly exaggerated. It is every inch as impressive as they could have imagined it would be. A lush golden carpet rolls out from the doors into the ballroom, and a herald clad in period attire blows a horn to signal their arrival. He announces their names to the room, where beautiful people are already dancing and frolicking to their heart's content. There are rows and rows of delicious-looking food, including roasted pigs, fresh fruit, and cakes. There are fountains filled with the finest champagne, and a full orchestra provides live music that fills the enormous halls. Above it all, the host himself sits, dressed in regal robes and a crown positively dripping with jewels. It is the most indulgent, decadent, glorious event any of them have ever been a part of. There are no clocks inside the party castle, and no other way to note the passage of time while inside. This is entirely deliberate, and an event there ends only when the guests have all grown too weary to continue the merriment. It is for this reason that the four newcomers do not notice how late it has grown, or the fact that one day has already bled into the next outside the castle. By the time they stumble back outside, filled with cake, champagne, and fresh gossip they can't wait to repeat, it is nearly dawn. They walk back down the path that led them to the castle, their steps a little heavier with exhaustion and the aforementioned champagne, and notice that there are rows of limousines and other cars waiting where they were dropped off. Excuse me, one of the women calls out to a guard. Where's our limo? Where did you tell him to wait? The guard responds. At this, the woman looks at her companions, who all shrug. None of them were aware of this practice, and they sent the driver home when they left the car. We didn't, she explains. The guard stares at her blankly for a moment, then bursts out laughing. Well then, he says, you'll just have to walk. Surely there is a contingency plan in place, right? Their wealthy host can't expect his guests to walk home if they didn't think to plan ahead and tell their driver to wait all night. The group waits for the punchline, the reveal that there is a driver on staff ready to give them a ride or someone who can call them a cab, but it never comes. Not only that, but none of their cell phones have a signal. They can't call the driver to come back, even if he wasn't likely to be dead asleep at this hour. The guard is right, they will have to walk, at least until they have enough of a signal to call for a taxi. So, with no other option in sight, the disillusioned partygoers begin the long journey back to civilization. Light is beginning to trickle back onto the landscape, allowing them to at least see where they are going, but it is still mostly dark as they make their way along the road. Are we safe out here? One of the men asks. From what, muggers? The other replies. There could be bears out here, one of the women remarks. No, the other woman insists. The bears are all hibernating this time of year, aren't they? They all collectively shiver at the thought of encountering a bear or anything else out on this lonely road, with nowhere to hide and no way to defend themselves. Best not to dwell too long on that thought, or they might find themselves paralyzed with fear. They still have who knows how many steps left to go before they can relax. They walk together in silence for a long time, listening for the sound of any dangerous criminals or bears creeping up behind them, but nothing comes. As they slowly progress, the sun begins to emerge on the horizon, flooding the landscape with warm light and chasing away the fear of the dark. Look, one of the ladies finally breaks the silence. Up there! She points, directing her friend's attention to a hill up ahead. There, they can make out the silhouettes of men on horseback, wearing suits of medieval armor. They're dressed as knights, like something out of a King Arthur story. They must have come from the party. The others nod, agreeing. Maybe we could ask for a ride, one of the men suggests. Or to borrow a horse, the other chimes in. In agreement, the four approach the knights in shining armor, waving their arms as they go. Halt! Who goes there? Shouts one of the knights. Oh, there's no need for that, the other woman laughs. We came from the same place. 
Art thou friend or foe? The knight asks. He does not remove his helmet. His hand rests on the hilt of his sword. Thinking it all must be some kind of joke, the group of partiers continues up the hill. Spurred to action, the knight draws his sword, brandishing it threateningly. This is enough to stop the group in their tracks. Is he serious? Mutters one woman to the other. I can't tell, she replies. That sword looks pretty real, though. Behind them, they hear the clip-clop of hooves and turn to see two other knights sitting atop massive black horses, brandishing weapons. I think we should go, she yells to her friends, gathering her skirts and running back down the hill, but the rest of the group don't seem so willing to turn back. You want to play a game? Then let's play, says one of the men as he draws his own sword, a perfect replica of one wielded by a character in his favorite fantasy television series, and tries to wave it back at the knight, but he promptly drops it on the grass. It's much heavier than he thought it would be. Leave this place now, or face your death, a voice bellows from above him. Now wait just a minute, who do you think you're talking to? The man says as he bends down to pick his sword up again. But before he can finish, there's a flash of glimmering steel in the sunlight, followed by a spray of dark red liquid that hits the rest of the partygoers. They watch in silent horror as the man's head rolls off his shoulders before looking back at the man on horseback. This isn't a game at all. The blood-stained partygoers turn and run from these frightening strangers on horseback, but they can hear the thunderous hooves following them, the clank of the metal armor. The woman who first began to run looks back over her shoulder and can't believe what she sees. It's a rout as the mounted knights chase their fleeing foes, cutting them down in their retreat. All she can do is run and hope that they're too distracted with their current quarry to come after her. She doesn't know how long she runs before the sound of the massacre starts to fade out, but eventually, it does. Unable to run any longer, she collapses in the grass, frightened and confused by all that has happened. But with a scream, she jumps to her feet once again as she hears footsteps behind her. You can't sleep here, says a man with a harsh barking voice. This is a restricted area. Before her stands the second group of armed men she's seen that day. This time, they're dressed in modern military attire. The Norwegian army? She can't be sure. The man doesn't have an accent. She starts to plead with the man, but he abruptly cuts her off. What year is it? He asks, his expression serious. She answers, confused, giving him the current year. He relaxes. This area is closed to the public. It's not safe for you to be here. Let me escort you out of the perimeter, he offers. She tries to tell him what she's seen, the strange men on horseback, her friends being slaughtered before her eyes. When the man asks how she got there, she lets the whole story come pouring out. The billionaire, the invitation, the party... In her frantic state, she doesn't notice one of the guards who radios to someone that it looks like he's done it again. The man questioning her changes his tone. He doesn't seem at all concerned about a murderous group of medieval knights in the woods. Sounds like you had a bit too much to drink, he tells her before putting a comforting arm around her shoulders. And she doesn't even notice the syringe until she feels a prick on her upper arm before losing consciousness. The woman would be returned home and have no memories of the events that she witnessed. She'd never remember how much danger she was in when she had a brush with SCP-526. SCP-526, also known as the Valhalla Gate, is located on a hill in Norway. The SCP Foundation has hidden information on the gate's exact whereabouts, no doubt to stop curious civilians from wandering into danger or filming short viral videos. But if you find yourself in the Norwegian countryside, it can still easily be identified. Simply look for a ring of nine stones, each standing at about two meters tall, placed in a ten-meter radius at the top of the hill. If you're not certain whether you're in the right place, or if you just happened upon another mysterious stone circle, look for the runes inscribed on the inward surface of each one. If the runes are there, you're in the right place. Or the wrong place, depending on who you ask. Every day at sunrise, give or take about fifteen minutes, the gate will open and release a group of warriors from any point in history, fully armed and outfitted for battle. These can range from a small group of archers, to 300 Spartans, to groups of highly trained special operatives, and every member of the temporarily displaced group will be from the same period in history. As if they all ran through some sort of rift at the same time. Though these resulting manifestations rarely harm anyone, staying in place 92% of the time after they first appear on the hilltop, the remaining 8% lead to scenarios which can truly be a bloodbath. After all, to an army lost in the fog of war, emerging in a strange land in an unfamiliar time, anyone can look like an enemy. No matter how they behave on their initial appearance, those who cross through SCP-526 will attempt to attack anyone who approaches the anomaly. They will remain in the area until sunset, at which time they disappear, 
presumably returning back to wherever and whenever they originated. The SCP Foundation first discovered SCP-526 after a group of backpackers were hospitalized in the area. They claimed to have been walking through the hills when suddenly they were swarmed by, quote, a bunch of Vikings with axes. Naturally, this drew the attention of Foundation field agents, who soon found the mystical stone circle responsible for the attack. The survivors were given amnestics, and a cover story circulated blaming the claims of Vikings on recreational hallucinogens. Since this first incident, notable encounters between the Foundation and the soldiers traveling through the Temporal Gate have been few and far between, but there have been a few that were designated significant enough to be recorded in the official archives. Four, to be exact. In the 1990s, a member of the Foundation containment team spotted 40 figures making their way down the hill in the dim dawn light. They were holding longbows and swords, weapons at the ready as they made their descent. One member of the team, who it should be noted was on his very first day of containment duty, made the mistake of calling out to the strangers. Gentlemen, please lower your weapons, he called. His request, however polite it may have been, was answered with an arrow to the shoulder. Thankfully, the rest of the team was able to swoop in and settle things before the situation could progress any further. The injured personnel was given prompt medical attention and reassigned to a desk job where he was much less likely to encounter flying projectiles of any kind. A few years later, the team of Foundation operatives placed at SCP-526 had started to grow complacent. There had not been a violent incident in ages, just a series of very confused people appearing at sunrise and milling around until they vanished at sunset. It seemed that most of the subjects passing through the temporal rift were not as bloodthirsty as one might expect. Then, one operative was startled out of a daydream by the thunk of a stone axe hitting a tree near his head. He and the rest of his team looked up to see a group of 30 men clad in animal skins pouring down the hillside, rushing right for them. In their fists, they held crude weapons carved from stone, their wild eyes, untamed beards, and blood-stained clothing becoming clearer as they grew closer. Fortunately for the SCP Foundation, these cavemen had brought clubs to a semi-automatic rifle fight. They opened fire, and within minutes, not a single hide-clad man was left standing. It was a bit awkward, looking at their fallen bodies for the rest of the day, but the team saw no point in moving them if they were just going to disappear that night anyway. One task force member spent the rest of the day looking at his hands, paranoid he may have shot one of his ancient ancestors and erased himself from the timeline in a back-to-the-future-like fashion. This was, thankfully, not the case. Several more years passed, and the century turned to usher in the new millennia. In the early 2000s, a platoon of 20 Russian soldiers, later identified when a Foundation officer attempted to translate several curses yelled at him by one of the men, materialized, wearing World War II uniforms and carrying rifles consistent with that time period. Most of them did not move from the hill, staying in a defensive position, but a few got a bit too bold and opened fire on the Foundation operatives. The fire was returned in kind, and two men were killed, but the rest were left unharmed for the remainder of the day. The final incident on record is particularly notable because, in this case, the soldiers that appeared did not belong to a particular country's military, nor were they from the distant past. There were 30 men and women, dressed in an uncomfortably recognizable uniform. These were the members of a lost SCP Foundation mobile task force, all killed in action during a field mission several years prior. Wanting to avoid friendly fire, the operatives placed at the site attempted to speak to these MTF members, but they did not respond. Instead, they attacked and would not relent until air support arrived in the form of a Foundation AC-130 gunship, Thor's Hammer, leaving three dead and eleven wounded when the smoke finally cleared. This last encounter raised some difficult questions about the nature of SCP-526 and the mental state of those who passed through it. They seemed unable to recognize their own peers, unable to hear what they were saying. Their instinct to defend SCP-526 from any perceived invaders overrode whatever familiarity or loyalty they might ordinarily have for other Foundation operatives. It was a tragic, disquieting affair, with no clear answers in sight. The SCP Foundation is of course no stranger to terminating its own, but the individual officers present for this incident reported a high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder, and several requested to be given amnestics in order to put a stop to recurring nightmares. The Foundation will not be able to learn more unless more of their own fallen soldiers pass through the gate. Even if they do, it is impossible to say whether they will be able to ask any questions or engage in a dialogue, or whether they will have to gun them down in another round of kill or be killed. Because there is no way to know what each new sunrise at SCP-526 will bring, the SCP Foundation has classified the anomaly as Euclid. 
As there is no way to move SCP-526 to any official Foundation site, the 15-kilometer radius around the anomaly has been converted into Armed Containment Area 31. The cover story for this area is a military weapon testing site, and there is a no-fly zone in effect there. A team of qualified field agents is placed on site in order to observe and neutralize any subjects that emerge from SCP-526. Because all is fair in war and, well, war, the agents placed there are permitted to use deadly force if their lives are threatened or the containment is jeopardized. Thirty minutes before the sun comes up, the containment teams are placed on full alert and will keep their eyes on SCP-526 until the sun has set and all potential threats have disappeared. If a given day's apparitions are too aggressive or too numerous for the teams on the ground to contain, Mobile Task Force Sigma-9, or Valkyries, may assist via airstrike. Since the Foundation has set up its perimeter around SCP-526, no civilians have been harmed. Though the same can't be said for Foundation personnel or the revolving door of strange warriors emerging on the hill, the protocol has been considered successful. I haven't yet been out to see the gate in person myself. I tend to be more of a pacifist. But if I ever do, I'll make sure to bring a shield, a bulletproof vest, and perhaps a full suit of armor. Why not? The best offense is a good defense, I always say. The babysitter sits in the darkened house, lit only by the soft glow of the television screen. Now that the little girl she's been watching has gone to bed, the once warm, lively home is eerily quiet and still. With nervous fingers that need to keep moving, she flips through the channels, past competitive cooking shows, a black and white film, a documentary about penguins. Nothing grabs her attention like she needs. None of it is an adequate distraction from the anxious prickle on the back of her neck, the way her palms are growing clammy and slick with sweat. This is the worst part of every babysitting gig. Her friends would disagree. They all say that late at night, after the kids have gone to bed and before the parents get home from their evening out, is the very best part of the job. This is the perfect little pocket of peace when they can invite their boyfriends over or sneak an extra snack from the pantry. But as her eyes watch the flickering screen, the shopping channel, the late night talk shows, all she can really think about is just how alone she is right now. It's a safe neighborhood. She knows that in the rational part of her mind, but she can't help but feel her pulse spike every time headlights illuminate the yard outside the window. She can't stop her imagination from running wild with images of machete-wielding killers watching through the glass. Why, she has to wonder, as her chest tightens with aimless fear, are there so many scary stories about babysitters? It's always the babysitter getting a phone call from a menacing stranger, rasping in a deep voice, Have you checked the children? The babysitter is the one watching the creepy clown statue in the corner of the room all night, until she calls the family to ask them a question about it, and hears those terrifying words, we don't have a clown statue. It's inescapable. From mask-wielding slashers and escaped lunatics, to the soft voices of ghostly children, and the maniacal cackling of the demon in the closet or under the bed, waiting for new prey. In a horror story, the babysitter always has a target on their back. She shivers. Those are campfire stories, she reminds herself. Just because a babysitter is an easy target for a fictional killer, that doesn't mean anything bad is going to happen to her here tonight. The kid is sleeping soundly, the parents will be home soon, and there's leftover macaroni and cheese in the kitchen. Everything is fine. Better than fine, in fact. She takes a deep breath in and out. Another breath in, but just before she can let it out and relax, there's a sound, a rustling at the front door. She tenses, holding her breath. Maybe it's a raccoon digging through the trash. Maybe it's just the wind. But then she hears it, undeniable and chilling the sound of footsteps pacing back and forth outside. She grips the arm of the couch so hard her knuckles go white, refusing to move a muscle. Should she turn the lights on? No, she can't. Then they'll know someone is home. Whoever is lurking outside the front door right now is deliberately deciding not to knock, and she doesn't want them to know she's here. Suddenly, a thought occurs to her, one that makes her stomach drop. Did she remember to lock the door? The squeak of metal almost makes her cry out in shock, but she covers her mouth at the last second. The mail slot on the front door slides open. Something small pushes through and lands on the floor with a soft thud. Then, as quickly as they came, she hears the footsteps retreat, and she is alone in the dark again. She waits and waits and waits, but there's no other sounds. Whoever was there, they're gone now. But what did they leave behind? The babysitter tiptoes over to the door, where she finds the strange delivery sitting on the floor. It's a small plastic case containing a single, unmarked DVD. 
She flips it over, looking for any kind of writing to indicate what it might be, but there's nothing on it at all. She couldn't explain what exactly made her walk to the family's television and slide the disc into the DVD player before sitting down to watch whatever it might hold. Perhaps it was morbid curiosity or that nagging, all-consuming desire for distraction. Whatever it was, she picked up the remote control, pressed play, and readied herself for what might come next. The screen comes to life with the image of a young woman in a short white dress and a pair of high heels, running down a narrow hallway. Her mouth is wide open, her face twisted into a blood-curdling scream, but there is no sound coming from the TV. The babysitter points the remote at the television and turns up the volume, but nothing comes out of the speakers, just silence. Somehow, without sound, the scream looks more horrifying. It's stiff, unnatural. As the woman on TV runs, a dark figure rounds the corner behind her, pursuing her. The babysitter gasps involuntarily as the figure comes further into the frame. The thing chasing her is a massive doll, three times the height of the woman in the white dress. It wears a dress of its own, a garish, lacy thing with puffed sleeves and a long, stuffed skirt. The doll shouldn't be able to move the way it does. Everything about it makes it seem like it was meant to stay still. Its stiff wooden arms, its splayed frozen fingers, the fixed, insipid smile, its unblinking beady eyes that tore into its victim's back. Still, the doll moves, its legs and arms pumping, its head turning from side to side to follow the woman's path. The hallway turns into a music room, with a grand piano and a wooden bench that the woman knocks on its side as she barrels past. The doll is relentless in its pursuit, following at a steady, almost casual pace, as if it knows that the human girl will grow tired, weak, and vulnerable, while it could keep up this chase forever. The babysitter can't look away, can't shut her eyes. She wants to so badly, but she has to see what happens to the poor girl, what that unfeeling face on the doll will look like when it catches its prey. She watches for a while, she can't quite tell how long, and then the screen cuts to black. The babysitter sighs, ready to eject the DVD and throw it in the trash, but then it comes back to life. There she is, the woman in white, lying on the floor now in a crumpled, motionless heap. The camera trails over her body, from her feet, up her legs, bent at odd angles, past her broken arms, and finally, to her face. There, the beady black eyes stare out of the screen. The woman's head is gone, replaced with the head of the doll. Then the screen goes black again. It's over. The babysitter reaches a hand to her face and feels moisture on her cheeks. When did she start crying? She wasn't sure, but now she couldn't stop. It was all so horrible. People being chased by giant dolls, being killed by dolls, turning into dolls. She feels her grasp of what was real, of what was flesh and blood, and what was cold, cruel porcelain growing weaker. She tries to calm her racing heart, to recall a soothing song her mother used to sing. But those old memories feel fuzzy, like a half-remembered dream. Hello? A quiet voice jolts the babysitter from her thoughts. There, on the stairs, is the little girl, the one she's supposed to be watching, clad in her pink bunny pajamas and clutching her favorite doll. I had a bad dream. The babysitter looks from the little girl to the doll in her hand. The two had the same wide blue eyes, the same perfect ringlet curls, the same rosy cheeks, the almost artificial sheen of her skin, the way she walks, talks. How had she not seen it before? It's okay, I'm here, she says. Do you want a glass of water? The girl nods. The babysitter could have sworn the doll nodded too. What could she do? Could she say something? No, that wouldn't work. The girl was too young to understand. She would have to find another way. She makes her way to the kitchen, and as she turns on the tap to fill a cup with water, her eyes fall on the butcher's block, on the meat cleaver, waiting there like a volunteer. She wraps her hand around its handle and makes her way back to the living room. A half hour later, the parents come home, expecting to find their daughter in bed and their trusty babysitter sitting on the couch like she always was. Instead, they find a nightmare. They turn on the lights to reveal splatters of blood soaking their once pristine white carpet, a streak of thick red gore leading them down the hall. They can smell a metallic rot that belonged in a butcher's shop. When they reach the kitchen, all they can do is scream. The mother turns away in horror from what she saw in the kitchen to find the babysitter standing before her, still clutching the cleaver, now dripping with blood. Her expression is one of grief, deep and sorrowful. What have you done? The girl's mother wails as her husband stands by, pale and in shock. I didn't want to, but it was the only way. 
The babysitter wipes the tears from her eyes, smearing blood across her cheek as she does. Don't you see? She looks at the couple expectantly, but they cannot say a word. If they open their mouths again, they know they will be sick. I had to show you the truth, the babysitter insists. She wasn't real anyway. I had to take her apart, but I can put her back together. She was a doll, a toy, just like me. She turns her gaze to them, a sudden, wild glint in her tear-filled eyes. She slowly stands and takes a step toward the couple, her expression one of grim determination. The look of someone who is not proud of the blood they will have on their hands, but is still about to spill it anyway. The parents turn to run, but it was too late. She was already on them. She raised the cleaver high, the sharp metal edge glinting menacingly in the low light. Just like you. This poor unfortunate family, their lost daughter, and a seemingly well-adjusted babysitter turned murderer were not the first people to have their lives destroyed by this strange DVD, and they would not be the last. All over the world, random individuals have opened their mailboxes to find a nondescript DVD with no logo, title, or any other identifying information. If they made the grave mistake of watching the DVD, then they too inevitably fell prey to the influence of SCP-1432, also known as Doll DVD. SCP-1432 does not refer to the digital video discs themselves, but rather to the piece of content that is contained on them. It is a silent, avant-garde short film that consists of a series of nearly identical scenes. In each sequence, a massive doll chases a young woman through various rooms and down various hallways. The doll's size varies from scene to scene, seemingly expanding or compressing in order to fill larger rooms or fit through smaller doorways. This goes on for 16 minutes before the final scene, a shot of the young woman's body with the doll's head now in place of her own. But what is it, aside from the unsettling imagery, that makes this video so anomalous? Anyone who views this video for at least five minutes will experience a dramatic shift in their perception of reality and of their own identity. The subject will begin to believe, without a shred of doubt, that they and all of the other people and animals in the world are not organic beings, but rather dolls constructed by an unidentified force. This effect results in homicidal tendencies in 73% of subjects. The resulting murders are often messy and emotionally fraught for the subject, who will express remorse for what they have done while simultaneously believing that killing and mutilating their victim is the only way to show others the truth. The first instance of SCP-1432 on record was discovered in the evidence lockup of a small town Ohio police station after a particularly harrowing homicide case drew the attention of Foundation operatives. A 12-year-old boy had watched the video and several hours later had killed and mutilated his mother and father. The Foundation brought both the DVD and the boy into custody and a researcher sat him down for an interview. The researcher began the interview by having the boy introduce himself by name. With those formalities out of the way, they could get to the more pressing questions. Very good, he began. Now, you believe that you are an artificial toy, is that correct? The boy nodded. I am, you are, everyone, everyone I've met is. Probably everyone is, I don't know, I… At this he trailed off, his eyes filling with tears. The researcher attempted to comfort him. It's okay. When did you realize you were a toy? I watched a video. Don't remember much of it. About a doll, I think, or something. But after that, I knew. I mean, it was obvious, how could I not have seen it sooner? Everyone was. Everyone just… toys. Everything I felt… That time I hit a home run for the first time, my love for my parents, my dog. All just someone playing with their toys. The researcher pressed the matter a little further. But if you didn't think like this until after you saw the video, don't you think it possible the video could have made you feel this way, affected your mind somehow? At this, the boy clenched his fists tight, face reddening with anger. No! The guy who made the video, he was warning people, don't you get it? He figured it out, and he wanted other people to know, because people need to. They don't deserve to just, just exist so that somewhere someone gets a good laugh or whatever. It's okay, I understand. So, did you try to tell your parents about what you'd found out? The boy began to tremble. The tears that had pulled in his eyes before now flowed freely down his cheeks. I… I did. They didn't believe me. I kept explaining it to them, but they just didn't understand. I… they… I had to show… show someone. I had to let people know. I… I… the only way was to… it couldn't have been just anyone else. I wouldn't get the opportunity like I did with them, but… I understand. You had to do what you thought was right. 
The boy pounded his fists on the table, shaking harder than before. His voice wavered with the intensity of his distress. They're so smart. They know. They know. The only way you find out is to show people what's really inside. So they put in this... They they program you so that you don't. They make it so hard. It was all those memories, but I had to. I... I... The researcher reached out a hand to pat the boy on the shoulder. I know. It's okay. The boy wept silently for a moment and then asked, I'm a good person, right? I had to. I really did. The researcher fought back tears of their own. You're a good person. It will be all right eventually. I promise. The boy was taken back to his containment chamber and given a sedative to help him sleep. The researcher immediately requested a course of Class A amnestics to help him forget the conversation that had troubled him so deeply. His request was granted, and he carried on with his duties at the SCP Foundation until the next traumatic encounter. All recovered instances of SCP-1432 are kept in a secure filing cabinet in its containment chamber. This chamber also contains a television and DVD player, which are to be used during testing. No instances of SCP-1432 may be removed from the room under any circumstances. Though the Foundation has contained every doll DVD it has come across, the containment process for SCP-1432 has been a bit like tossing buckets of water out of a sinking ship. It may help a little, but the dangerous waters continue to rise just the same. Because of this difficulty in maintaining containment, SCP-1432 has been given the Euclid Object Class. All the Foundation can really do is monitor police communications and keep an eye out for any homicides linked to a DVD. If one such crime is reported, the recovery team will be sent to the scene to retrieve any potential instances of SCP-1432. These suspected DVDs are then tested on D-Class personnel. If the test subjects begin rambling on about dolls and people not being real, then the DVDs are placed in immediate containment. The effort doesn't end there, though. The digital age has made it easier to find recipes, communicate with lost loved ones, and pirate music but it has also made it simpler for bad actors to share harmful material with millions of strangers. Because SCP-1432 could do untold damage to the population if allowed to go viral, a specialized team must monitor online video sharing platforms for any instances of it. If any are found, they must be deleted as soon as possible, and the IP address of the user who uploaded the video must be traced. Currently, very little is known about the video's origins. It is yet to be determined who made the video, for what purpose, or who will be selected to receive a copy next. There are some forces in this world that you just shouldn't toy with, so be wary of any mysterious DVDs that are slipped into your mailbox. Best just to throw it away immediately. Don't bring it inside the house, don't fire up your DVD player, and definitely don't press play. If you do, it might be the last thing you ever watch. Quiet, quiet. Duck down, out of sight over there. Are you recording? Why aren't you recording? The camera woman has no desire to shoulder her camera yet again. It has been like this all day. The three of them will walk ten feet, then all of a sudden, the presenter will dive behind a bush and beckon for herself and their guard to do the same. Her patience for it is certainly starting to wear thin. Clearly nowhere near as thin as their security guards, however, as the man flexes his trigger finger against the side of the rifle, grumbling to himself in Swahili. The camera woman should never have taken this job. She knows that now but they are far too deep in the Tanzanian wilderness to turn back now. They parked their jeep up in the early hours of the morning and started walking at sunrise. The faint blue tinge to the dark forest around them tells her it must be almost sunrise again. The presenter turns to her and runs a hand through his carefully sculpted hair. His pink skin has been burning and peeling in the sun all day long. He looks like he'd give the flamingos from earlier a run for their money as she switches the LED ring light on. The presenter clears his throat and wipes the sweat from his brow. Rumor has it that the area we are entering into now is patrolled by highly sophisticated militarized drones. Myself and my crew are risking our lives here, but that's just what it takes when you decide to live as an extreme vegan. He insists on recording several more takes. By the fifth attempt, the camera woman stops hitting record. Not worth filling up the memory with this waste of a shot. Extreme vegan. What will they come up with next? She had moved to Tanzania with dreams of working on documentaries with a capital D. Rich, beautiful shots of the world's most endangered animals basking by a watering hole or hunting to feed their starving cubs. Real footage, not this reality show nonsense. The presenter had touched down the previous day, immediately started asking about where the nearest fast food chain was, then threw a tantrum because the Wi-Fi in the hotel lobby was too slow. Bad as he was, he at least seemed mostly harmless. But their security guard… 
The camera woman glances over to him. The man seems more like a local thug with a gun than a trained professional. The studio must have been trying to save money hiring him. Goodness knows they were cutting costs hiring her to do video and audio. She should have smelled a rat and just said no. A light. It sweeps through the trees so quickly it almost catches the three of them. The camera woman hits the dirt just in time. The camera bumps awkwardly into her shoulder so hard she almost cries out. A mechanical whirring fills the night. The light sweeps this way and that as they all lie motionless on the ground. Then, just as abruptly as it appeared, the light swings away and the sound fades. Maybe those drones aren't as made up as they sounded. The presenter is clearly very shaken. His wide eyes dart around between the trees as they all get back to their feet. So much for being an extreme vegan. The camera woman glances over at their security guard. A twisted grin lights up his face. She notices a little pendant has slipped out of his shirt. A small white shard hanging from a handmade chain. Even in the dead of night, the camera woman has filmed enough elephants to recognize ivory when she sees it. The security guard, no, poacher, meets her gaze. His smile widens. He speaks Swahili in a low voice. We keep moving. Shouldering the rifle, the poacher marches onwards in the direction the drone had just been a few moments ago. The camera woman and presenter have no option but to follow. For a long time, the group walks in silence. It is the longest the presenter has gone without opening his mouth since his plane touched down. The camera woman would be enjoying the peace and quiet if it hadn't been for the sickening unease that had settled over them. Had that drone been real? If it had, then what exactly were they walking into right now? Some kind of secret facility? GMO research? Labor camps? But it just looks like any other patch of forest in Tanzania. Only, it doesn't. Come to think of it, as they walk, the camera woman starts to notice little differences. At first, they're too subtle to put a finger on, just a different feel to the air or a strange sound. Is it the plants, perhaps? She's no botanist, so doesn't really know what she's looking at, but she's spent enough time out in the wild here to know a few plants. But now, she's spotting all kinds of strange new ones. A bush with huge red leaves here, a tree with long purple fruit there. She asks the presenter what they are. He looks up at the purple fruit tree, perplexed. Wasn't this supposed to be the whole point of this documentary? Exploring the furthest reaches of the world, looking for vegan alternatives? No idea, but let's roll the camera anyway. Ready? The presenter plucks a fruit and presents it to the lens, immediately spouting off about the fruit's medicinal qualities, levels of fiber, natural sugars, and low water consumption. All lies. The camera woman scowls at him. The presenter turns the fruit over and screams, throwing it as far as his skinny arms will allow. Never one to waste a shot, the camera woman follows the fruit on instinct, zooming in on it as it lands at the foot of a tree. Out from under the purple skin crawls an earwig. It's huge, just over three inches long at a guess. That's strange. If she didn't know any better, she'd think that was… A voice startles the three of them. It booms out from behind them, just up the slope. The presenter swivels so fast he falls over. The camera woman points the camera up the hill and snaps the figure into focus. The poacher pulls back the bolt on his rifle, finger already on the trigger. In the dark, they can hardly make out what they are looking at. It must be a man. It spoke in a man's voice, but it towers over all of them. It must be nearly seven feet tall. They can't discern any kind of human silhouette. Odd shapes jut out this way and that. What is it made from? The voice calls out again, a deep, rumbling voice, like an earthquake heard from the ocean floor or echoing through a forest. There were other sounds layered into its voice, high twittering sounds and guttural growls. The camera woman looks to her companions. Clearly neither of them understand what it's saying either. Not Swahili, not English, not French or Arabic. The intent of the voice is very clear, however. They are not welcome. For the first time ever, the presenter is lost for words. The poacher shifts the butt of the rifle against his shoulder. Great. Now this is her job. The camera woman lowers her camera rig to the ground and raises both hands, approaching the figure carefully. The sun breaks over the horizon further up the slope. In just a few moments, she'll be able to see the stranger, whatever it is. Speaking Swahili, she explains that they are a film crew, here to shoot a documentary. They do not intend any harm and will make as little disturbance to the environment as possible. The creature does not seem to understand and repeats its previous command. It definitely sounded like a command, at least. The camera woman turns helplessly to her companions, just in time to see a small shadow rushing them. It runs on all fours, covering the ground impossibly fast. Ignoring the poacher and presenter, it snatches up her camera from the ground and hurls it at a tree. It crunches into the wood and falls to the ground in pieces. 
Sunlight breaks over the horizon, flooding the valley with light. The camerawoman whirls around and glimpses the figure up the hill. It is a man, isn't it? Towering at nearly seven feet, the man is adorned with flowers, blossoms, and fungi. Animal skulls and pelts hang from his shoulders. Colorful face paint etches patterns, ancient and proud, deep into his features. African buffalo horns grow proudly from his head, accentuating a triumphant, floral headpiece. But a glimpse is all she gets. The figure vanishes. A sweet-scented breeze rushes down to meet her from where he was standing just a moment ago. Where'd he go? The presenter cries. The camera woman can see something dangerous has lit up the man's face. He's found his story. She just doesn't know quite what it is yet. The poacher also has a wry smile on his face. He's looking at the discarded purple fruit from before. No, wait. He's looking at the earwig still crawling around it. She follows his gaze, and it confirms her suspicions from before. That's a St. Helena earwig, sure as the daylight streaming onto its scuttling legs. Declared extinct in 1967. The presenter is already marching off, further down the valley. The poacher shoulders his rifle and follows, not even glancing at the camera woman. She goes over to her broken camera and kneels down. No hope. She takes out the SD card from it and pockets it. What had that creature been that had thrown it at the tree? A monkey of some kind? The presenter calls out to her. Forget the camera, I've got a hidden one in my pocket. It'll look more authentic anyway. As they walk, they see more and more wildlife. In the early dawn, various animals are rising to their feet, stretching and wandering through the trees. At first, just small creatures, geckos, tortoises, insects. But soon they see gazelle, a family of oryx, even a hippo from a distance. But there is one thing each animal has in common. They were all declared extinct years ago, sometimes centuries ago. The camera woman keeps her mouth shut. The last thing she wants is for the poacher to know that. Although judging from the spring in his step, he's already well on his way to figuring it out. All of a sudden, the forest opens out. A watering hole the size of a lake fills their view. Animals of all sorts fly, swim, bathe, drink, and play in the morning air. Parakeets dance overhead, rhinos lounge in the shallows. A dodo marches squarely past them on its way to join its friends. This has to be some kind of dream, surely. The penny finally drops for the presenter. He turns to his companions, wide-eyed, ready to say something, when he freezes. Staring at something behind them, a shadow falls over them all. The camera woman turns to see… an elephant, white as the morning snow, with round, pink eyes, old and wrinkled as time itself. It is hulkingly big, impossibly big. It dwarfs any bull elephant she's ever shot by several tons. The giant walks slowly, one plodding step at a time, right past them. So close she can almost reach out and touch it. Every part of her wants to. Only she knows better. You don't interfere with nature. The elephant passes them and disappears into the woods. She looks excitedly at her companions. The poacher has a glint in his eye. The presenter is hurrying off along the water's edge. Her eyes follow his movement. There, on the shore, kneels the towering man from before. He's beside a panting and straining ibex. She's on her side, belly swollen, blood mixing with the lake's water. The camera woman draws closer, watching the man stroke the animal's side gently. He cups a painted hand behind the animal's rump and delivers a baby effortlessly. Another slides out a moment later. He takes the tiny ibexes under each arm and walks them into the water, delicately washing them clean before returning them to their mother by the shore. The presenter calls out to him, raising a hand in greeting. Sir, sir! Would you be interested in conducting a brief interview with me? It's for a network television documentary called Extreme Vegan? The figure stands and turns to them, wary. The two of them stand before him, separated by just a few feet, extinct animals chattering and cheeping all around them. In order to maintain such an eco-friendly lifestyle, you must be having a lot of plant-based alternatives in your diet. Oat milk, corn, avocado, what's your secret? As if on cue, a buffalo emerges from the water and approaches them. The man stoops, not taking an eye off the presenter, and reaches under the buffalo's body. Finding the teeth, he squeezes milk into his cupped hand. He raises his hand to his mouth and drinks slowly, staring the presenter down. After a moment, he squeezes more milk into his hand and stretches it out towards them. He says a word in that same ancient voice, only this time, it is softer, welcoming. Uh-uh, no way. Do you know how unethical it is to deprive that poor child of its natural milk? The presenter goes off on a rant. The man ignores him and offers the hand to the camerawoman instead. Without thinking, 
She steps forward and stoops to his hand. She drinks the milk straight from his palm. It's warm and fatty, thick like cream, but totally delicious. She looks into the man's eyes. They are a dark brown, but in the morning light, she catches flecks of gold, green, purple, and blue. The man's voice is even softer as he speaks again. Olanue. His name. That must be the man's name. She raises a hand to her chest, opening her mouth to introduce herself. Bang! The shot rips through the clearing. Animals screech and scatter, stampeding into the trees. Birds fill the sky, alighting from every tree, so much so that they tangle with one another. Camera woman's head whips around. The shot had come from the trees behind them. A roar, louder and more chilling than any animal could produce, swells from Alaniwe. This time, he doesn't just vanish. It's like he's raptured. Vines and roots shoot up out of the dirt, wrapping around him, creeping into his mouth and eye sockets. They wrench him into the ground with such force, it sends ripples across the lake. A rumbling fills the earth. The presenter cowers by the water's edge. He's useless. The camera woman takes off into the trees, following the sound of the shot. It doesn't take her long to find it. The white elephant lies on its side, rivers of red cascading across its chest, following the ancient furrows of its wrinkled skin. Its breathing stutters and rattles. The poacher stands before the dying animal. He turns to the camera woman, an unhinged grin lighting up his face. He opens his mouth to speak, but from out of his throat bursts a stem, blood spraying high into the air. The camera woman watches in abject horror as the plant grows up through the poacher. Roots ensnare his feet and ankles. The stem pierces his lower back and emerges from his throat. Offshoots stab their way out of his ribcage and temples. In a matter of seconds, it is finished. Pink flowers bloom at the tips, the poacher's corpse suspended like some kind of grotesque puppet. Without a sound, Alaniwe emerges from the trees and walks past the camera woman, past the poacher's body, and kneels by the elephant. He raises a hand to the creature's wound. The camera woman waits with bated breath. He's going to heal it. She can feel it. That's Alaniwe's final power. He can save the elephant, surely. But the blood keeps flowing. The elephant's breathing grows fainter until silence fills the clearing. No birds chattering, no breeze to rustle the trees, no more death rattles, silence. Then the most heartbreaking sound the camera woman has ever heard, Alaniwe, starts to sob. She is no longer welcome here. This is not her place. Without a word, the camera woman gets to her feet and walks back up the hill and out of the valley. As she walks, she hears footsteps approaching her. The presenter is there, arms laden with fruit and berries. He grins at her, explaining how he's going to take these home and plant them up. Start a smoothie chain called Alani Ways. If the first store goes well, they can franchise it, keeping the local feel but expanding to… A root stabs through his throat, interrupting him. A second stabs through his chest, shattering the hidden camera. So much for that smoothie chain. The camera woman doesn't look back. She walks through the day and the following night. She finds a road and stops. There's something in her pocket still. She takes out the SD card and looks at it. With a sad little smile, she takes the card between her fingers and snaps it clean in two. The man that you have just encountered deep in the Tanzanian wilderness may not be a man at all. Little is known about the genetic makeup of SCP-5411, otherwise known as Alaniwe. He appears to be a male comprised of a combination of human, animal, and botanical components. The plants and pelts that the camera woman observed him wearing are likely not items of clothing at all, but rather are naturally growing parts of Alaniwe's anatomy, giving him the appearance of a witch doctor. None of the documented attempts to communicate with Alaniwe have proved fruitful. While he does speak, his language is currently unidentified. He seems to have no understanding of English, Swahili, or Arabic, and is uninterested in learning them. Alaniwe roams freely within a 35 square kilometer area of the southern Tanzanian savanna. This site has been designated SCP-5411-0, and an exclusion zone has been set up around it. Barbed wire fences and automated drones patrol the perimeter. A sacrificial goat is kept on site at all times, ready to be sacrificed as part of a binding ritual to keep SCP-5411 contained. Thus far, however, Alaniwe has not proved to be a threat to anyone other than those who disturb the delicate ecosystem which he inhabits. His land, SCP-5411-0, is home to a number of critically endangered or near-extinct species of African animals, many of whom are from different countries in the continent. Black rhinoceros, western gorilla, African penguins, and a so-called albino ghost elephant that is central to local folklore. 
It is unclear how these animals came to live in this area, but there is an evident connection between Alaniwe's care of nature and their continued survival. Alaniwe has been witnessed delivering newborn animals of a number of species, tending to injured animals and even regrowing grasslands to feed and house various creatures. Alaniwe is known to possess the powers of teleportation, intangibility, zoolingualism, fluorokinesis, and psychokinesis. When left alone, Alaniwe uses these abilities to tend to his local ecosystem. However, he is aggressive and decisive in disposing of anything he perceives to be a threat to the natural order. He is known to manifest and control small humanoid creatures roughly one meter tall that are made up of foliage, wood, mud, and rocks. These creatures, designated SCP-5411-1, exhibit basic predatory behavior, carrying out the bidding of SCP-5411, such as destroying our camera woman's equipment. Capable of running at speeds of up to 75 kilometers an hour, the 58 known instances of SCP-5411-1 are to be treated as hostile as soon as they leave the SCP-5411-0 exclusion zone. However, a status quo seems to have settled between SCP researchers and SCP-5411. Alaniwe seems content within his ecosystem, and the conservation work he carries out within this area is proving invaluable to those researching climate change and habitat welfare. Much like the animals in nature documentaries, it is best that we choose not to interfere and let nature run its course. Kids get bored. It's just part of growing up. Or at least, that's what their parents would always say. Living in a small town in England, you run out of things to do by your fifth birthday. By your tenth, you want nothing more than to move out. By your fifteenth, half the kids end up in hospital doing something stupid. The kid entering the churchyard tonight is no exception. As he ducks under the gap in the chain-link fence, he catches the corner of his cast on the metal. The cast is already so covered in nicks and scratches that the new tear barely makes a difference. He has been trying to cut the cast off with kitchen scissors for the last three weeks. He'd broken his wrist riding his bike off the roof of his house. It would have worked if it wasn't for the post box being a little too close to the building. His brother calls out to him from up ahead. He's already at the door to the church. The kid hears his best friend shuffling around nervously behind him. He waits for her turn to duck under the fence and follow him into the churchyard away from the road. Even in the middle of nowhere, in total darkness, the kid can tell she's scared to break the rules. The pair of them rush over to meet the kid's brother at the entrance to the church. The older brother grins at both of them. At 21 years old, he may as well be 41. Towering over the two of them, with a few scraggly chin hairs and a tattoo on his neck, they can't imagine what his life must be like. Going to university in London, driving a car, getting tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than 10 quid and doesn't come from the corner store. What a life. There isn't a door to kick open. The church building is in total disrepair. Only the limestone structure is left standing. The windows have all been smashed in long ago, and the pews rotted away, leaving only some moss creeping its tendrils into every nook and cranny. As the three of them make their way inside, they look up to see the starry night sky above their heads, no roof left intact. In fact, the only part of the building that seems to still be half standing is the tower at the far end. Even in the dark, they can still make out a tight spiral staircase hewn into the stone, disappearing up into the collapsing tower. The kid grins. What to explore first? They all split up, wandering around different parts of the church hall. The kid makes a beeline for a toppled in patch of wall. He clambers up onto a window ledge and hoists himself up onto the wall, looking down at the other two. A stone gives way under his foot and almost sends him tumbling, but he throws out his broken wrist just in time to balance himself. Across the hall, his best friend is checking her flip phone anxiously. She'd said earlier in the evening that she needed to be back before 1 a.m. or her parents would be worried. It's already 12.45. The kid's older brother calls out across the church. I need the toilet. I'm gonna climb straight to the top of the tower and do it off the edge. <laughs> Watch out for rain. And with that, he disappears through the little doorway and up the spiral staircases. Very quickly, the sound of his footsteps disappears, leaving the kid and his friend alone together. The kid looks over his shoulder out of the church building. From up on this patch of wall, he is almost at the perfect height to pick an apple from the tree next to them. If he can just stretch out far enough. There, he plucks two apples, one for him and one for his friend. He tosses it to her, but she misses the catch. Looking up at him, he can tell she already wants to go home. He grumbles and jumps down from the wall. The landing jars his leg pretty badly, but he clenches his teeth hard enough that no noise escapes his mouth. He grins at his best friend. 
She doesn't return it. It's late. She needs to get home soon. And the only way they can get home is in his big brother's car. Fine, I guess it's probably home time. She gives him her best attempt at a smile. The kid walks over to the stairs, sticks his head through the doorway, and calls out. No response. Great. How high do these stairs go? They can't be more than a couple of stories, surely. He calls again. Still nothing. His best friend appears at his shoulder. They both peer up the staircase. It's such a tight spiral that they can't really see anything beyond the first ten steps. It's dark in there, almost too dark to see where they're going. He gets out his flashlight and flicks it on. That should be enough light for the both of them. The kid plants his foot on the first step and starts climbing. The steps feel well worn. They're smooth in the middle and dip down slightly from years of use. One step, two steps, three, four, five. His flashlight dies. He shakes it, knocking the back of it a couple of times like they do in the movies. Nothing, not even a flicker. He asks his friend if she has a flashlight. She doesn't. So the two of them climb in the dark. Very quickly, the stairs change shape. Or maybe that's the wrong word. They aren't changing shape, they're just shrinking. It's subtle, but definitely happening. The gaps between them are getting smaller, and the undersides of the stairs above are bearing down on the kid's head slightly. The kid stops and turns to his best friend. He can hardly see her at all in the dark. She's just a slightly darker shadow standing a couple of steps down from him. He asks if the steps are getting smaller. She tells him not that she can tell. He insists they must be. The stairs above their heads are getting lower and lower. The space is closing in on them slightly. She says she has no idea what he's talking about. Tutting at her, he takes a couple more steps up the staircase. The cast on his arm tightens. That's strange. He keeps going and, all of a sudden, it feels like a vice. The blood flow is cut off almost instantaneously. His fingers feel cold and start to tingle, his forearm swelling and bulging around the edge of the cast. The pressure building up inside it is ridiculous, feels almost as if the cast splits apart and falls off. Blood rushes back to his fingertips. He flexes them gratefully, turning to his best friend. Even in the darkness, he can tell she's peering at him intently. He runs a hand over his arm, massaging it gently. That's strange. His arm feels different from how it did before it went into the cast. There's more hair on it now, and the muscle running along his forearm feels more pronounced. He flexes his wrist. No pain, no stiffness, nothing. He isn't due to get his cast off for another month at least. Those doctors clearly don't know what they're talking about. Are you standing on your tiptoes? His friend asks from behind him. He looks down at her shadow, confused, and tells her no, he isn't. The kid apparently looks taller. Must just be uneven stairs or a trick of the light. Come to think of it though, his best friend does look a little different standing there below him, even just from her silhouette. She isn't any taller, but her figure looks different. Her voice sounds a little lower. His brother, that's who they're after. They get to the top of the stairs, find him, and see what was going on. Must just be some strange optical illusions happening here in the dark. The two of them press on, continuing up the stairs. Step after step, they go. They must be up on the second floor by now, surely. But there's no light ahead of them indicating any kind of exit, just more stairs. The kid asks his friend what time it is. He hears her flipping open her phone and pressing a couple of buttons, but no light fills the space. She presses them again and again. Nothing. Her battery must have died. That's the only explanation. She tries to tell him that it was almost on full a minute ago, but he doesn't really listen. Because at that moment, he sticks a hand in his pocket to take out the apple he'd plucked. Warm goop sticks to his fingers. His back pocket is full of sticky mush. Little creatures wriggle around inside it. Maggots. How had he plucked a rotten apple? It felt fine on the branch. He takes another step, hands still absently hovering over his pocket. A buzzing sound. A couple of flies brush past his fingers. What had they been doing in his pocket? He hears them drift around him and up the staircase, until suddenly, their buzzing stops. He crouches down and squints hard in the dark. He can just about make out two little flies lying on the stair just two steps away from him, both on their backs, legs curled. The kid reaches back into his pocket and feels around. The sticky mush is gone. Just some kind of dry, dusty substance is left. Strangely, the kid doesn't panic. He knows somewhere in his head that everything happening to him is very peculiar, yet he doesn't feel worried about it at all. To be honest, all he really cares about right now is making it to the top of this staircase. He takes off, running two steps at a time up towards where his brother must be waiting. Part of his mind notices that the jarring feeling in his leg from jumping off the wall is gone. No time to think about that now. Up he runs, each stride throwing him further and further. 
Somewhere behind him, he can hear his best friend muttering something to herself, something incoherent and garbled. Her voice definitely sounds different now. It barely sounds like her anymore. She sounds more like… more like her mother. The kid catches his foot on a step and falls. His best friend clatters into the back of him before she has a chance to stop. The two of them topple over, landing awkwardly on a step, enough to knock the wind out of him. She lies on top of him. Only, it can't be her. It feels like a fully grown woman, not his fifteen-year-old friend. She whispers to him. Her voice doesn't sound scared at all, though. If anything, she seems a little… disinterested. What's happening to us? The kid breathes heavily, struggling to get the air back into his lungs. That's when he notices the smell. Something deathly rotten is filling the staircase. Something moldy and decaying. She seems to notice it too. The pair of them stand up straight and peer up the stairs. In the gloom, they can see it clearly enough. A person slumped on the ground. The smell tells them all they need to know about this person. They should run, right now. They should run back down the staircase and out of there. Yet both of them inexplicably and in unison continue walking up the stairs, closing the gap on the corpse. It blocks off two whole steps, lying awkwardly on its side, slightly hunched over as if the person had collapsed in a coughing fit. The kid almost slips over. Something small is under his foot, something metallic. He reaches down and picks it up, feeling its shape and knowing almost immediately what it is. He lifts the lid and flicks the red and gold lighter on. A little flame fills the staircase with light, orange and weak, dancing around the stone. It is just enough to make out the flecks of blood coughed out of the corpse's mouth and onto the stone steps. It is just enough to see the scruffy little beard sprouting out of the corpse's face. It's just enough to make out the tattoo on the corpse's neck. The kid looks down at his older brother. Not just his older brother, but his older brother. Whereas before he had seemed like he was forty-one, he now looks like it. Forty-one and dead from something in his lungs. The kid turns to see his best friend. A woman in her mid-thirties looks back at him. Her hair even has a couple of telltale grays. She should look afraid, but her expression is almost blank. But there's a little something there, just enough of an expression to tell him that she's seeing the same transformation on his face looking back at her. The kid reaches up to touch his cheek. A wiry beard meets his fingertips. They should run. They should run back down these stairs and get out of here, call an ambulance and go home. And yet, the kid flicks the lighter closed, turns around, and steps over his older brother's body. As he walks up the stairs in silence, he hears his best friend doing the same. After five more stairs, his knee starts to give out. Then his hip soon after that, it gets harder and harder to stand up straight, so he lets himself stoop slightly. His best friend's breathing grows softer and wispier behind him. The pace slows down. Each step seems to take more out of him, feeling harder than the last. He needs a rest. That's all he needs. If he can just sit down for a second. His chest clamps in on itself like a vice. Blood hammers in his ears. Sweat floods across his brow in an instant, and the whole world seems to tilt around him. The kid collapses on the ground, feeling his brittle wrist snapping under him. Pain shoots through his body as his chest squeezes tighter and tighter. He rolls onto his back, gasping for air with frail lungs. The kid claws at his sunken ribcage, feeling loose wrinkled skin under his fingertips. With a monumental effort, he flicks the lighter on to see an old woman peering at him through the dark. He can hardly recognize his best friend anymore, as she gently takes the lighter from his hand and steps over his convulsing body. He watches helplessly as she continues gingerly up the stairs in silence. She doesn't look back over her shoulder, disappearing around the corner, taking the light with her. Leaving the kid to die an old man in total darkness. With one final gasp of air before his heart gives out on him, he clings desperately to one hope. She's going to make it to the top of the stairs. She has to. It is fortunate in many ways that SCP-723 is in such a remote area. While the church has stood on that site for hundreds of years, for much of that time it has been abandoned. Little is known about the history of the church as many of the events around it have descended into local folklore. What is known about SCP-723 is that it is a spiral staircase housed within an abandoned church building in an undisclosed location in rural England. For all intents and purposes, it is an unremarkable set of stairs. Made from ordinary limestone from the local quarry, the steps are approximately 0.75 meters wide and worn away in the middle, apparently from frequent use. If you were to look at the outside of the church, you would see that the tower containing the staircase is not particularly tall and is in a state of disrepair. Taking a look inside that tower, however, seems to show the staircase extending up beyond the height of the tower, 
something that seems on the surface to be physically impossible. In fact, how high the staircase itself goes is a mystery to this day, as those studying SCP-723 are yet to find a way to see inside it beyond the first two floors. This is because every object, living or otherwise, that ascends up SCP-723 undergoes a rapid aging process. Organic creatures quickly grow older, die, and decompose on their way up the steps. Other objects behave as if a great deal of time has passed. Batteries and electronic devices go flat almost immediately. Decay is accelerated too, meaning wear and tear take place at an alarmingly fast rate. This renders any conventional methods of exploring SCP-723 obsolete. Sound and video recording equipment running on battery power quickly fail. After many attempts with different technology, recording devices linked to a robust cable were created specifically for trying to record footage beyond the first story of SCP-723. However, the video recordings failed around the second story, and sound recordings failed around the fourth. Living subjects were required to transport these devices up the staircase, and so D-Class personnel were tasked with the job. Across all documented experiments, none of the subjects returned. In each case, a subtle change was noticed in the subjects upon crossing the fifth step. One subject paused, another gasped slightly, but beyond that, there was no physical or emotional discomfort for much of their ascent. Most were perfectly content to climb the stairs once they'd passed that fifth step. In fact, as the D-Class personnel climbed up the stairs and underwent the accelerated aging process, none of them appeared to be outwardly distressed for the most part. They all remained remarkably calm and almost disinterested in the way their bodies transformed before their very eyes. Video footage showed the subject's skin rapidly aging, undergoing conventional wrinkling and deterioration. Diseases appeared to develop at an advanced rate too, as one subject's body, recovered by pulling them back down with the rope they were attached to, contained tumors around the prostate and above the eye that were not present prior to the experiment. This subject was later discovered to have a family history of cancer. For all intents and purposes, it appears as if SCP-723 simply accelerates the natural aging process of the subject's body following the same DNA instructions and deterioration that you would otherwise observe over the course of decades. D-723-7 was the subject to make it furthest up the staircase before the connection was lost. Approaching the fourth floor, the signal grew very weak, but in the noise could be heard a handful of distressed murmurings, including possible references to a door or the door, and to dark and mark. Beyond this point, there is no usable evidence. Local folklore in the area indicates that SCP-723 has been producing the same effect for generations. Stories can be heard from local residents about old church congregations who used to meet in the building and would mysteriously lose grandparents, children, priests, and strays who would disappear up the staircase. It is theorized that this is why the church building was left abandoned for so long. SCP-723 was only identified relatively recently, in the early 2000s, after reports surfaced of local children going missing in its vicinity. In response, the area has been cordoned off and designated as Site-288. A three-mile chain-link fence was erected around the churchyard with signage warning any visitors to steer well clear. A further two-mile restriction zone with magnetic locks is scheduled to be constructed in the near future. Three guards are stationed around SCP-723 at all times of the day. None of them openly carry any weapons, so as not to arouse much attention from any passersby, presenting the site as a mostly uninteresting, unsafe, derelict building. The guards are not permitted to approach or ascend the staircase, and the same goes for any SCP personnel. The only people permitted to enter SCP-723 are D-Class personnel, specifically approved by Foundation personnel with Level 4 clearance or higher. While little is known about the cause of the effect, or how SCP-723 physically works, one thing is certain. No person who has started to walk up those stairs has ever come back down again. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, such as SCP-962, Tower of Babel, for another twisting structure of anomalous madness. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.